Hello and welcome guys and welcome to this marathon series of SPM BVM a 100 marks paper of your CMA final and yes one of the most scoring papers of your syllabus guys this particular paper has got limited content it is more practical oriented and the kind of questions which come in the examination are pretty much streamlined with the study mat which has been prescribed by the institute so all in all uh, an amazing opportunity for you to score good marks in your examination uh, benefit of set off if you are giving both the groups benefit of uh, uh, accumulating aggregate marks um, uh, can be availed through this particular subject small in content the content is relatively um, uh, small relatively precise and concise as compared to big subjects like CFR or SFM or any other subject but yes 100 marks paper and quite straightforward if we if we uh, apply some um, uh, you know smart techniques of studying in this particular paper we are sure short sure going to get 70 plus marks in the examination this marathon section this marathon session is specifically aimed for the students who are um, uh, going to give CMA final either group 4 or group 3 and 4 together uh, you know so that we can revise all the important formulas all the important practical and theoretical aspect of this particular subject um, in brief uh, in a very short span of time in this particular marathon lecture series I'm going to take up all the important chapters of the syllabus uh, be it practical or theory it doesn't mean that the chapters which I skip are not important guys those are also important but you have to do them yourself uh, marathon being a uh, limited platform I can only pick up limited chapters in the entire from the entire curriculum and I can discuss them the, pri the primary chapters which I'm going to uh, include in this particular marathon lectures will be mergers and acquisition valuation of shares valuation of um, uh, brands uh, maybe some part of intangibles I'll be touching and then um, economic efficiency of the firm will be the one of the most important practical aspect of the SPM uh, curriculum then I'll be touching uh, upon the theoretical chapters of SPM uh, because theory is not very important from a BVM standpoint um, yes sometimes theory comes but not that um, frequently so uh, I'll be touching upon the theoretical chapters of SPM at the end of this particular session first I'll be taking up the practical aspects of SPM and BVM uh, SP and uh, BV both and then I'll be moving upon the theoretical aspect of the subject okay so yes let's start the marathon lecture revision of uh, valuation SPM and BVM starting off with the first chapter of business valuation which is basics of valuation basics of valuation we are going to discuss the techniques of valuation which are prevalent uh, the valuation um, basis which are there in market the techniques the methods of valuation uh, what is valuation what do you mean by value and all those uh, brief concepts okay so the first question when you think about valuation is what is value what do you mean by value what is the meaning of word value and how does it uh, impact or how does it influence our um, practical world our economical world our business world how does it impact um, uh, the world okay so what do you mean by value value means what is the worth of a particular thing for you now value is very different from price because price is determined with intersection of demand and supply but value is determining the worth of a particular thing so some things are very very worthful but they are priced super low for example water without water you cannot survive but it's priced at a very very low price and compared compared to that diamonds diamonds are very very expensive but they are not required for survival at all they are not a necessity they are not um, uh, worth your life right so this is typically known as the diamond and water paradox which explains this concept that price is different from value price means something which you pay to buy a particular thing it necessarily would not represents its worth worth of a particular thing um, uh, is 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 um, uh, based on the fact that how valuable do you treat that thing how important is that thing to you how um, uh, desperately do you need that thing for your survival or for your uh, necessary um, uh, you know day-to-day um, -day things so that is how value or worth is determined so value is something very different from price price is a um, uh, intersection of demand and supply which is there in market if demand is high price uh, supply is low then of course the price is going to be high but that is not how we value a particular thing. valuation is a very different thing from price therefore uh, even the companies which are listed in stock exchange even those companies we would require their valuation you know you should say that sir companies which are listed in stock exchange their valuation is not required to be done sir why do we do valuation for those companies which are listed in stock exchange sir they are already valued no their share price is there you multiply a share price with the number of shares you'll get the value of the company no guys 
that is the price of the company that is the price of the share which is prevalent in market which typically would represent to an extent the value of the company but ultimately when you are trying to purchase a particular company or trying to um uh, uh, you know buy out a particular company you want the value of the company and value necessarily will not be derived from the market price because that is the market value of that particular company that is the market price of that particular company so today we are going to distinguish between these two words price and value price is a different thing value is a different and in our entire subject of valuation we will thrive upon the concept of value which means what is the worth which this particular thing is there for me what is the worth that this particular thing uh, gives to me and that exactly is so value what is the purpose of valuation purpose of valuation is that valuation is required for listing in stock exchange when you list your goods in stock exchange when you list your company in stock exchange then its value is determined um uh, um uh, you know uh, at that point in time when you list your company in stock exchange so listing is done in stock exchange that is the um uh, need of value then mergers and acquisition or buy out mergers and acquisition um uh, when you merge or acquire a particular company or buy out a particular company then valuation is required because i've already told you even if it's a listed company still its value is required because listed company will have the market price of the shares and not the value need the value of that particular company value is determined by Uh, the techniques which we are going to deal with in this particular subject business restructuring whenever you are restructuring your business you are demerging a particular uh, department to someone else or you are um, uh, you know buying out a particular division from somewhere else any kind of restructuring which happens in the business will necessitate um valuation so that is another important um, purpose of valuation business restructuring then shareholders dispute resolution whenever there's a dispute amongst the shareholders uh, regarding their shares in the company or um, uh, any kind of dispute which they hold um, you know that definitely would need valuation you need to value the shares of that particular company which the shareholder holds and according to that we are going to settle the disputes purchase or sale of business liquidation of companies will definitely necessitate valuation insolvency proceedings when insolvency proceedings happen and um, you know the creditors are wanting their share debentures are wanting their shares their share in business uh, everyone wants to have their uh, you know uh, debts paid and their share everyone wants it in that situation also uh, valuation will definitely help because valuation will actually make you realize what part of business or what part of liabilities will you not be able to pay okay because value represents the return that we are going to give to our liabilities and a true valuation during insolvency will uh, result into um uh, you know uh, we knowing that this part of the liability we are not going to repay okay that is the valuation which um uh, is involved or is necessary in case of insolvency then financial reporting yes financial reporting um whenever you want to report a uh, value of your company to your shareholders or to the pe investors private equity people who are wanting to invest in your company okay or any other relevant regulatory authority uh, sometimes uh, while reporting also you report the value of the company but generally valuation is not reported as a matter of routine as a matter of compliance as a matter of um uh, routine the valuation is not disclosed in any of the financial reports valuation is only uh, reported as and when it is required as per the statutory laws or the requirement of the other parties okay so reporting is another aspect of valuation um uh, we need valuation for reporting purposes as well now price and value differentiation between price and value so warren buffet has rightly said that price is what you pay what you pay is the price and value is what you get what is the worth that you get so value is nothing but the worth okay what is the worth or the benefit that you are going to get that is the value and price is what you are going to pay now one more difference is value in exchange price is value in exchange when you exchange your goods um uh, when you uh sell off your goods to someone else and when you uh, receive money in uh, in return for it value in exchange in price when you are exchanging your goods then it's known as price but when you are talking about value value means uh its value in use how useful that particular product will be to you um uh, after uh, the purchase okay so value means you are valuing that particular good according to its use what is the utility of that particular product i've already told you utility of water is quite high so value of water is quite high price of water is quite low okay so what is the use of that particular thing this is the question which is asked when you are valuing a particular thing 
and when you are value when you are pricing a particular thing when you are going to uh, determine the price of a particular thing then the question that you are going to ask is what is the demand and supply of that particular thing what is the intersection of demand and supply um uh, how well are you going to exchange the thing uh, how well you are going to buy and sell how many buyers are there for this thing how many sellers are there for this thing so what is the um, value and exchange of this particular thing that is what is meant by price that is the difference between price and value so that is how price and value are uh, distinguished okay so uh, this is the use of price which is not required okay yes types of value very very important the different types of value okay there are different standards of value uh, what kind of value do you want to compute uh, according to the purpose what is the purpose of valuation and what are the kind of values do you want to compute that is how value is to be um, like computed now a theoretical question can come from this particular aspect guys uh, what are the standards of value what are the different kind of values which are there um, which you need to um, uh, compute okay so first one is the market value market value is the exchange value between seller and buyer who are willing so willing seller and buyer when they um, uh, are determining the exchange value then market value is determined at a given point of time at any given point of time in free or open market so market value is typically a value which is assigned to a particular product which is represented by again an intersection of demand and supply and typically market value is not a value but a price it's price typically market value is not a value it's a price okay because we are determining this value on the basis of demand and supply intersection what are the buyers um, uh, willing to pay for it uh, willing to um, uh, pay and what are the sellers willing to receive for it so market value is nothing but a price market value is the first value second value is the liquidation value liquidation value means when you are uh, selling off a particular asset what is the value that you are going to realize from it okay now you know um, i'll give you a very simple example sometimes what happens is a product is worth a good is worth crores of rupees but the moment you try to sell it in market at that point in time the economic conditions might be really down so it might not fetch as much amount as you would expect it would fetch so you know sometimes you must have uh, heard elders saying this investment you should not dilute right now because this is not the right time market is not right to sell this particular product and that is known as liquidation value so at a given point in time as on today what is the value that this particular good will derive by selling this particular good in open market that is the selling value or the liquidation value what is the value that you are going to derive today as on today Uh, after selling this good that is the liquidation value that is the selling value so second value is the liquidation value which means that you are going to liquidate this particular good in market either its business or its asset or its any kind of um uh, you know um, any kind of uh, revenue earning source that you have you have business you have shares you have jewelry you have diamonds any kind of uh, uh, good that you have uh, as of today if i want to sell it in market whether there are enough buyers to buy it whether they are going to give me the right price or not that is subjective yes it might be worth thousands and crores and crores of rupees but at that point in time what is it going to fetch me that is the liquidation value selling value when business ceases to exist all assets are sold post liquidation is there and orderly liquidation is there post liquidation means when you are um selling your business at a very um uh, you know uh, in in a haste at a very quick span of time at that point in time you know you will get lesser value Post liquidation will always get lesser value because uh, you know more desperate you are to sell a particular business, uh, lesser will be the valuation that you will get. In case of orderly liquidation, you will take some time, reasonable time to sell your business. Uh, at that point in time, you will get a reasonable price for that particular asset. So, post liquidation or orderly liquidation, then fair value or intrinsic value of a particular uh, good. Fair value or intrinsic value means that you are going to get. some um uh, you know reasonable price what is the worth of this particular thing fair value means the worth the actual worth of a particular thing it is determined by the fair value or intrinsic value and this is the true um representative of value if i if i you know in a generic term if i um say that uh, find the valuation of this business then out of all these values what i am hinting to what am i hinting to i am hinting to intrinsic value or the fair value this is actually the value of a particular business this is actually what we are going to compute in our entire chapter of um uh, entire subject of valuation 
This is what we are going to learn in this particular subject called valuation. Fair valuation or intrinsic value is the thing that we are going to learn to compute in this particular chapter um, now without any condition, without any ifs and but, without saying that we are going to liquidate our business. No, we are not going to liquidate our business. This is not any kind of liquidation or this is not market value. What are people willing to pay or buy? I'm not bothered about that. Okay. I'm going to just and just compute the worth of my business in this particular value, which is the fair value or the intrinsic value. So this is actually the um, uh, true sense of value. This is actually the true meaning of value. This is actually a true valuation, um, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, valuation basis, right? So in this entire chapter, we are going to focus on this element, which is fair valuation or intrinsic valuation. And in the ensuing chapters also like valuation of investments, valuation of um, uh, liabilities, real estates, whatever, we are going to focus on this value. This is the major value of valuation, fair value or intrinsic value future cash flow expected from an asset. What is the future cash flow that is expected from an asset? Um, uh, that is what we are going to discuss in this particular um, uh, topic. So future cash flow which is expected from this from any asset is <clears throat> the intrinsic value or the fair value. What is the cash flow that we are going to expect from this particular asset? What is the cash flow that we are going to derive from this particular asset? That is actually the fair value or the intrinsic value and that cash flow is to be discounted at the present value at today's value that cash flow is to be discounted and that is how this discounting will yield me the fair valuation or the intrinsic valuation so whatever cash flow i'm going to expect in future that cash flow is to be discounted at the present value that is how valuation is required to be determined so future cash flow expected from an asset discounted at the present now so what is discounting i'm going to discuss dis discuss discounting in a short while with all of you so future cash flow which is expected from an asset and if it is discounted at the present value that will give me fair valuation or intrinsic valuation. So uh, this is the major crux, major thrux, uh, thrust of fair valuation or intrinsic value that it will be determined on the basis of cash flows that we are going to expect from this, that particular asset. Guys obviously why do you purchase an asset? Why do you purchase a business? Why do you purchase shares? Why do you purchase debentures or fixed deposit or for that matter any investment? The reason is very clear. You want money out of it. You want cash flow out of it. And therefore, the intrinsic value, the fair value represents the uh, future cash flows which we expect from the asset discounted at the present value. When you do that, at that point in time guys, you, uh, you actually <coughs> uh, um, disclose the fair valuation of that particular asset. To disclose the intrinsic value of that particular product uh, product okay so future cash flows expected from an asset this will give me the fair value or the intrinsic value now very important element over here you know since fair value intrinsic values depend on cash flows therefore this method cannot be applied on assets which do not yield cash flow like any painting if there's picasso's painting which is there huh, Picasso's painting, you have a Picasso's painting in your uh, factory or home or you know business, you have a painting which is mounted on a particular wall and that Picasso painting is there. Um, uh, you would not be able to value it according to the fair valuation principle or the intrinsic valuation principle. Why? Because uh, that doesn't yield any cash flow. There is no cash flow which is yielded from this particular asset. Since there is no cash flow which is yielded from this particular asset, fair valuation is not possible for asset like this. Intrinsic valuation is not possible for an asset like this. Intrinsic value of fair value is only possible for assets which are yielding cash. Assets which are yielding some monetary benefit. Only then the uh, fair valuation or intrinsic valuation is permitted. Okay. So, yes, fair value. Future cash flows expected from an asset is the basis of fair valuation. Then investment value. Investment value is value to the owner given the investment objective. So whatever is the investment objective of a particular person, um, sometimes we invest with a particular objective. For example, I will invest my money in a particular instrument that will yield me 5 lakh rupees after 2 years so that I can buy a car. My objective is to buy a car. And the objective will be fulfilled if I invest some, some, some small, small money today which will yield me 5 lakh rupees at the end of um, 2 years or 3 years. Then this is known as the investment value. That this is known as the investment value. Investment value is nothing but um, a value which we put in 
which we expect out of a particular asset after a, a given period of time since we have determined a investment objective for us investment objective is buying a car okay so uh, value to the owner owner means the person who is holding the investment given the investment objective whatever is the investment objective given that objective when we um, pursue a value that is known as the investment value then we have equity value estimated price which reflects the interest of the parties so equity value means whatever parties are owner of that particular asset whatever parties have their you know, equity shareholders in that particular asset whatever parties are owning what is their interest in that particular business that is the estimated price which reflects the interest of the parties so equity value is nothing but the ownership value the value which owners have determined for themselves that is the equity value and that ownership value represents the um, uh, value which the partners have assigned for themselves okay as the equity value this typically is um, determined for investments in equity shares whenever you are investing in equity shares then we calculate this equity value uh, which is actually the interest which shareholders have in a particular so this is the equity value okay so these are the types of values which are there all right so let us now even look at some of the notes now guys these notes are primarily derived from the study material which you already have and that study material will be key to these um uh, you know marathon videos also please refer to the study material quite often because theory and practical both questions are going to come from the study material itself so i've just culled out this particular notes from the study material itself and yes my book also which you have is also um uh, surrounding this particular study material the study material of the institute okay so we have the types of the types of um, value we've already studied now is a valuation approaches okay what are the approaches to valuation what are the approaches to valuation this is not of relevance yes this is very very important what are the valuation approaches what are the approaches to valuation um uh, what are the approaches which we follow while valuing a particular asset so next is valuation approaches what are the approaches to valuation how do we value a particular thing what are the different ways in which we can value a particular asset so there are primarily three ways in which valuation can be done first is the market approach market approach means um uh, whatever my asset is going to give me on the basis of market that is the market uh, approach uh, second is the income approach under the income approach we typically look at the incomes which we are earning from that particular asset and basis those income we are going to value our asset and last is the cost approach under the cost approach we are going to see um now what is the cost that we have incurred for accumulating that asset or constructing that asset or if we want to replace that asset as of now or recreate that asset as of now what is the cost that we are going to incur for that so these are the three approaches which are there in our syllabus and the most important uh, approach out of these three are the is the discounted cash flow this is the approach that will come in our examination more often than other two approaches so this is the most important approach which is there in our examination okay so these are the different kinds of approaches now i am directly jumping on to the income approach which is the discounted cash flow valuation the most important valuation which is there in our syllabus and yes this discounting of uh, cash flows is the most um uh, favorite technique of all the valuers to do valuation because this is the most justifiable and this is the most um uh, important way of looking at a thing because uh, all you need from an asset is cash flow whatever cash flow you receive from a particular asset um uh, that determines the value of that particular asset so cash flow is the most important element of any asset therefore this technique which is the discounted cash flow technique is the um uh, most important approach of value valuing any asset so discounted cash flow valuation now in this approach the value is determined by calculating the net present value of stream of benefits generated by the business or asset whenever we calculate the net present value of any um uh, uh, any revenue stream which is generated by a particular business that is the valuation uh, discounted cash flow technique net present value represents the income that we generate the money that we generate from a particular asset discounted at the present value that is the net present value discounting is applied on the cash flows cash inflows and that discounting represents the um the time value of money um which we incorporate in it okay let me demonstrate the discounting uh, di discounted uh, discounting um uh, concept with a very simple example okay now we have a present value and we have a future value i have 100 rupees today 
and I want to invest this hundred rupees in any asset. Okay. Now suppose I choose a FD, fixed deposit. Okay. And I will invest this hundred rupees in fixed deposit, and that fixed deposit is going to give me eight percent of interest per annum. If that is going to give me eight percent of interest per annum. Then after one year, after one year, the value of this hundred will be hundred and. After one year, the value of this hundred will be hundred and eight. How did I come at the figure of hundred and eight? Because I just multiplied hundred by eight percent and then added that eight rupees to hundred. So hundred multiplied by hundred and eight percent is equal to hundred and eight. That is how I computed the future value of the present value. Present value is hundred. Eight percent is the interest rate or the discounting rate. So the future value is hundred and. Now, if I ask you a reverse question, what do you mean by reverse question? Reverse question is that I will get 108 rupees after one year. Eight percent is the discounting factor or the uh, interest that I'm I'll be getting for one year. What is the present value that I need to invest today? I've reversed the question. The earlier question was the uh, straightforward question that I've invested 100 rupees today. Eight percent is the income that I'm going to generate. What is the future value? You said 108. Perfect. I'm reversing my question. I am asking the same question in a reverse manner, which means I will get 108 after one year. 8% is the interest rate. What is the value today? What are you going to do? You will simply divide 108 by 108 percent. You will divide 108 by 108 percent, right? Now, what is this 108 percent? This is the interest rate that I'm going to get, which is 8 percent. I've added in it, it to my 100 um, a number. 108 is the percentage. I'm I'm going to divide 108 by 108 percent. What am I going to get? I'm going to get 108 divided by 108 percent, which is 100. So the present value comes out to 100. Now, this is the formula for discounting. What is the formula? It is 1 plus R. Percent one plus R percent. So whatever is your R, R is the required rate of return, which is eight percent over here. You add one uh, by R percent. So this you will get as one point zero eight, right? R percent. Okay, one plus R percent. Whatever is the discounting rate. Now, if you um, uh, calculate it in numerical terms, it will be zero point zero eight. So this will become one point zero eight. So divide 108 by 1.08, you will get 100. That is the discounting factor. So when you do a straightforward calculation, it is known as a compounding factor. When you do a reverse calculation, it is known as a discounting factor. And this discounting factor is what we are going to use in our entire valuation subject. Because the question is going to give me uh, that this particular business is going to generate income of rupees say thousand after one year. Two thousand after two years, three thousand after three years. So this is how my cash flows will be given to me for the future periods. I want to calculate the business value today. What will be the business value today? It will be the present value of all the future cash flows discounted at a discounting rate. That will be the present value. So all the cash flows discounted at the present rate is the present value of a particular business. This is how discounting is required to be done, and this represents nothing but time value of money. I am very sure that. you have got this particular concept very very strongly guys because this is the basis of valuation subject and as subject of valuation bvm is dependent on this particular concept this concept if it is not fit in your mind if it not clear in your mind then you are going to face problem in um, every aspect of this particular subject next is the discounting for a definite cash period okay now if now discounting happens for a longer period of time we have only taken one year right in our earlier example now if the discounting happens for more than one year then guys what is required to be done is that in this particular formula which is 1 divided by 1 plus r you just um have the number of years as the numerator okay so you um uh, if 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 it's uh, two years that you need to do your discounting for then n is equal to 2 if you want to do it for 6 years n is equal to 6 if you don't want to do it for 10 years n is equal to 10 So you have to multiply this number uh, as many times as many years uh, for which you need to do the discounting. So I'll give you an example. Okay, suppose the question is telling me that I will get two thousand rupees after two years. 
compute the present value of this 2000 rupees that I'm going to get after two years, how are you going to compute it? The uh, interest rate is 10% or the discounting factor is 10%. How are you going to do it is 2000 is the future value multiplied by one divided by 1.10, which is one plus R percent raised to the power two. This is how I'm going to compute the present value, the uh, current value of this particular investment. So 2000, which I'm going to get after two years, what is the present value of this particular 2000? It is uh, computed by using this formula. That is how you compute the present value. So why do we need the present value at the first place? Why are you making us calculate this present value? The reason is that my business is going to be sold today. And what basis will I take uh, for the business to be uh, sold today? The basis will be the future cash flows. The future cash flows discounted at the present rate, that will be the basis for my valuation of that particular business. So I need to compute the present value of the business basis the future cash flows. Whatever the future cash flows, they will determine the uh, present value of my business. Therefore, this calculation is required to be done where the future cash flows are to be discounted at the present. So 2000 multiplied by the discounting factor, which is computed at the rate of 10%. Okay. <clears throat> Alright, this, this is the formula guys, which we have al already studied. Discounting is done 1 divided by 1 plus R raised to the power N. These are the uh, numbers which are given to us. Okay. Okay. So there are multiple years cash flow. Now, if there are multiple years cash flow and different cash flows for, for, for each of the year, 1 lakh, 1 lakh, 1 lakh, 1 lakh. So for 4 years, we are going to have the cash flows then uh, you know uh, we we'll compute the present value factor now this present value factor is nothing but 1 divided by 1.1 so 9.909 uh, is nothing but what is this this is 1 divided by 1.1 what is 8.826 .8 1 divided by 1.1 raised to the power 2 discounted factor computed in numerical terms is this particular column so present value factor uh, which is computed at the rate of 10 percent so this is 1 divided by 1 Point 0.1, 1 divided by 1.1 1 .1 raised to the power 2, 1 divided by 1.1 1 .1 raised to the power 3. Okay, this is this number. So these are the discounting factors which are there, present value factors which are computed and these present value factors are um, forming the basis of discounting. So if there are multiple years um, uh, revenue streams which are given, then we are going to discount each one of it. Okay, now there's a shortcut to it. If we have constant cash flows, then instead of multiplying each one with each number, you can accumulate all the <coughs> discounting factors and multiply it at one go. You'll get the same result. This is a shortcut which is there. This is known as present value annuity factor. Present value annuity factor. If there are constant cash flows and you have present value factors which are listed, then instead of multiplying each one of them separately, add all of these, compute a present value annuity factor, and that multiplied for one time the cash flow. If cash flows are different for each of the years, then this technique cannot be applied. This shortcut technique cannot be applied if cash flows are different for each of the year. This can be applied only if cash flows are constant for each of the years. So this is how cash flow valuation of asset is. Okay. Now let us do this simple question. It's <clears throat> a very simple question. Okay, let's do it quickly. A startup estimates falling cash flows for next few few years. Few years cash flow is given to you by a startup. One, two, three, four. After one year, hundred lakh rupees will be earned. After two years, one eighty lakh. Three years, one seventy lakh. Four years, two hundred lakhs. Five years, two hundred twenty lakhs. These are the cash flows which will be accrued to us. If the cost of capital of the industry, which means rate of return, which the industry is earning, is twelve point five percent, estimate the falling value of the company. You need to compute the value of the company. Secondly, value of the equity. If the if company is employed, a debt of five hundred lakh rupees. Okay. So first of all, we are going to compute the value of the uh, company. Okay. So guys, presentation is the key. Okay. Since it's marathon, I'm not going to um, uh, do the presentation in the full blown manner, which I typically do in the class, but still I will try to uh, do some bit of calculations. So computation of value of company. What are we going to do is here, Okay, cash flow, then this will be discounting factor at the rate of 12.5%. This will be the present value of cash flow. This is how I'm going to chart it out. One, two, three, four, and five. Five years are there. 
revenues are given for next five years of this particular company we have to compute the value of the company today okay so discounting is going to be done these are the future values we need to compute the present value accumulate together to compute the value of this particular company yes sir cash flow 100 180 170 200 220 so these are the cash flows which are there these are the cash flows which are there okay discounting factor is at the rate of 12.5 percent so what i'm going to do is one divided by 1.125 one divided by 1.125 that is how i'm going to compute the discounting factor one plus r percent okay 1.125 the first year I'll get 0.889 and three decimal places are sufficient. For second year I'll get 0 0.790. For third year I'll get 0 0.702. For fourth year I'll get 0 0.624. For fifth year I'll get 0 0.555. Okay. This is how I'm going to get the discounting factors. Now I'm going to multiply it and add it in totality. 100 multiplied by 0.889 M plus 180 multiplied by 0 0.790 14 142.2 Okay. 170 multiplied by 0 0.702 M plus 200 multiplied by 0.624 M plus 100. Okay, mercy will be 597.34. That's the value of the company. That's the value of the company. Now this is the value of the company. The value of the company is determined as 597.34 lakhs. Now the next question is that uh, if the value of equity, what is the value of equity if the debt employed in the company is 500 lakhs? So out of this value, if debt is 500, then what is the remaining left for the equity shareholders? It is 97.34 lakhs is remaining for the equity shareholders. Okay. 97.34 lakhs is remaining for the equity shareholders. 500 is the value of debt and 97.34 lakhs is remaining for the equity shareholders. That is the value of the company and value of equity shareholders if debt is 500 lakhs. That is how uh, this particular example is uh, required to be done. Okay. So yes, this is the basic concept of um, uh, valuation and valuation specifically according to the income approach. Okay. Discounted cash flow technique. Let's study what is cost of capital or the discounting rate. So guys, just now you've seen 12.5%. It is already given in the question, but sometimes the question will not give you this percentage and it will ask you to compute the percentage to cost of capital method. So cost of capital can be of three types, cost of equity, cost of debt and weighted average cost of capital or the overall cost of capital. Okay. Cost of equity means what is the shareholders expectation um, of a return that they are going to get a, uh, for their equity investment in the company. That is cost of equity. So uh, equity will definitely have some charge to it. Will have some, um, uh, you know, incoming income to it. What is that income that equity shareholders are expecting? That is cost of equity. So whatever is expected return of the equity shareholders fund used by the business, it is in form of dividends, bonus share rights issue, etc. And CAPM is the most important and most popular method of computing cost of equity. What is CAPM model? CAPM model is this. Cost of equity is equal to risk free rate of return plus beta multiplied by market risk premium multiplied by market risk premium what is market risk premium market risk premium means the uh, 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 the the uh, differential of market rate of return um, uh, minus the risk free rate of return that the differential of rm minus rf whatever market is earning minus whatever risk free uh, assets are earning if you differentiate if you uh, uh, compute a difference between the two that is known as the market risk premium so ke cost of equity is equal to risk free uh, rate of uh, uh, return in market plus 
beta multiplied by market risk premium which is market risk minus the risk free rate of return that is the CAPM model and the most common um, uh, method of computing the cost of equity now second is cost of debt if you want to compute the cost of debt what is the cost that company is going to bear for the debt um, that it uses in its capital that is cost of debt Now, cost of debt is nothing but the interest which you are paying for that particular debt that interest that you are paying for that particular debt is the cost that you are incurring for the uh, loan or for the debenture holders now that interest is of course deductible to tax right tax benefit you are going to draw from that particular interest so the cost of debt is always net of interest I'll give you a simple example if your interest is rupees 100 per annum if your interest is rupees 100 per annum then your cost of debt is not 100 is less than 100 why because 30 percent of tax benefit is what you are going to get on this particular interest right you are going to save tax on this interest that saving of tax is also incorporated in cost of debt so your actual cost of debt is only 70 rupees and not 100 rupees because out of 100 rupees of interest that you're going to pay you're going to save 30 rupees right 100 minus 30 is 70 so what is the cost of debt 70 given 30 percent is the tax rate so interest is different than cost of debt interest is 100 cost of debt is 70 okay so cost of debt is always net of tax the interest and cost of that ha debt have this relationship that cost of debt is equal to interest into 1 minus tax that is the tax saving now comes the overall cost of capital if we talk about the overall cost of capital and if you want to know what is the overall cost of capital that a particular business is incurring or using uh, the both the debt capital as well as the equity capital what is the conjoint what is the um, uh, combined cost of capital if you want to uh, ascertain that then we have a formula for that which is known as the weighted average cost of capital now what is the formula for weighted average cost of capital weighted average cost of capital is KE which is cost of equity multiplied by weight of equity what do you mean by weight of equity weight of equity means that out of the total capital structure how much is the equity portion so suppose if your total capital is 5 lakhs which includes 1 lakh of equity and 4 lakh of debt you have total capital structure of 5 lakhs which includes 1 lakh of equity 4 lakh of debt your weight of equity is in that case your weight of equity is 1 lakh divided by 5 lakhs that is your weight of equity 1 lakh divided by 5 lakh is your weight of equity so cost of equity multiplied by weight of equity plus cost of debt multiplied by weight of debt that is the formula for weighted average cost of capital and needless to say cost of debt is always net of tax it is always net of tax therefore for abundant caution we have put this 1 minus t over here ideally cost of debt means it is net of tax itself okay note the weights are assigned should ideally be based on market values of these equities however in absence of market values book values are used as a proxy so these weights are to be taken as per the market values of equity and debt if market values are not there then book value can also be okay now discounting for perpetuity perpetuity means for infinite years now what if uh, uh, i tell you that 1 lakh rupees will be earned by a particular organization starting one year from now one year two infinite years two infinite years this one lakh will be earned 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 and earned. how will you discount you know you cannot just keep on writing one lakh one lakh one lakh one lakh one lakh and um, you know discounting factor you can write uh, 909826753 and you go on 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 and on and on so what happens when um, the discounting happens for a perpetuity which means for unlimited time period the discounting happens what is the formula for that for that the formula is cash flow which is expected divided by the discounting rate so simply it is cash flow which is 1 lakh rupees divided by the whatever is the discounting rate or the return that you are expecting so if it is 10 percent then you simply divide by 10 percent nothing doing you know 1 plus 10 percent no no nothing of that sort to be done so if discounting is to be done for perpetuity so that is how you are going to compute the discounted cash flow if the cash flow is expected for an infinite time period you're just going to divide your cash flow by the rate of return which you, which which will be given in the question or you'll be required to ask you will be required to compute it now what if the uh, cash flow which is going to uh, be earned all through the perpetuity is with growth right so cash flow is being earned so 1 lakh rupees is earned till infinite years but with 5% growth every year 
There's a five percent growth in it every year. How will the formula change? Formula new formula will be cash flow into one plus growth rate. Growth rate is five percent divided by R minus G. R is the rate of return. G is the growth rate. So this is the revised formula if the growth is expected for an infinite time period with stable growth, right? So if the question asks you to compute the value. Uh, with growth for an infinite time period, then this is the formula. If without growth for infinite time period, then this is the formula. So cash flow divided by R. Uh, uh, this is the value uh, uh, for for the cash flows for infinite period without growth. Cash into one plus growth rate divided by R minus G. That is the formula for um, uh, the the value of a particular asset, which will yield constant cash flow with stable growth for an infinite time period. These are the two formulas which are very very important from an exam standpoint. We are going to use it in our uh, in our calculation quite often. Terminal value, one very very important topic that is required to be uh, you know uh, understood by you very very clearly. Okay, now many a times the question will tell you that this company is going to earn one lakh rupees for next five years, and thereafter, which means sixth year onward, sixth year onward, this company is going to um, uh, earn. A fixed revenue of say fifty thousand rupees till infinite years. So first year to fifth year one lakh rupees, sixth year to infinite years fifty thousand rupees. This is the mix which question might give you. Okay, in this particular situation, you're going to segregate these two portion. This is the initial period cash flow. This you're going to uh, calculate separately. This is the um in finite period cash flow this you are going to calculate separately you going to add both of them to compute the total value now this portion of um uh, the the cash flow which is going to be earned for infinite period this will yield terminal value to you this is the terminal value so terminal value includes both the fixed period cash flow and the terminal value which means that you know once the uh, once the uh, business will be on a constant um cash flow then what is the value at that point in so both the formulas will be combined over here two formulas put in together right this is the normal cash flow five years cash flow which will be um, uh, required to compute the value and that will be the infinite period cash flow that will be required to compute the value infinite period means infinite for infinite period we are going to calculate the constant cash flow okay that will yield us the terminal value that's how terminal value is required to be computed now free cash flow to firm and free cash flow to equity these are two important words which uh, we should be aware of so free cash flow to firm means the cash flow includes interest also okay this won't include this won't exclude interest so interest is added this cash flow okay and free cash flow to equity means interest is subtracted while calculating this cash flow interest is subtracted so the cash which will be available to the equity shareholders that is free cash flow to equity cash which will be appear available to the entire firm this will be including the interest also so interest will be added in this equity that is the only difference between free cash flow to firm free cash flow to equity now as per the question whatever question will demand from us we'll be alternatively using these two cash flows according to the requirement of the question so free cash flow to the firm profit after tax add non cash charges now please remember that this is free cash flow which means non cash expenses are required to be added non cash um uh, incomes are required to be subtracted everything should be cash which means depreciation is required to be added because depreciation is a non cash item depreciation is required to be added over here less capital expenditure capital expenditure is all in cash so that is required to be required reduced then less working capital investment which means whatever working capital we have invested in our business that is also required to be reduced while computing the cash flow then tax adjustment interest is to be added interest is always added while computing the free cash flow to firm then what is the free cash flow to equity free cash flow to equity it will just have <coughs> an additional um uh, you know the interest is not required to be added no interest added okay over uh, in the above section we had seen that interest was added no interest added okay interest is required to be reduced and profit after tax is after reduction of interest so no interest is required to be added uh secondly net borings are required to be added whatever the net borings during the period if you have um you know done some additional borings during the period that is required to be added because that will add on to the cash flow of the equity shareholders because the borings are done from the 
lenders from the people who have given us loan so those people will give us the borrowing so cash flow is required to be added when you are um, computing the free cash flow to the equity borrowings which you have done from the debt holders from the debenture holders that is required to be added while computing the free cash flow to the firm um, uh, to the equity okay free cash flow to the equity so this is the calculation of free cash flow to the equity <clears throat> okay so if we compute the relationship between these two free cash flow to equity is equal to free cash flow to firm minus tax adjusted interest so interest is required to be reduced from the free cash flow to the firm so if we uh, have the relationship we want to know the relationship between free cash flow to equity and firm free cash flow to equity is equal to free cash flow from firm minus tax adjusted interest expense interest expense is required to be reduced because um, uh, equity uh, free cash flow to equity does not include interest and add net borrowings whatever borrowings we have made from the debt holders that is required to be added because that uh, forms the kitty of the equity shareholders equity shareholders have got that cash uh, with them to be spent on the business so that is required to be added and interest is required to be reduced while calculating the free cash flow to equity now profit earning capitalized value or capitalization of earnings method now in this particular method guys um, uh, instead of discounting the cash flow we are capitalizing the cash flow this is very similar to um, cash flow which is to be earned for a longer period of time which is infinite period if we are having cash flows uh, which is earned for an infinite period then we use this technique profit earning capacity capitalized value so in this particular thing what is a slight difference is you know <clears throat> we take expected profits expected profits of future whatever profits are expected in future and we are going to capitalize them using the discounting rate this is very similar to um, uh, what we do in our discounting spree in case of infinite period cash flow when infinite period cash flow is there whatever discounting method we are going to we have used there that same method we use over here okay so whatever is the expected profits expected cash flow from the business that is required to be um, uh, capitalized which means that is required to be divided by the discounting uh, factor which we have calculated okay now economic value added one of the very important topics of your syllabus guys um, whatever value addition we have made for the shareholders that is known as the economic value added it is the increase in the shareholders value with whatever has been done by the business increase in shareholders value is the economic value added so very important concept of your uh, syllabus primarily from a practical standpoint this will come in the examination uh, from a practical standpoint okay so what is eva eva is net operating profit after tax so please focus on the words operating profit okay net operating profit after tax whatever is the net operating profit which the company has earned after tax minus the current cost of capital whatever is the current cost of capital whatever is the cost of capital the um uh, the uh, mandatory uh, you know uh, dividend that we need to pay to our shareholders that is the cost of capital guys now sir why do you say mandatory because it's our own will whether we pay dividend to the shareholders or not but no guys to maintain the share prices or to satisfy the uh, shareholders there is some minimum amount of dividend which you must give which you have to give to the shareholders come what may come what may there is a minimum amount of dividend that you need to pay to the shareholders that is known as the uh, cost of equity so the formula of eva is a net operating profit after tax whatever is your operating profit whatever is your profit um, uh, through operations after tax minus current cost of capital whatever is the cost of capital um and that you are incurring like cost of equity that you are incurring um after even reducing that cost of capital whatever is remaining with the business which will actually contribute to increasing the shareholders value that will be the economic value okay so where no pat is equal to operating income into one minus tax rate operating income is required to be computed and we reduce the tax from it current cost of capital is capital employed multiplied by cost of capital which is weighted average capital employed is the capital employed in business okay Now let us do a practical question quickly. Calculate the EVA, economic value added from the following data. Debt is given to us, equity is given to us. Both of them are given to us. Cost of debt is given to us, then cost of equity is given to us. We can calculate the weight. Oh, weight average cost of capital is also given to us. We need not calculate the weight average cost of capital. It is already given to us, sixteen point five four percent. Profit after tax. Profit after tax is given to us, but before exceptional items, which is good. But we need operating profit, right? So this is the profit after tax. Then interest after tax. This is the interest which is given 
after tax we need to compute the eva economic value added okay all right so economic value added is equal to net operating profit after tax minus weighted average cost of capital multiplied by the capital employed okay again i am writing the formulas or the answers in a cryptic manner you do not have to write the um, answers in this manner you have to properly caption the answers computation of economic value added and write the full formula okay don't write um, uh, formula in brief abbreviations okay so no pat is required no pat is 1541 plus interest okay this is no pat minus weighted average cost of capital is given to us 16.54% multiplied by the capital employed capital employed is 50 plus 2766 2766 plus 50 2816 that is the capital employed okay so 281.2816 multiplied by 16.54% gives me a figure of 46 5.77 minus 1546 okay this gives me a figure of 1080 crores so don't focus on the answers or computation as of now just focus on what is the concept concept is very very important as of now uh, you know concept is that whatever operating profit a business has generated over a period of time if we subtract the cost of capital from that operating profit then we are going to get the um, uh, remainder economic value added which is nothing but the shareholders value which shareholders have um, uh, increase or which shareholders have uh, you know uh, made an addition made an addition to uh, shareholders value have value has increased that shareholders value represents the economic value so this is the concept of economic value added okay so yes guys this was our first chapter basics of valuation along with the valuation models and this chapter will typically hold say uh, about 5 marks in your syllabus but the point is that this chapter forms the basis of all the ensuing chapters which i'm going to discuss in this particular marathon video so if you if you're not clear with discounting concept if you're not clear with um uh, concept of perpetuity growth till perpetuity then you're not going to um be comfortable in solving the questions of valuation of shares or valuation of mergers and acquisition so this chapter will form the basis of your knowledge and then we are going to build upon this knowledge uh, so let's start the next chapter mergers and acquisitions let us start our chapter on mergers and acquisition and yes by far the most important uh, subject most important chapter of your subject um uh, yes it comes for an average of 15 marks in your examination um uh, yes for for some of the Uh, attempts it has also come for lesser marks but never less than 8 marks or 10 marks that is the minimum that this chapter has come for uh, and uh, if you go at the upper limit then this chapter has come for 20 25 marks also in your examination so one of the most important topics of your uh, examination of your subject and yes a mandatory question from this particular um uh, chapter will definitely come in your examination so there's no doubt that this chapter will not be there in your examination it will definitely be there in your examination marks might range from 10 to say 20 uh anywhere between these uh, numbers the marks will range now what do you mean by mergers and acquisition first of all, first of all we need to understand what is this transaction of mergers and acquisition mergers and acquisition means when two firms merge together to make a new firm and they decide to do their business as a new firm that is known as mergers or acquisitions okay now there can be multiple scenarios that you know two firm merges together to create a new firm maybe c limited so a and b merges together to create c limited uh, there is another scenario when a and b merges together to create a limited a limited remains and b limited gets diluted so that is also a eventuality uh, that can also happen so anything can happen both the companies merge together to form a new company or both the companies uh, you know merge together one company going into another company and the uh, bitter company remains and the target company dilutes so this is the bitter company this is the target company better company remains the target company dilutes um uh, guys we are not bothered about the mode of merger or the mode of acquisition we are more concerned about the uh, valuation how do you value our uh, you know um, company during this entire transaction so be it 
merger, be it acquisition, be it uh, forming of a new company, be it um, an existing company merging with a new company, the method will remain the same. All right. Now, two companies when they merge together, then they have a set of financials already available pre-merger. Okay. So these are the set of financials which are already there for both the companies. Okay. So uh, company A will have an earnings of one lakh rupees. Company B will have an earning of fifty thousand rupees. Company A has a number of share of eighty thousand rupee eighty thousand. Company B has number of shares of fifty thousand. Company A has EPS of twelve point five. Company B has EPS of rupees ten only. Now the first question is that if company B is getting diluted, if company B is getting eradicated, if company B is merging into A Limited, then shareholders of B Limited want something to forego their shares in B Limited. Or want something in return. Either you give them cash. Or you give them shares of A Limited. It's your choice. Both the modes are available. You give them cash. Now, or you give them uh, shares of A Limited. Um, they'll be satisfied. So B Limited's shareholders want something in return of, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, merging into A Limited, and that something in return might be cash, might be shares, or any other valuable consideration. Now the mood point of consideration over is how to calculate how much cash is to be given by A Limited to B Limited shareholder. How many shareholder shares to be given by A Limited to B Limited shareholder? What is the consideration that is required to be um, uh, given in this particular uh, deal? Now, this particular aspect is always dealt with by mutual consultation between the two company shareholders. It is a matter of uh, communication. It's a matter of uh, negotiation between A Limited and B Limited. So, B Limited shareholders might say that please give us um, whatever we are foregoing in B Limited, the entire value of B Limited, we have determined in a particular manner. You give the entire amount in cash to us, or they might say that whatever is the uh, value of B Limited, you give that entire amount in your, your number of shares. Uh, either of the situations can be there. So, consideration can be paid either in cash or in kind. Both is possible. So, analyzing the premium offered to target shareholders, sometimes target shareholders, which means B limited shareholders, might also ask for something more than the value of the company. If the value of the company is say five crores, then they will ask uh, the target company, the bidder company, to pay five crores and fifty lakh rupees. Why is fifty lakh rupees additionally paid? Because in future this company is going to grow. Okay, so the growth prospect which this company has, which the target company has, for that the shareholders might want something extra, and that extra is known as the premium. So purchase premium, the context of merger acquisition refers to the excess that an acquirer pays over market trading value of the target company. So whatever is the target company shares, um, we pay something over and above it that is known as the market premium. Now market premium is target shareholders gain um, is the deal price minus the pre-merger market value of target. So that is the premium. Okay. So whatever is the deal price, in our case the deal price was 5 crores 50 lakhs. And the pre-merger market price of the target company was 5 crores. So what is the premium? Premium is 50 lakhs, 0.5 crores. Okay, this is the premium that uh, the uh, target company is going to receive from the shareholders of the um, bidder company. Now what is the acquisition premium in percentage terms? Acquisition premium in percentage terms is the premium that is going to be fetched, which is 50 lakh in that case, in this case, divided by the pre-merger price of the target company. Whatever is the pre-merger price of the target company, um, uh, that premium, that pre-merger price of the target company should be there in the denominator. In this case, the pre-merger um, the price of the target company is 5 crores. So, 0 0.5 divided by 5 crores, 10% is the acquisition premium in this particular case in percentage terms. If the question asks you to compute it. Okay. Now, we move on to the most important topic, most important concept of our um, chapter, which is the swap ratio. Now, if the exchange happens in number of shares, if exchange happens in number of shares, then how many shares of target company are to be, uh, how many shares of bidder company are to be given to the target company shareholders? This is known as the swap ratio. I'll demonstrate it using an example uh, in my own example. Okay. Now, let us see this. Okay. A limited shares are 1 lakh. They remain intact. B limited shareholders are 5 lakh. Okay. B limited shareholders are 5 lakh. Now, we need to see in, uh, in place of this 5 lakh shares, how many shares would we um, uh, give to the B limited shareholders in A limited? Suppose A limited says that uh, in return of your 5 lakh shares, I am going to give you 2.5 lakh shares in my company. A limited is saying 
that in exchange of 5 lakh shares of B Limited to the shareholders of B Limited, I'm going to give 2.5 lakh shares of my company, which is A Limited company. Then the swap ratio is 0.5 off. And if by any chance the deal closes in a manner that, uh, uh, you know, in place of 5 lakh shares of B Limited, we will give 10 lakh shares of A Limited to B Limited shareholders, then the swap ratio is two times double. So depending upon whatever is the exchange ratio, whatever is the exchange ratio, exchange ratio means the number of shares which the target company shareholders get in um, uh, the bidder company in place of their shares. That is the exchange ratio or the swap ratio. So this exchange ratio or swap ratio is computed by analyzing what is the number of shares which uh, uh, you know um, the target company gets in the acquirer company. What is the number of shares which target company gets, okay? The target company is B limited. It gets say 10 lakh shares out of, um, uh, instead of 5 lakh of their shares, then the uh, swap ratio is two. And if the target company gets half of the shares, if the target company gets uh, say 2.5 lakh shares in A limited, instead of 5 lakh shares of B limited, then the swap ratio is 0 0.5. That is how swap ratio is computed, okay? So now, how swap ratio determined? How swap ratio um, uh, actually we come at the swap ratio. So guys, to determine swap ratio, we can use any of these methods. Earning per share, market price per share, book value per share, net assets value um, of both the companies, target company and the bidder company. Obviously guys, uh, you know, this will not be an abrupt number. So, you know, the target company will always say that in, in, in place of my 5 lakh shares, you give me as many shares as possible, maximum shares as possible. And bidder company will always say that instead of 5 lakh, in place of 5 lakh uh, shares, we will give you lesser and lesser amount of shares. So how to come at that equilibrium, how to reach that middle point where target company and uh, bidder company both are satisfied. We can see the earning per share of both the companies. We can see the market price per share of both the companies, BVPS of both the companies or NAV of both the companies. Now the formula which is used for computing the swap ratio is this formula. EPS or MPS or BVPS or NAV of the target company divided by EPS or MPS or BVPS or NAV of the bidder company. So target company EPS is kept as numerator, bidder company EPS is kept as denominator. I'll give you an example. Okay, so in my case, I had 5 lakh shares of target company. Now suppose target company's earning per share is 2. Bidder company's earning per share is 4. So obviously bidder company is stronger. And bidder company is stronger, then it will give lesser number of shares to the target company. And how much lesser? It will be 2 lakh 50 thousand. Half of the shares of bidder company, um, uh, you know, half the shares of target company, the bidder company will give. Half is the uh, swap ratio. So swap ratio in this case is 0.5. Now suppose this situation was the reverse, which means target company had EPS of 4. Target company was a larger company. Target company has EPS of 4. Bidder company has EPS of only 2. In this case, bidder company was weak. If bidder company is weak, then target company will demand more number of shares um, in, in, in the bidder company for its shares. So target company will demand 10 lakh shares in this case. So depending upon how strong are you in terms of your financial numbers, in terms of your ratios, in terms of your vitals, how strong are you, the deal will be negotiated. And this will always be given in the question, okay, that the deal is negotiated at the swap ratio of say 0.4. 0.5. This will always be given in the question. That is the formula of swap ratio. Now, once we compute the swap ratio, next thing is to compute the new earnings per share. Okay. The next thing is to compute the new earnings per share. Now, what is new earnings per share? New earnings per share means after merger takes place, what is the new earnings per share that will accrue to the merged entity, the new entity? Merged entity or the new entity. What is the earning per share that will accrue to the merged entity or the new entity uh, that is required to be determined? Now, this will be determined in a very simple manner. Earnings of bidder company, whatever earning bidder company is earning as of now. Earnings of target company, because guys, after merger, the target company and bidder company will join hands, right? So, whatever is earning of bidder company, Whatever is earning of target company, both will be combined together. 
plus synergy benefit. Always in a merger and acquisition deal, there is some kind of synergy. What is synergy? Synergy means both the companies will join hands and earn little extra than what they were earning uh, individually. Sir, will there always be a synergy? More often than not, there is synergy because without synergy, merger and acquisition deal is a, a, a big fail. If the both of both of the companies are earning say 10 crores and 20 crores pre-merger, and after merger also they are earning only 30 crore, what is the point in merging? These two separate businesses. Point of merging will only arise when there will be some additional benefit of combining the two firms. 10 crores and 20 crores is the, additional, is the current earning. If the combined earning is 35 crore, then only merge and acquisition deal is actually worth, it's actually valuable. <clears throat> Otherwise, what's the point in merging two companies if they will earn the same income um, as what they were earning before merger? There's no point in merging such company. Don't merge such company. Okay. So, merge and acquisition has to be with some synergy benefit. So, earning will be a little more than the pre-merger earnings. So, pre-merger earnings are, uh, you know, of bidder company and target company are all already there with us. We add synergy benefit to it. We add some additional income to it. That is how new earnings will be um, uh, computed and that will be created, uh, put at the numerator. Now, denominator will have new number of shares. So, existing share of bidder company will remain as it is. In our example, we had 1 lakh shares of A Limited. They will remain as it is. They will not uh, be changed. In addition to it, there will be additional shares which will be given to the target company shareholder. In addition to the 1 lakh existing shares of better company, there will be existing, there will be additional shares which will be given to the um, uh, target company shareholders. And how will that be computed? The shares of target company, the existing share of target company multiplied by the swap ratio. So in our case, the shares of target company was 5 lakh multiplied by swap ratio in our case was 0.5, right? So what are the new number of shares which are issued to target company shareholders? There will be 2.5 lakhs. So the total number of shares post merger is 3.5 lakhs. Yes, I am uh, doing everything in a, in a quite a speedy manner because guys, this is a marathon. This I cannot delve into each and every topic and explain you it in detail. In my video, I have... Uh, I've taken two hours to explain only this formula. You know, two hours we have taken just to explain this formula. It cannot be done in a marathon kind of scenario because over here we need to be really quick. I'm just going to, um, uh, you know, revise the formulas uh, with you so that you remember it in your examinations, okay? That is the formula for new earning per share. Now let us come on to our example also. This was our example. Okay. Earnings were 1 lakh plus 5 lakhs. <clears throat> Old earnings were 1 lakh and 5 lakhs. Okay. Okay, these were earnings and I had taken it as a number of shares. Okay, sorry, my mistake. Okay, earnings are 1 lakh and 5 lakhs. Uh, there is a synergy benefit of 4 lakh rupees. 4 lakh rupees additional benefit is there. So, 1 lakh plus 5 lakh plus 4 lakh is the total earning post merger. Whole divided by the existing number of shares of bidder company, which is 80,000 in this case, plus 50,000 multiplied by the swap ratio. Swap ratio came to be 0.5. Okay. Formula is earning of bidder company plus earning of target company plus synergy benefit divided by number of shares of bidder company plus number of shares of target company multiplied by the swap ratio. That is a formula for new earnings per share post merger. Okay. This is the new earnings per share post merger. Very, very important formula because uh, quite often this formula is um, asked in the examination in various forms and this uh, formula will uh, you know what nothing various form guys this formula will be asked in the examination okay for sure this formula will be asked in the examination this formula is definitely very very important formula the new earning per share formula okay sir now we come on to the next concept of this particular chapter and a very very important concept which is the equalized earning per share equalized earning per share okay now after the merger deal is done we often tend to compare the earnings per share post merger and pre merger often we um, you know try to estimate what is the earning per share which my shareholders were getting pre merger and what is the earning per share that my shareholders are getting post merger so that we can analyze the benefit which is accruing to the shareholders due to this merger okay so while comparing the earning per share pre merger and post merger one thing is mandatorily required to be done which is equalization what is equalization i'll tell you now okay Okay. 
Now I'll talk about the bidder, the target company. Target company in our case is B Limited. Okay. This is the target company in our case is B Limited. Okay. Now B Limited had number of shares as fifty thousand pre merger. And the post merger number of shares is suppose post merger number of shares is forty thousand. Pre merger number of shares is fifty thousand. Post merger number of shares is forty thousand. Okay. <clears throat> Or let it be eighty thousand. Post merger number of shares is eighty thousand. Pre merger number of shares is fifty thousand. Okay. Now these are the number of shares. And what is the earnings per share? Earning per share initially were rupees two per share. And after merger, the earning per share is only one point five per share. Earlier the earnings were two rupees per share, and now the new earning per share is one point five post merger of target company. Now, when we analyze this kind of a situation, guys, we are thinking that oh, our earning per share has reduced, so there's a loss to the bidder company shareholders. The analysis which we uh, will get, uh, you know, after a first look of this is that earnings per share has reduced for the B Limited shareholders. The earning per share has reduced. This is a very some situation. This this situation is not really um, good enough. You know, number of shares has increased, but earning per share has reduced. So this is not a good situation. But guys, in fact, this is a good situation. Why? Because let's look at the total earnings which accrues to the shareholders now. Okay. The total earnings which accrues to the shareholders earlier was one lakh rupees, and the total earnings which accrue to the shareholders now is. One lakh twenty thousand rupees. So actually, shareholders are gaining because of this entire merger and acquisition um, uh, deal. It's not a loss. It's again. It's just that EPS is showing a loss. So why is EPS showing a loss? Because you are not comparing uh, the EPS properly. The base of this EPS is different. Two rupees is on the base of fifty thousand shares. One point five is on the base of eighty thousand shares. So the base is not common. If you Uh, compare apples to oranges you will not be able to compare it at all so what are we going to do we are going to compute the equalized old eps what do you mean by equalized old eps which it means that we are going to assume that you know if the eps was computed on the basis of uh, 80000 shares then what would have been the eps so the formula is old eps divided by the swap ratio what is the swap ratio in this case swap ratio is Eighty thousand divided by fifty thousand, which is one point six. One point six is the swap ratio. So two divided by one point six is one point two five. Okay. So what have I done? I've used a simple formula, or which is old EPS divided by the swap ratio, or the exchange ratio, to compute the equalized old EPS. Now this is the equalized old EPS. Equalized old EPS is coming out to be 1.25, and now I can compare 1.25 with 1.5 and analyze that or conclude that EPS is increasing. EPS is also increasing. This is a benefit to the shareholders. So if you if you are comparing the original EPS with the new EPS, then there was a loss which was seen by us shown in the computation. But when we equalize the EPS, then we see that the EPS is actually increasing. So this is a situation where shareholders are benefiting and not incurring a loss. This is the concept of equalized EPS. This is the concept of equalized EPS. Okay, so whenever you are comparing EPS, always equalize the old EPS to compare it with the new EPS, and then you are going to get the uh, differential. Whether it's a loss or a profit, you are going to get the differential. Okay, okay, sir. So this is the concept of equalization of EPS. Okay, formula I've already given you. What is the formula? Formula is Old EPS divided by the swap ratio. That is the formula for equalized EPS. Now, one more very important fact, uh, important thing about uh, uh, equalized EPS, guys. Equalized EPS is not required to be computed for the bidder company shareholders. Why? Because bidder company shares remain the same in old and the new form. Bidder company shareholders uh, shares remain the same. So, if earlier it was one lakh, uh, new shares will also be one lakh. 
target company shareholders changes therefore equalization is required in target company uh, eps but the uh, bitter company eps equalization is not required okay sir then what is the concept of growth growth means uh, when a organization grows over a period of time and um, growth is resulted when you are investing your profits into the business rather than investing it elsewhere or rather than distributing it to shareholders that is known as growth growth happens when you invest your own profits in your business rather than giving it to the shareholders that is the um, uh, meaning of growth okay so what is the formula for growth formula for growth is retention ratio retention ratio means eps minus dps divided by eps this is the retention ratio so whatever you have retained in your business as known as the retention ratio so retention ratio multiplied by uh, what return are you going to get out of this retention it is return on equity so return retention ratio multiplied by return on equity will give you the uh, percentage of growth so growth is retention ratio multiplied by return on equity that is the formula for growth growth is b multiplied by roe that is the formula for growth okay so got it and last but not at all the least uh, uh you know the last practical concept of this particular chapter which is value of the firm how to compute value of an entire firm okay because in this particular um uh, chapter we are also going to compute the value of the target company so examiner can give you to compute the value of target company how will you compute the value of target company again using the discounted cash flow method whatever cash flow is going to be earned in future we are going to discount it to the present value if it's with growth then we are going to use this formula free cash flow into 1 plus g divided by cost of capital minus growth that is a formula typical formula which we use for um uh, you know computing the value of the firm with infinite years cash flow with stable growth okay this is the formula which you are going to compute for target company if value of firm is required to be computed in some questions value of firm might be required to be computed uh, the target company value or the bidder company value might be required to be computed by you now a theoretical question which is again an important um, uh, you know question can come in the examination also defensive techniques used by a target company so if uh, a target company is being a uh, you know a uh, subject to a hostile merger someone is merging the target company forcefully then what techniques can be used to avoid that merger okay so these are the defensive techniques used by target company to counter the hostile merger to um, uh, you know uh, challenge the hostile merger what techniques can be used by the target company target company doesn't want to be acquired and someone is forcefully acquiring it so what are the techniques that can be used okay number one poison pills it grants the company a right to issue stock options to the existing shareholders so existing shareholders are issued some stock options free of cost their equity is being enhanced so that their value inflates and um, um with with a high value the bidder is not able to buy the company the existing shareholders enabling them to purchase additional shares of the stock at significantly discounted price they effectively make it very expensive for the acquirer to take over the target if you give more shares to the existing shareholders then existing shareholders will swell up their prices will um, be inflated and then it will become difficult for the uh, bidder company to buy the target company then there are poison puts it gives the target company bond holders the right to sell their bonds back to the target at a pre specified redemption price so the target company will buy its all bonds back okay in the event of a takeover this means that if acquirer takes over the target it would need to raise substantial amount of cash to refinance the target's debt now if the company which is the target company if it um uh, purchases back its all debt okay if it repays all its debt okay uh, if it repays its loan if it repays its debenture holders everything dilutes its debt to zero then the bidder company will be required to put in more cash to finance the debt also along with equity then only buying equity will not work because debt will also be required uh, for such a company then there will be a problem for the bidder company to acquire such a company share repurchase target may repurchase its shares from the shareholder this can increase the cost of takeover from the acquirer by increasing the stock price or by causing the acquirer to increase its bid to remain competitive with the target offer for its own shares now sometimes target company buy back their own shares okay when they buy back their own shares then th those shares are not available with public and it's not available with public then uh, the bidder company will face a problem in purchasing those shares and the prices of the shares can also be inflated um, by the bidder company by the target company if all the shares are bought back by the target company target company will buy back all the shares the entire control of the target company will be with the shareholders of the uh, target company and then they will swell up the prices of the shares to 
um, orbit or to uh, you know uh, prevent the hostile merger. Then we have crown jewel defenses target sells off valuable assets or divisions to make firm less attractive to the acquirer. So the target company will sell off its most important assets or most important divisions so that it becomes lesser attractive to the um, uh, acquirer. But the point is that, sir, if they would sell their valuable assets, then what will remain with them? Catch is that they will sell their valuable assets or division to a related company, to a related party. Not to any third party, but a related party. And the acquirer is not buying the related party. Acquirer is only buying your company. So for the acquirer, the company becomes useless. That's the strategy to uh, avoid or prevent hostile merger. White Knight Defense, target company encourages a third firm to acquire the target company. The entrance of White Knight might ignite the bidding war for target, which may result in improved terms being offered to the target shareholders. It may also result in eventual acquire, acquire suffering with a winner's curse. Now, this is a very important terminology, winner's curse, okay? What happens in this particular strategy is that um, whenever a bidder is trying to acquire a target, the target company will infuse or introduce a third party to the entire game, to the entire deal. And that third party will make an offer to purchase the target. And when that third party will make an offer to purchase the target, at that point in time, guys, the target company will inflate the prices and will become less accessible. Because negotiations will happen between the third party and the bidder company. So the target company will become less accessible. The target company will become a bit more expensive in that particular case. And that is when the um, white knight will um, uh, actually increase the price of the target or actually be a, a play a crucial role in uh, becoming the uh, becoming the person who will try to avoid the hostile merger. Hostile merger will be avoided in that particular case. Then restricted voting rights. Um, uh, you know, when the shares are issued to the um, uh, to the potential bidders, then we can put a restriction that, you know, we will not give you equal voting rights. If you issue the shares without voting rights, equal voting rights, then this company will become lesser attractive for the share. That's obviously, because voting rights are definitely required. If you issue, issue restricted voting rights, then this will for the bidder to negotiate with the board directly. So at that point in time, it will become little insignificant or little in impressive for the uh, uh, bidder company to buy the shares of the company. And golden parachutes, compensation arrangement between the targets and its seed and management where the managers get lucrative cash payouts if they leave the target company after the merger. These contracts give a key executive can be used as a type of anti-takeover measure taken by the firm to discourage the unwanted takeover attempt. Now, what happens in this particular case is that, you know, Actually, what, what is happening is that senior management is trying to sell the company. Now, when senior management is trying to sell the company forcefully, um, uh, then you know what can, so suppose if workers don't want to come, want the company to be sold, then you know the workers will, will present a very lucrative offer to the senior management. Senior management can pay, take that amount of cash and they can exit from the company. And then the workers will take over. And if workers will take over, then they will uh, restrict the uh, merger to take place. They will not let the merger happen. This is how senior management is pulled out of the company and the workers or the other people take over and the company is, um, uh, you know, restricted or the company is um, forbidden from the merger spree. That is how Golden Parachute will help in avoiding the merger of a particular target company. So these are the strategies which are used for um, uh, a hostile turnover, avoiding the hostile turnover for target company. These strategies are very, very important in avoiding the uh, takeover. And this topic is very important from an exam standpoint because, you know, theory is anyways going to come very less, guys, from this chapter. I'm being very honest to you. Theory is going to come, um, uh, you know, least for least marks from this particular chapter. Only practical question is going to come. But this topic is important from a theory standpoint. If examiner chooses this chapter for a theory, um, uh, you know, kind of a theory um, uh, chapter, then this topic is going to be really, really important. So yes, these were the revision of important topics or important formulas of merge and acquisition chapter. Now let us move on to the next chapter. Let us start the next topic of our syllabus, which is valuation of shares. Yes, valuation of investments is the name of the entire chapter and it contains valuation of bonds, valuation of preference shares, 
and some other form of um, valuations but i am currently focusing on two kind of valuations valuation of shares and valuation of warrants um questions of which, which have been recurring in the examination quite a lot specifically valuation of warrants is one such topic which has recurred in the examination so we'll be doing a practical question of uh, valuation of warrants also all right so valuation of shares again four approaches are there in case of valuation of shares which are uh, prevalent from a valuation standpoint and these four uh, approaches are required to value equity shares of any company first is the income based approach uh, which which we have already discussed in our earlier session guys um whereby we have seen that discounting the cash flows which arise from a particular asset results into value of that particular asset so if you want to value shares then you know dividends which are accruing from those shares if we uh, calculate the present value of those dividends and we'll be um computing the value of that particular share so discounting cash flow is the a first method of computing the value of the share second is the balance sheet approach or the asset based approach it is simply the nav approach we compute the nav of the uh, uh, company net assets value of the company the total assets minus liabilities is the nav and nav per share is the um, uh, value of the share of that particular company then the hybrid approach where we whereby we combine these two approaches and take a fair value Uh, we add these two approaches and divided by two, we take an average of both the approaches. That is hybrid approach. And last is the relative valuation approach, um, where we tend to find out a common factor, a multiple like a PE, okay, uh, uh, price to equity ratio. And according to that ratio, comparing it with the market PE ratio, we uh, tend to find the value of our share. These are the four approaches which are there in our syllabus. In this particular marathon session, I'm going to focus specifically on the income-based approach. okay now as you are already aware that income based approach means that whatever income we are deriving from a particular share we are going to capitalize it we are going to find the present value of that particular income now please tell me in case of a share what is the income that is accrued from a share it is of course dividend so the formula which we have studied in our basics chapter that you know cash flow divided by 1 plus r raised to the power n we just modulate that formula to replace dividends in place of cash flow cash flow will exit dividends will come in so dividends divided by 1 plus r raised to the power n is the formula for price of share very fair guys the cash flow which is expected from a share is dividends so the formula is um, modulated or um, amended according to that particular approach so instead of cash flows we have uh, written dividends over there so dividends divided by 1 plus r whole raised to the power n dividends divided by 1 plus r whole raised to the power n this is the formula for price of a share where r is the cost of equity uh, or the rate of return which is given in the question d is the future dividends expected to be distributed by that company and in case there are constant dividends which are receivable in perpetuity uh, again uh, we have we have seen this in our earlier session uh, if dividends are constant and they are received in infinite years so the formula will be used as dividend divided by r it's the capitalization formula and since there is no time period which is specified uh, through which the dividend will be received so uh, we have taken it as the uh, capitalization figure so dividend divided by r rate of return that is a formula if the dividends are received in perpetuity which means for a longer period of time then method 2 is the constant dividend growth model in this we will add another element of growth like we had added in our basic chapter also the formula will change a little bit which is the formula will now be d into 1 plus growth divided by r minus growth guys same formula which we have used in cash flow we'll modulate it a little bit we'll um, add the growth in the numerator and reduce it from the denominator that is the formula um, a change which we are expecting <clears throat> and yes in the class we have discussed why do we reduce the growth from the denominator let me give you a hint you know um, when you um, inflate when you expand your business then you attain the uh, economies of large scale operations and that is where your cost reduces per unit cost reduces and therefore growth will always reduce your cost the rate of return is nothing but the cost of capital um, growth will always reduce the cost that is why in the denominator we reduce the cost now value per share earnings capacity capitalization method in this method guys we will capitalize the future maintainable profits we'll compute the future maintainable profits whatever profits we are able to maintain for future we'll capitalize them using the capitalization factor which is nothing but the ke or r we'll capitalize the uh, future maintainable profits whatever is the profit that we are going to uh, uh, you know achieve in future we're going to capitalize it using the capitalization rate ke or r that is the capitalization method it's a simple method simple formula 
नेक्स्ट वन इज द यील्ड मेथड एंड अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट मेथड इन यील्ड मेथड यू नो इट इज वेरी सिमिलर टू द कैपिटलाइजेशन मेथड द ओनली डिफरेंस बींग इन यील्ड मेथड वी टेक अर्निंग्स यील्ड और डिविडेंड यील्ड टू कैलकुलेट आर आंसर द फॉर्मला इज एक्सपेक्टेड रेट ऑफ अर्निंग्स डिवाइड बाय नॉर्मल रेट ऑफ अर्निंग्स मल्टीप्लाई बाय पेड ऑफ वैल्यू ऑफ इक्विटी शेयर नाउ पॉइंट टू बी नोटेड ओवर हेयर वेन वी आर मल्टीप्लाइंग द एक्सपेक्टेड रेट ऑफ अर्निंग विद पेड ऑफ वैल्यू ऑफ द शेयर एंड डिवाइडेड इट होल बाय द मार्केट रेट ऑफ अर्निंग we are actually what are we doing we are actually computing the profit that we are uh, uh, you know earning this is the profit that we are earning and we are capitalizing it, it using the market rate of return so this is a different form of the capitalization method itself okay you can remember it this way yield method is nothing new it is a different form of the capitalization method only in the numerator we are computing the profit paid up value of the shares um the multiply by the rate of return that the company is giving so expected rate of return Divide by normal rate of return multiply by paid up value of equity share. This is the formula for earnings yield while calculating the value per share. Similar formula can be used for dividend yield as well, which will replace the uh, uh, returns, the expected returns, um, uh, with expected dividends. So expected dividends will be coming in the numerator. Expected rate of dividend divided by normal rate of dividend multiply by the paid up value of share. That is the formula which we use for dividend yield. So earnings yield and dividend yield would have these two formulas. and they are very very important okay now last is the balance sheet approach balance sheet approach nothing but the nav approach okay net asset value you compute by uh, reducing liabilities outside liabilities from assets and dividing it by total number of outstanding share net asset value will be computed and using this net asset value will compute the value of the entire company now the question is how to choose which method to be applied so there are different circumstances according to which you can apply different methods okay these are important circumstances let's uh, see those circumstances okay first when <clears throat> first one is when controlling interest is purchased which means that you are becoming the holding company of the other company which means your majority stake will be in your hand which is 51% 50% and above then you are at attaining controlling interest when you are attaining controlling interest over the entire entity which means more than 50% of stock is being uh, uh, purchased by you then fair value method may be preferred the preferred method is fair value fair value is an average of uh, earnings capitalization method and dividend yield method okay divide by 2 so whenever you are um uh, you know purchasing controlling interest then of course you are interested in the income earned by the company as well as the asset backing of the company so earnings capitalization plus nav sorry earnings capitalization pl capitalization plus nav is the method that we are going to use divided by 2 okay when you are purchasing a small lot okay when you are purchasing a small lot which means you are not purchasing 50% or more you are purchasing a lesser amount then you are more interested in dividend okay so dividend yield method or the dividend discount model will be perfect for you if you are Uh, purchasing a strong uh, majority stake or a bigger lot then fair valuation will be preferred for you if you are purchasing a small lot then dividend discount model will be perfect for you so guys sometimes question will tell you that you know um, uh, you want to purchase a small lot or a bigger lot according to what lot do you want to purchase lot means how many number of shares do you want to purchase according to the lot that you want to purchase according to the number of shares that you want to purchase your method of computation of value will change next is share warrants again a very very important um uh, you know topic of our syllabus share warrants is an option now please remember that what do you mean by warrant warrant means that you are getting an option to purchase additional shares of that particular company at a reduced price so if you are an existing shareholder then sometimes company will offer you um a right an option to purchase additional shares of the company at a very reduced price at a beneficial price that is known as share warrant so share warrant is an option issued by a company which provides the holder Holder means a shareholder to buy a fixed number of companies' ordinary shares at a fixed price during a specified period of time. Warrants are usually issued in conjunction with the bond or preferred stock. A warrant can either be detachable or non-detachable. Can be shareholders, venture holders also are eligible for warrants. Okay. Now, detachable warrant can be sold separately from the bond or preferred stock to which it was originally attached. A non-detachable warrant cannot be sold separately from the bond or preferred stock. Warrant holders are not entitled to vote or receive dividends, but once they exercise their right by ordinary share, they become company's ordinary shareholders with all such rights. 
Okay. So what do you mean by warrant? Warrant means it's a it's a right which is provided to you as a, an existing shareholder that at a future point in time you can uh, purchase additional amount of shares at a concessional price. It's a benefit which is extended to you. Okay. Now, how do you value a a warrant? Okay. What? Do, how do you calculate the fair price of the warrant? So guys, warrant is a separate thing and share is a separate thing. Okay. If you are, if I want to compute the price of the warrant, then what I'll do is I'll see the current market price of the share and reduce it with the price of warrant. Price of exercise of warrant. So I'll give you an example. Okay, say company's current market price of share is fifty, but if you are a warrant holder, then you can exercise the warrant at rupees forty only. So uh, if you give rupees forty, you'll get a share of the company which otherwise is is being sold for rupees fifty. So what is the price of the warrant? Price of warrant is rupees ten. Because warrant is a separate warrant is a right, right, which helps you to acquire a share. What is the price of warrant? Price of warrant is ten. So then, what is price? What is forty? Forty is the exercise price of warrant. Um, if you want to exercise the price of exercise the warrant, then you'll have to pay forty rupees to the company to get a share. Okay, fifty is the current market price of the share. So you are getting a benefit of rupees ten. So what is the price of the warrant? Price of warrant is rupees ten. That is how price of warrant is calculated. Current market price of share minus exercise price of warrant multiplied by the exchange ratio. Then what is premium on warrant? Premium on warrant means the price of the warrant. What is the price of the warrant minus the fair price of warrant? Uh, uh, so whatever is the actual price of the warrant minus whatever price the market is um, dealing in the warrant as of now. That is the uh, premium on warrant. Now let us see one question. Okay, uh, once we see question now, we'll be able to uh, understand it well. Sun Limited has announced issue of warrant on one is to one basis for its equity shareholders. The warrant are convertible at an exercise price of rupees twelve. So the warrant, if you want to convert the warrant into share, you have to pay rupees twelve. Okay, warrants are detachable and trading at rupees seven. So individual price of the warrant, the fair price of the warrant in the market is rupees seven. What is the minimum price of the warrant? What is the price of the warrant? That is what you need to ascertain. Secondly, the warrant premium. What is the warrant premium? If the current price of the stock is rupees sixteen, so the current price of stock is rupees sixteen. So tell me what is the price of the warrant? Current price of stock is sixteen, and we will get this uh, stock at rupees twelve. Twelve. So what is the price of warrant? Rupees four. Rupees four is the price of warrant. Perfect. Now this warrant is actually being sold at seven in market, which means it is overpriced. It is being sold at a premium. So what is the premium on warrant? Premium on warrant is rupees three. So rupees four is the price of warrant. Rupees three is the premium on warrant. That is the distinction. Rupees four and rupees three, respectively, are the price and the premium on. That is how warrant is priced. That is how warrant premium is disclosed. Okay, sir, got it. So yes, guys, this was the chapter of uh, valuation of shares. Yes. You may think that so it's such a small chapter, but it's not a small chapter. Once you do all the practical questions of this chapter, then you'll realize that there are integrities, there are nitty gritties which are there in this chapter, which really um, uh, compel you to practice the practical questions again and again. Of course, needless to say, please practice the practical questions again and again because you really require a lot of practice to do this particular chapter. So we'll be meeting now in our next chapter. So let's start the next chapter. The next topic which we are going to touch upon is valuation of brands and guys in this particular topic I'm going to focus on the kind of questions which come in the examination regularly rather than dwelling into all kind of questions I'll be focusing on one type of questions which have recurred in the examination quite frequently first of all to start with what do you mean by brand guys brand means it is an identity of the entire organization it is represented by the logo by um the kind of words which they use by the letter by the uh, distinguishing sign which helps us identify that particular company so if you look at this m okay look at this m this clearly will indicate mcdonalds to all of us because we are so used to seeing this m related to mcdonalds okay it's very very clear okay then you see this logo it is very very clear that it's an lg logo and in this logo um uh, we are able to identify um uh, you know lg with this logo without even looking at the name If you see this uncle, this uncle with white beard and white hair, uh, they signif he signifies KFC. Undoubtedly, we are very very clear about this particular fact. So there are certain certain logos, certain um, images which uh, uh, quickly make us recall a particular product, a particular brand, and that is the value of the brand which is um, there. Okay. Now, 
uh, wherever there's value, there's a premium which is paid for it. Yes, that is the reason why Apple products are so expensive. That is the reason why um, uh, maybe LG products are very expensive. The reason is very simple that they're not only charging for the product, but they're also charging for their brand value. Now, I give a very simple example to my students to explain this concept. You know, a shirt, a shirt which you buy for say 2000 rupees, um, which belongs to say Burberry or um, uh, Alan Soli or any other brand, that shirt can be available in market for say uh, 1000 rupees also, but without the brand, without the brand name. But you will prefer to buy it with the brand name because you have got your trust on the brand name. You trust that brand name blindly. And that is the reason why you will prefer buying the shirt along with the brand name rather than without the brand name. And that is the beauty of brand name. That is the significance of brand name. And that is why brand is so, so relevant in most of the businesses. Most of the um, organization brand is one of the most important um, sources of income rather um, uh, you know, uh, for any company because brand signifies a big trust and a customer fan following. Okay. Now, this one type of question which comes in the examination regularly relating to brand, which is uh, the income based approach. And let us do that particular question. Let us see how that particular question is uh, done in the examination. Okay. This is the question which I'll be, uh, you know, solving over here. If you do this kind of a question, then you are, uh, you know, sure that you're, you're covered for the examination. Okay. The following financial data pertaining to Techno Limited and IT company are made available to you. EBIT is given, earning before interest and tax. Non-brand income is given, which means that if the products which are sold with brand, uh, it will fetch you 696. Then the, that product which is sold without brand, same product will be uh, fetching you 53.43. It is because of the brand that you are able to command a higher price. Okay. So non-brand income, inflation rate, remuneration of capital, average capital employed, corporate tax rate, capitalization factor. These are the information which are given to you. You need to compute the brand value of techno limit to compute the brand value. Again, format I'm not um, uh, very uh, focused over here. Okay. Format you have to make properly. I'm just upon the solution. Let us see how will we solve this kind of a question. 2010, 2009. 2008. How do you solve this kind of question? First of all, you need to calculate the brand income, brand related income. 696.03, then 325.65, 155.86. I'll subtract the non branded income from this income, non branded income. It's 53.43. 35.23 and 3.46. If I subtract the EBIT, uh, the non-brand income from EBIT, I will get the brand related income. So this is the brand related income. This is the brand related income, which is A minus B. This is the income which is related to this particular brand. Okay. 696. 0.03 minus 53.43 okay then we have 325.65 minus 35.23 290.42 then we have 155.86 minus 3.46 152.4. This brand related income, we are going to introduce the inflation factor in this brand related income, inflation factor. Okay. So this is the inflation. Current year's inflation is already incorporated, so it's one. Okay, this is last year's inflation and this is last last year's inflation. Inflation means the earnings which were um, accruing to us 290.42 one year back, if it were to earn today what will be its present value because it's a historical number 290 is a historical number today's number will be 1.087 after the inflation rate okay so this is the brand related income brand income after inflation 
brand income after inflation first part becomes 642.6 then it's 290 multiplied by 1.087 comes 315.23 then it's 152.4 multiplied by 1.181 179. So let's take it as 180 let's take it as 180 okay <coughs> this is 180 this is the brand related income now I'm going to give weights to this brand related income okay because i don't take average of all three so i'm going to take a weighted average guys whenever there is a uh, increasing or decreasing trend in the numbers you can take the weighted average always take the weighted average in that case Two ninety. 0.42 multiply 1.087 315.69 315.69 okay this becomes 642.6 315.69 multiply by 2 this becomes 631.38 and 180 multiply by 3 this becomes 540 so what will be the weighted average i'll compute the weighted average all of these numbers 540 plus 631.38 plus 642.6 divide by multiple divide by 6 this becomes 302.33 this is the weighted average brand income now there's info information related to remuneration of capital uh, which is given so I'll reduce the remuneration of capital which is 5% of triple one two okay 5% of triple one two fifty five point six this becomes two forty six point seven three now what are we going to do is we are going to reduce the tax taxes at the rate of thirty five percent okay and we are going to compute the income after tax and then we are going to capitalize it using this particular capitalization factor which is 16 percent whatever is the income after tax i'm going to divide it by the capitalization factor which is 16 percent 16 percent is the capitalization factor. so guys this is the most popular kind of question which comes in the examination related to brand quite simple quite straightforward the steps are very very clear and to follow the same steps uh, beat any kind of question which comes in the examination the only addition that examiners can do in your paper is the guy is that it won't give you the inflation factors. It will give you the inflation percentages. Okay. 2010, there'll be no inflation percentage. 2010, there'll be inflation percentage, say, of 15%. 2009, uh, 9%. 2008, no inflation percentage will be given. Okay. So, this is how inflation percentage will be given. And using the inflation percentage, you need to compute the inflation factors. How will you do it? For 2008, you will multiply 15% and 9%. For 2009, you will only take 15%. For 2010, you will always take 1. And I have dealt with this um, uh, particular uh, concept in detail with you earlier also. Um, so yes, inflation factor might not be given in the examination. You need to compute it using the inflation rates. A very, very uh, good evolution that examiner can do in your, um, your paper. So yes, guys, this is the of question that will come in the examination i've not focused on theory much i've not focused on other type of questions um much because this is the most expected question which can come in the examination from this particular chapter valuation of brands now let's move on to our next chapter and the next topic which we are going to take up for this marathon lecture is economic efficiency of a firm this is a chapter which is related to um uh, spm uh, and the chapter is related to how can we uh, use the economic terms the economic uh, ways of calculating the maximum profit or the minimum cost that we are going to incur for our production process okay this um, uh, this particular concept is very very popular in case where business uh, is 
um uh, you know using economic ways of ascertaining the cost and the profits and how to uh, you know max maximize the profits and how to reduce the cost to the minimal how to produce an economic quantity of a particular good uh, to ascertain what quantity is to be produced to uh, attain the maximum profit or reduce the cost all these things can be easily seen in this particular chapter so this chapter deals with the economic efficiency of the firm okay so there are certain common terms which we should be aware about before we start dwelling into this particular chapter total revenue it is quantity sold multiplied by price per unit okay these are common terms which you have already studied in your 11th or 12th standard there is nothing um, uh, nothing uh, uh, very different or nothing very difficult okay then we have average revenue average revenue is uh, total revenue divided by quantity marginal revenue which is change in revenue divided by change in quantity if you remember we used to uh, use this sign change in revenue triangle represents change in revenue so one unit change in revenue divided by one unit change in quantity that is the marginal revenue okay then comes the total cost total cost is fixed cost and variable cost if we add both these costs together then we'll get the total cost average cost is total cost divided by quantity that is the average cost marginal cost is change in cost divided by change in quantity so triangle cost divided by triangle quantity that is the marginal cost total profit is total revenue minus total cost okay an average profit is there total profit divided by quantity is average profit marginal profit is change in profit divided divide by change in quantity these are the basic terminology which we will use in this particular chapter quite often okay now a very basic question a very preliminary question uh, this kind of question will not come in the examination i'm telling you but this we need to do to uh, gauge our understanding on how to compute the basic elements of this particular um, chapter Uh, the cost of the firm is given by the function 4x cube plus 9x square plus 11x plus 27. So we are computing the <coughs> cost. This is the cost function <coughs> which is there. Okay, find you have to find the average cost. This is the total cost. Okay, you have to find the average cost, the marginal cost, the average variable cost, the average fixed cost. X being the output. So X is the output. Uh, the the concept is that uh, you know depending upon what number of outputs do you want to produce your cost will vary okay so if we uh, transfuse 3 4 whatever number of output we need to produce um uh, in the x then we'll get the cost that is the idea okay now please note that 27 represents the fixed cost because there is no x it is not dependent on number of units produced it will in be incurred even if zero number of uh, units are produced so 27 is the fixed cost what is the variable cost 4x cube plus 9x square plus 11x this is the variable cost so total cost can be bifurcated into variable cost and fixed cost depending upon which element has got x in it and which element has not got x in it elements which are free of x they are fixed cost elements which are dependent on x they are variable cost now we need to compute all these things okay Let me take a blank uh, uh, chart. What is the cost function? Cost function is 4x cube, 9x square, 11, 27. 4, 9, 11, 27. 4, 9, 11, 27. This is the total cost. Okay. 4, 9, 11, 27. This is the total cost. First of all, we need to compute the average cost. Okay. Now, average cost is equal to cost divided by x. So we'll divide every part by x. This will result into four x square plus nine x plus eleven plus twenty-seven. So this is the average cost function. this is the average cost function we'll divide the total cost by number of units which is x simple very simple next is the marginal cost okay now i'll tell you what is marginal cost so marginal cost is computed by differentiating the total cost with respect to x when we differentiate the total cost with respect to x we'll compute the marginal cost the total cost is 4x cube plus 9x square Let's say 11x plus 27. We'll differentiate this with respect to x. Now, this differentiation is an important process which you need to learn and understand if you want to solve these questions well, because this concept will definitely come in the examination. This is an important concept. You need to learn this uh, concept well, guys. <coughs> okay. 
okay so how to differentiate any function that's what we are going to learn now now 3 so 4x cube is to be differentiated what is uh, what are we doing we'll multiply 3 we'll bring down 3 and multiply it by 4 3 multiplied by 4 and x raised to the power 3 minus 1 whatever is the power that is to be reduced by 1 now please don't ask me the logics behind this derivation sir uh, why is the derivation done and why only minus is required to be done please don't don't ask me such questions these are mathematical derivations um, which have been done okay so the differentiation of 4x cube is 12x square 12x square is the differentiation of 4x cube okay next 9x square how to differentiate 9x square with respect to x so you multiply the numerator you multiply the power with the uh, digit so 2 multiplied by 9x now what you do is uh, uh, whatever is in the <coughs> power you reduce it by 1 <coughs> reduce it by 1 okay next one is 11x okay now x if it is x x means x raised to the power 1 x mean x raised to the power 1 so 1 is uh, required to be multiplied with 11 and x raised to the power 1 minus 1 you'll reduce the power by 1 that is the constant thing which we are doing okay last is 27 so 27 doesn't have a x with it which means that there is a x in it with zero power there is an x with it with zero power x raised to the power zero is one okay what are we going to do we are going to multiply the zero with this whole digit which means this digit becomes zero so multiplication of any number which is without x is always zero uh, multiplication of any number which is without x is zero okay now we're going to simplify it 12 x square plus 18 x plus 11 why 11 11 because x raised to the power 1 minus 1 is x raised to the power 0 x raised to the power 0 is 1 okay so this is the resultant figure so marginal cost function is this okay so this is the marginal cost function This is the marginal cost function. Okay. <clears throat> now, what is the next ask? Average variable cost is required to be computed. So, first we'll compute the variable cost. So, what is the variable cost? First, we need to compute the variable cost. Then, we'll compute the average variable cost. Variable cost will be 4x cube plus 9x square plus 11x. We will exclude the fixed cost. 27 will exclude. Variable cost is 4x cube plus 9x square plus 11x. Okay, this is the variable cost. So, what will be the average variable cost? Average variable cost will be total variable cost divided by x. So, this will, will be 4x cube which gives me 4x square plus 9x plus 11. This is the average variable cost this is the function of average variable cost this is the function of average variable cost okay average variable cost 4x square plus 9x plus 11x average variable cost then average fixed cost what is average fixed cost first of all you need to tell me what is the fixed cost fixed cost was 27 so what will be the average fixed cost i'm going to divide it by x that will be the average fixed cost okay total fixed cost divided by x is the average fixed cost so average fixed cost is what we have average fixed cost okay so this is the average fixed cost so this is how each of the cost is required to be computed same goes with the uh, revenue if uh, total revenue is given to you then you will be able to compute the marginal revenue the average revenue all kind of revenues you'll be able to compute using the same methodology uh, where, wherever you need to find the average you'll divide it by x wherever you need to find the marginal you'll differentiate it with respect to x be it revenue be it cost same format or same um, uh, you know um, uh, computation will be applied in all such questions so this was a very basic question that introduced you to these figures now we come on to the main thing of this particular chapter which is maximization and minimization of functions now if someone asks me that i need to minimize or maximize the function which is given over here 
so this is a cost function guys this is a cost function this is the average variable cost if i were to ask you that please compute uh, at what quantity of x will this average variable cost be minimum because i want to minimize the variable cost okay i don't want to produce more i don't want to produce less i exactly want to produce the quantity that will minimize my average variable cost that is the ask what will that x be this is known as maximization or minimization of function wherever there will be revenue or profit you will be asked to maximize and wherever there will be cost you will be asked to minimize now we are going to learn how to minimize or maximize a particular variable so guys these are the five steps which we typically follow to minimize or maximize a particular variable these are the five steps which we follow okay if you want to minimize or maximize a particular function then this is a five step process which is enumerated over here okay first step one differentiate the function with respect to the quantity you need to find the first derivative of this particular function equate the differentiated function with zero compute the number of units now we'll equate the differentiated function with zero and compute the number of units um uh, whatever will be there differentiate the first derivative again with respect to quantity which means find the double derivative or this is known as the second derivative find the second derivative okay third fourth step is if the second derivative is positive number then the number of units computed at step 2 will yield minimize cost and if it is a uh, if it is a if second derivative is a negative number then the number of units computed at step 2 will yield the maximum revenue so in this particular step we are going to first ascertain whether the second derivative is a positive number or a negative number if the second derivative is a positive number then we'll say that the function will yield us the minimum cost if the second derivative is a negative number then we'll say that the second uh, derivative the function will yield us the maximum result okay step 5 is in case uh, second derivative is both negative and positive then the function is increasing decreasing respectively this we'll see by an example okay let's do an example and exactly see what is minimization and maximization meant to be okay optimize y is equal to 2x cube plus minus 3x square plus 126x plus 59 we need to optimize which means we need to maximize or minimize this particular equation so first let's write the equation and then see what steps do we need to um perform to maximize or minimize this particular function 2x cube minus 3x square Two x cube minus minus thirty x square plus one twenty six x plus fifty nine minus three thirty x square plus one twenty six plus fifty nine plus one twenty six x plus fifty nine. Minus thirty x square. Okay, so this is the function. So step one is, you need to find the derivative of this entire equation. And guys, now I'm uh, uh, directly taking the derivative. I'm not going to write the formula again. Twenty six. This is the first derivative of this particular equation. This is the first derivative. Okay, six uh, x square minus. 60x plus 126 is the first derivative of this equation. Okay, now step number two, you will equate the first derivative with zero. This is step number two. It's 126. Now this is a quadratic equation, guys. There are two kind of um, uh, you know uh, things which can happen at this stage. A, you will get a answer just by um, uh, transposing the numbers from here to there, and you'll get the direct answer. But this equation is a quadratic equation, which means that X square x and no x figures are there. This will not be as straightforward to compute <clears throat> the solution. Okay, so what I'll do is I will first of all divide the entire equation by six. This will become x square minus ten x plus twenty one seven, and I'll send the six in multiplication with zero, which will turn make it as zero. So I have taken common as six. Six has been taken as common, and I've transferred uh, uh, six to zero, so it becomes zero. Okay, I've taken six as common. Now see carefully what I'm doing. I need two digits 
मल्टीप्लीकेशन ऑफ विच शुड बी ट्वेंटी वन प्लस एंड माइनस ऑफ विच शुड बी टेन आई नीड टू डिजिट्स टू न्यूमेरिकल डिजिट्स मल्टीप्लीकेशन ऑफ विच शुड बी ट्वेंटी वन प्लस एंड माइनस शुड बी टेन टू डिजिट्स विल बी सेवन एंड ओके सो एक्स स्क्वायर माइनस सेवन एक्स माइनस थ्री एक्स प्लस ट्वेंटी वन सेवन थ्री जो ट्वेंटी वन ओके सो आई विल स्प्लिट टेन इंटू टू पार्ट माइनस सेवन माइनस थ्री माइनस सेवन एक्स माइनस थ्री एक्स टोटल इज माइनस टेन एक्स ओके नाउ आई टेक एक्स एज कॉमन सो एक्स माइनस सेवन बिकम्स फैक्टर इन साइड एंड आई टेक माइनस थ्री एज कॉमन एक्स माइनस सेवन बिकम्स द फैक्टर ओके सो द फैक्टर इज एक्स माइनस थ्री मल्टीप्लाइड बाय एक्स माइनस सेवन सो एक्स हैज टू आंसर सेवन एंड थ्री X has two answers, seven and three. Seven and three are the two answers. If we transpose this entire equation, um, if we equate it with zero, X has two answers. Two answers are seven and three. The first derivative has been subject to equated with zero, and two answers are derived from it. Okay, sir, got it. Now the third step is to derive a second derivative of this equation. d two y divided by d x square. This is the second derivative of this same equation. Okay. The second derivative will be twelve x six into two twelve twelve x minus sixty. This is the second derivative. This is the second derivative. Okay. Now what are we going to do is what we are going to. transpose these two numbers which we have got in the second derivative okay so first of all we'll put x is equal to 7 second we'll put x is equal to 3 so if we put x is equal to 7 then this is our answer if we put x is equal to 3 then this is our answer let's compute it 12 multiply 12 multiplied by 7, 84 minus 60 is 24. This is a positive number. 36 minus 60 is 24, which is a negative number. So this is a positive number. This is a negative number. When we transposed the answers which we have uh, derived over here, when we transpose it in the double derivative equation, then we get this result. Okay. Now the conclusion is. What is the conclusion? Conclusion is. That when you put x is equal to seven, when you put x is equal to seven, then you will get the minimum result. And when you put x is equal to three, then you are going to get the maximum result. This is the conclusion which we are drawing from this uh, particular equation. Okay, when you are going to put Seven in the equation, you will get the minimum number, and when you are going to put three in the equation, you will get the maximum number. This is the conclusion that I am drawing. Now I have to prove this conclusion to you. Okay, you don't have to prove this before the examiner because examiner also already knows this. But uh, just to prove you, I will put these two numbers in the equation. What is my original equation? What is my original equation? Okay, my original equation is. 2x cube minus 30x square plus 126x plus 59. Okay. What I'll do is I'll put three in in place of x, which will yield me the maximum result. Okay. Two into three cube minus 30. Plus 59. Let us compute the answer. So this is the number which we derive if we have the quantity as three units. If the quantity is three units, then the figure which is derived is this. 
I can confidently say that this is the maximum that can be derived from this particular number. Now to prove this, you know, to prove this, what I'll do is instead of three, I'll put two. Okay. Instead of three, I will put two. One twenty six into two plus fifty nine. Okay, let us recompute the number when instead of three I'll put two. So the answer comes out to be sixteen. One twenty plus two fifty two plus fifty nine. This is two hundred and seven. It is lower than the number which was derived when you put three. Okay. Now what I'll do is I'll put the number as four. Okay, because three was the middle number. I'll use four and two and see what is the result. Okay. Let's see what is the result when I put it as four. So when I put four instead of three, then let's see what is the outcome. Okay. One twenty eight minus four eighty plus five zero four plus fifty nine plus fifty nine plus one twenty eight minus four eighty. This is two hundred eleven. So when I put x is equal to four, it gives me a figure of two one one. When I put x is equal to three, it gives me a two wins gives me a figure of two zero seven. When I put x is equal to three, it will give me a figure of two two one. It proves that. Hence proved that three is the number whereby my equation will yield the maximum result. If I take a number above three, it will going to give me a lower result. If I take a number below three, it will it is going to give me a Lower result. This is the proof which I want to prove in front of you. This is not to be done in the examination. This is not to be done in the examination. Your answer will finish at this stage itself. Your answer finishes at this stage itself. Your answer finishes at this stage. Okay. So very very important to understand what is the meaning of maximum and minimum. Now do it yourself, guys. Do it yourself. Put x is equal to seven. Compute the number. Put x is equal to eight. Compute the number. Put x is equal to six. Compute the number. You will find that x is equal to seven when you put x is equal to seven. That will yield the minimum result. Try it yourself and see it for yourself that this will be true in all the cases. In all the cases. So this is how an equation is optimized. Optimized means either it is minimized or maximized. So minimum and maximum shall be done in this particular manner. This is how minimum and maximum is required to be derived by you. And this practical question is definitely going to come in the examination. Either a small question or a large question. Uh, consistently it has been appearing in the examination and in future examination also you can expect this question in the paper so yes this was your chapter of economic efficiency and i mean i mean this is not the entire chapter but i have taken the most important part of it so that it is relevant for you in the examination when you are performing the calculation in the examination you are able to uh, sustain the calculation that is the um, idea which i have um, done this chapter with okay so this was your chapter on economic efficiency of the firm as you are aware from bvm theoretical portion will come in negligible paramount i mean it will come very very less maximum 2 marks 4 marks that's it but from spm theory portion comes for at least 20 to 25 marks yes for about 20 marks theory portion will come theory chapters are relevant uh, for at least 20 marks theory portion will come in your strategic performance management spm group 4 cma final So today in this marathon lecture we are going to complete the entire syllabus of theoretical uh, chapters of SPM, which will include primarily three study notes: study note number one, study note number two, and study note number four. Guys, in case of study note number three, which is economic efficiency, you need not study the theoretical portion. Why? Because uh, from that particular chapter, theoretical portion will come for say one mark or two mark, and to study the entire theory portion. For that one mark or two mark might not be worth it. So from chapter number three, theoretical portion you may avoid. Theory portion is important for 
थ्री चैप्टर्स वॉट आर दो थ्री चैप्टर्स नंबर वन नंबर टू एंड नंबर फोर रिस्क मैनेजमेंट परफॉर्मेंस मैनेजमेंट एंड परफॉर्मेंस ए वैल्युएशन दीज आर थ्री चैप्टर्स फॉर विच थर्टिकल पोर्शन आई एम गोइंग टू कवर इन टूडेज मैराथन एंड वेरी 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 इंपॉर्टेंट ट्रस्ट मी दीज चैप्टर्स विल यू नो विल बी देयर इन योर एग्जामिनेशन in a very very large extent as far as theoretical uh, uh, concepts are concerned as as far as theory is concerned they will definitely come in your examination so be prepared for the theoretical portion of these three chapters and today's video we are going to uh, touch base with the theoretical portion of these three chapters all right good morning good morning everyone i hope you all of you all admit cards are in your hands and you are pretty set to rock the examination center by your knowledge by your presence by your examination skills okay so yes let's start spm theoretical portion and the chapter first chapter that we are going to start today is conceptual framework of performance management now first of all you need to understand what do you mean by performance management you need to understand what is this 50 marks portion spm um uh, therefore strategic performance management what is it therefore what is the use of this particular chapter this particular subject half subject 50 mark subject which is there in your syllabus uh, what is the use of this particular portion strategic performance management guys the ultimate goal of each and every person in life is to achieve the desired objectives there are certain objectives which you are chasing there are certain objectives which i am chasing there are certain objectives which any big conglomerate is ch chasing there is any uh, there there is um, a particular uh, a goal which any big organization is chasing so everyone is chasing their goals in their lives life of a company life of an individual life of a partnership firm life of an organization everyone is chasing their individual dreams while everyone is chasing their own individual dreams their own individual goals guys it is very very important that we need to assess after a point in time what has been our performance have we been able to achieve those milestones which we have set for ourselves have we been able to uh, give the desired performance which we wanted for ourselves is our performance up to the mark or not is our performance up to the mark are we are we um, you know uh, attaining the level of expertise the level of um, performance the level of achievement that we always wanted to achieve are we doing that or not and this precisely is performance management we need to assess our performance we need to assess whether we are able to achieve the desired results or not and there are various various modes various ways of um, assessing whether we have um, uh, achieved the desired uh, um, uh, you know targets our desired um, performance standards or not there are various ways of achieve, uh, of measuring them and in this particular subject which is strategic performance management we primarily aim at looking at those techniques looking at those ways in which we actually measure our performance what is the way in which we are measuring our performance that is the whole focus of this particular subject called strategic performance management now performance can be for a company for an organization for for a partnership firm performance can also be for an individual for a for a partner of an uh, of a firm for a director for an employee so it is a multi fold game it's not a, um, a one area which we are going to focus on we are going to focus on multiple areas like performance of employees performance of an organization performance of a management of a company performance of uh, you know financial um, uh, targets and goals of a particular company so we are going to see the performance management in its entirety we are not only going to focus on say profits or um, uh, growth or market standing we are also going to focus on customer satisfaction whether customer is satisfied or not from our business from our product from quality of our product and price of our product whether um, uh, 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 a customer is satisfied or not so all these things are covered in performance management and therefore we are going to study performance management in this particular subject so the first chapter that we are going to start today is conceptual framework of performance management how would performance be managed how would performance be assessed and how can we improve the performance this is the entire focus of the first chapter conceptual framework of performance management so let's start conceptual framework of performance management so first of all we need to understand what do you mean by performance management so performance management is a continuous process of identifying measuring and developing 
performance in the organization by linking each individual's performance to the organization overall mission or goal so if you talk about an organization if you talk about a company if you talk about performance of a um, you know big conglomerate then guys that performance is to be identified first what are the performance standards what are we trying to achieve then we are going to measure whether we have been able to achieve those targets or not and then we are going to develop those management standards though those performance standards to the next level uh, we, we are going to develop the performance levels and we are going to improve the performance levels if we have attained the earlier performance levels so these are three aspects of performance management number one identifying measuring and developing the performance we need to identify the performance we need to measure uh, our performance and we need to develop or increase our performance or grow our performance this is known as performance management and definitely it is a continuous process it is, it is not an year end process that you know oh at the year end we will analyze whether our debt equity ratio was appropriate or not at the year end we will analyze whether our gross profit ratio was appropriate or not no 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 it is not done at the year end it is done around the year so month on month basis i will analyze my performance on a month on month basis i will analyze my gross profit net profit and um, all the profitability ratios on a month on month basis i will analyze this so performance management is a continuous process of identifying measuring and developing the performance of an organization this is known as performance management so two aspects of performance management are number one that it is a continuous process it is a process which will go on and on and on it is not a year end process annual process you say that oh sir after the year end we are going to assess our performance no that's incorrect you have to assess your performance on a routine basis on a regular basis say on a weekly basis on a monthly basis so guys even when you are studying can you afford to say oh we will assess our performance when examinations will come no you have to assess your performance on a daily basis how many hours of study have you employed on a daily basis if you are in cma final definitely you need to employ um, uh, larger hours of study so have you employed those larger hours of studies in your daily performance that is how uh, you assess your performance so it is a continuous process it is it is a process which goes on and on and on so performance management is not an year end or a one time process it is not a year end process it is not a one time process it is a continuous or never ending process it's a continuous process which goes on and on and on and it is a never ending process it will never end it will never um, now finish this will go on and on it is a continuous process then it is linked to missions and goals always performance management is linked to some kind of mission we have a mission in mind we have a goal in mind and that goal is very much um, the driving factor of our performance our performance will be directed towards our goals so performance is linked to missions and goals that is one very important aspect of uh, uh, performance management so performance management will include number one it's a continuous process it will go on and on and on number one number two it is linked to the missions and goals of the organization whatever the organization goals are um, uh, to those goals and missions this are uh, this performance is linked that is how performance management is um, uh, driven that is how management performance is um, uh, there so management performance is definitely come uh, uh, you know characterized by two things that it's continuous number two it is linked to missions and goals of course guys our performance is driven by the mission that we have the goal that we have okay if we have the goal of uh, you know qualifying cma final then obviously our performance will be up to the standard of cma final we cannot say that oh we will study only for four hours a day no four hours a day will not be sufficient for qualifying cma final for qualifying cma foundation it might be okay for qualifying cma final to foundation it might be okay but for qualifying cma final you have to put in at least eight hours of study that is how mission is linked to performance second is differentiation between performance management and performance appraisal now there are two different things guys performance management and performance appraisal so there was a time when performance management was um, uh, uh, you know considered to be performance appraisal was considered to be the hit thing but now a better thing is performance management so performance appraisal is uh, a narrower term okay it is a narrower uh, concept performance management is a broader concept performance management is a broader concept performance appraisal is a narrower concept performance appraisal is a narrower concept performance management is a broader concept so what is the difference between performance management and performance appraisal guys as you can see in the chart by doing performance management you can skyrocket your growth you can fly like a rocket 
you can shoot like a rocket skyrocket your growth if you are following performance management but in case of performance appraisal you will be standing where you were standing yesterday almost at that pace you will be growing you will not be growing at a very fast pace so performance management you will grow at a very fast pace performance appraisal you will be standing where you were standing yesterday you will not grow at such a fast pace so as a rational human being as a rational person what would you choose would you choose performance management or would you choose performance appraisal so many students are saying explain in hindi guys whatever is there on my youtube channel it is always in english i have also i have already told you the channel has both uh, uh, south indian and north indian students therefore the language which i explain is only in english um uh, so apologies for that i cannot speak in hindi because my south indian students are also there in on this particular channel and let me ask you a question even if you are a, a, a student from north india will you write your paper in hindi or english yes you will write your paper in english so definitely guys you should adopt this language i am not asking you to speak but at least whatever i am speaking try to understand it if you do not understand what i am speaking how will you write in the examination in english you are not a hindi medium student and your future is not uh, 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 demarcated by hindi uh, uh, you know your examination will not be in hindi your examination will be in english please understand all the north indian students also please try to understand english i am not asking you to speak in english but at least understand what i am saying because you have to write your answer in english you are not going to write your answer in hindi so please understand all my videos are in both the languages hindi as well as english i have given you option for my videos you have both the options but for my youtube channel whatever uh, videos are there on the youtube channel that is going to be in english only because it is benefiting south indian students as well as north indian students so if you want hindi language lectures you can take hindi language lectures but please understand this fact don't shy away from english the problem is that all the students uh, uh, who are unable to um, you know speak fluently in english they shy away from english don't shy away from english ultimately you have to write your answers in english only in the examination please understand that fact and for future purposes also for your job for your um, uh, uh, future career english is a very very important language to understand and to write and in these lectures i am not even asking you to speak i am only asking you to understand what i am saying and if you are unable to understand what i am saying in english then you are in for a big trouble you are in for a big trouble so my earnest request is please understand english please don't shy away from english नहीं नहीं सर आप हिंदी में ही बात करो तो ही हमें समझ में आता है हमें समझ में नहीं आता हिंदी में अगर तुम्हें हिंदी में समझ में नहीं आता तो एज अ प्रोफेशनल तुम्हें अगर तुम्हें इंग्लिश में समझ में नहीं आता एज अ प्रोफेशनल तुम अपने लिए एक बहुत बड़ा गड्ढा खोद रहे हो अगर तुमको इंग्लिश में जो मैं बोल रहा हूं वो समझ में नहीं आता तो प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड दिस फैक्ट टेक इट एज एन ऑपरचुनिटी टेक इट एज एन ऑपरचुनिटी प्लीज अंडरस्टैंड इंग्लिश just give me one second guys just give me one second so yes so sushil kumar singh yash akshay anand a clear message to all of you clear message please understand english well otherwise you are in trouble in future my logic of speaking in english on my youtube channel is my south indian students south indian students are also there they should also get benefited north indian students anyway knows hindi and english both so they are getting benefited i want to benefit um, all the students at large so please understand my logic of speaking in hindi on my youtube i will think well as in hindi language you can choose one of the language i have both the languages of all my subjects um but for youtube channel english will be the preferred medium of communication all right so as a, a rational individual what will you prefer will you prefer performance management or will you prefer performance appraisal if given a choice what will you prefer will you prefer performance management or will you prefer performance appraisal please answer in the chat box fastest fingers first what will you prefer will you prefer performance management or will you prefer performance appraisal as a individual if i uh, want to give you performance increase okay and i give you a choice either you 
uh, can um, do performance management or you can get your performance appraised what will you choose what will you choose obviously obviously lavanya is right moshmi is right of course performance management mayuri singh performance appraisal mayuri you don't want to grow mayuri patel mayuri patel doesn't want to grow samir kundra is here samir kundra is saying performance appraisal <laughs> samir kundra i know you know the answer but you are just making fun of us that's why you are giving the wrong answer samir kundra knows the answer okay sharan is saying performance management niklesh is saying performance management madhumita is saying performance management great shikha performance management great awesome yes guys obviously each one of us would require performance management we would prefer performance management we would not prefer performance appraisal we would prefer performance management we will not prefer performance appraisal of course we want skyrocketing growth we don't want slow growth we want high growth if you want high growth then you have to definitely definitely focus on performance management you cannot afford to do performance appraisal you have to focus on performance management if you want high growth if you want skyrocketing growth then performance management is the key therefore uh, you know we needs performance management now sir we understood that performance management is better than performance appraisal so please tell us the difference between performance management and performance appraisal very good question so let's see the differentiating factors between performance appraisal and performance management the differentiating factors between performance appraisal and performance management what is the differentiating factor number one performance appraisal is a top down assessment which means what it means that the person who is sitting at the top he has suppose three juniors one two three there is mr a mr a has three juniors b c and d what is done in performance uh, uh, appraisal mr a will review the performance of mr b mr a <coughs> will review the performance of mr c mr a will review the performance of mr d this is the concept of performance appraisal so one person who sitting at the top is appraising the performance of b c and d he is telling b oh look mr b you did not do this these things well you did this these things well you did this this is so mr a is speaking 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 this is uh, performance appraisal but what happens in performance management it's a joint process through a dialogue so in performance management mr a doesn't speak at the first place the first option is always given to the appraisee the first option is always given to mr b mr b is allowed to speak first mr b is asked mr b please tell us what did you do good what did you do bad what do you think should be improved in the organization what did you think that how did you perform mr b is always given the opportunity to speak first that is how it is a joint process it is not a one way communication it is a two way communication where b is allowed to speak a is also allowed to speak however in case of performance appraisal it is a one way communication where the senior talks and the junior listens in case of performance management senior also talks junior also talks in each of their turns they will take their turns to talk that is how performance management is a little more open dialogue performance appraisal is a one way dialogue second annual appraisal meeting so this appraisal happens one in a year annually it happens at the end of the year performance management is a continuous review with one or more formal reviews so performance management is a broader concept here the performance appraisal doesn't happen once in a year it happens on a regular basis which means you know every month the employee and the employer sit together and see what went right and what went wrong so performance management is a continuous review it doesn't happen once in um, uh, the year it doesn't happen once in in a year it happens on a regular basis on a monthly basis or on a weekly basis it happens so it's a continuous process then performance appraisal uses ratings ratings means a b c d a plus b plus c plus or 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 7 this is the performance appraisal concept use of ratings however in performance management ratings are less common the focus is not to rate an employee the focus is not to give uh, uh, you know a, a rank to the employee no the focus is not that the focus is to jointly see what can the employee do more what has the employee did um, you know in past what has the employee did in in perfection and in future what can the employee do more that is the concept of performance management 
So performance management ratings are less common. We don't give ratings in performance management. In performance appraisal, we rate our employees rank one, rank two, rank three. Out of five, you have got three, you have got four. This is how we rate in case of performance appraisal. Then performance appraisal is a monolithic system. Monolithic means it's a one-way dialogue and it's a rigid system, okay? Which means that there's a set pattern which is to be followed. Set pattern is at the beginning of the year, you set your goals that look employee, you have to attain sales worth rupees 20 lakhs during the year. Look employee, you have to complete at least five trainings which are provided by the institute, by the uh, organization. So this is a monolithic system. It is not very flexible. So, you know, uh, whatever happens, it happens as per the format which has been established for performance appraisal. In performance management, it's a flexible process, which means that, you know, um, you know, if, if the manager feels that after each project, he needs to sit with his uh, appraisee or after each assignment, it needs to sit with its employees. He can do so. He can do so. After each project or after each completion of any assignment, the employer can sit with the employee and do the appraisal. There is no hard and fast rule that you have to do uh, the dialogue only at end of the year or only at end of the month. No, it is not hard and fast. Anytime you can sit with your employee that come employee, let us uh, see what went right, what went wrong in this particular project. So it's a very, very flexible process. Pro uh, performance management is quite flexible. Then uh, performance appraisal focuses on quantified objectives. Quantified means numerical objectives, which, which deals with number. Number objective means, look, employee, you have to um, obtain sales worth rupees 20 lakh during the year. That is a quantified objective. That is a numerical objective. So whenever the focus is on numbers, it is related to performance appraisal. Performance appraisal only focuses on numbers. That how many numbers do you want to attain during the year? How many um, uh, sales figure do you want to attain in, in number of year? That is the focus of a performance appraisal. However, performance management focuses on values and behaviors also. So, you know, uh, uh, what has the employee learned during the year? Apart from numbers, has the employee been able to develop integrity or, you know, some skill set like communication skills, like, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, table dining skills, dressing up skills, all these skills, has the employee been able to develop those also apart from the numbers? What behavior change has the uh, employee done in himself? Was the employee very aggressive at an uh, earlier point in time and now he is very much calm? So what are the behavioral changes in the employees and what are the value system changes which are there in the employees? That is also important in performance management apart from the numbers. In appraisal, we focus only on numbers. We focus only on, um, uh, you know, mathematical numbers, the quantified numbers. That's it. That, you know, employee, you have to attain these, these, these goals. However, in performance management, we also focus on values. Behavior of the employees is also important. Then performance appraisal is often linked to uh, pay. So performance appraisal, the ultimate aim of performance appraisal is to determine the bonuses. If your rating is high, your bonus will be high. If your rating is low, your bonus will be low. That is the sole uh, objective of performance appraisal. So ratings lead to, um, uh, uh, lead to, uh, pay, pay increase. So the focus is only on pay under performance appraisal. However, in case of performance management, the focus is less on pay and more on employees development. It is less on pay. We are focused less on pay. See, pay is a very um, uh, secondary thing. If the employee develops necessary skills, if the employee works hard, pay will follow accordingly. Remuneration will follow accordingly. Remuneration will not be a problem where uh, the employee is working hard, right? So in performance management, the linking is not with pay. The linking is with the overall development of the employee. The employee is being asked, please tell us what changes have you found in yourself as compared to last year? This is the question which is asked in performance management. In performance appraisal, the question which is asked is, your salary was 6 lakh rupees last year. What is the salary current year? That is the question which is asked in appraisal because the focus is on money. In management, focus is on development of the employee. How has the employee developed over the years? Next, bureaucratic. There's a complex paperwork. Okay. So in performance appraisal, there are a lot of forms to be filled. So first form is during the uh, start of the year, goal setting form. It is known as goal setting form. You have to fill the goal setting form. 
then when the year end comes then you have to uh, submit your self assessment and then the um, the senior person gives you review of your work so everything is documented everything is um, uh, paper worked so it is very very orthodox in a bureaucratic manner you know just like government offices uh, paperwork is uh, too huge so that kind of paperwork is there in case of performance appraisal however in case of performance management documentation is minimum dialogue is more documentation is minimum and please write over here dialogue is more dialogue is more we communicate more and we document less okay now this process is owned by the hr department so hr department uh, you know follows up for this entire process uh, develops this process and takes forward this process however performance management is a line manager duty line manager means um, the the immediate manager of a particular person he will drive the performance management process he will decide when the meeting will happen between junior and senior for his performance appraisal so everything is driven by the line manager hr i have less control in performance management however in case of performance appraisal everything is controlled by hr because hr will de de determine the timelines of filling the goals uh, will determine timeline of appraisal etc etc so hr is whole sole responsible for appraisal uh, in case of uh, management everything goes in hands of the managers managers decide when to sit for appraisal managers decide how frequently should we sit for appraisal which form to be filled which form not to be filled everything is decided by the management of the uh, person that is the difference now what is the performance management cycle the performance management cycle how do you um, uh, do performance management first of all you need to plan that is set your goals then you need to act doing your job and developing yourself then you need to monitor monitor means um, uh, you know uh, what have you done well what have you learned in the organization what have you done well are you getting coaching properly then review review means uh, you get your final appraisal or final um, performance related comments that is the process so plan act monitor review plan act monitor review this is the performance management cycle so the components of performance management first of all is planning you need to plan the targets you need to plan the key performance areas which you um, uh, you know want to achieve then there are certain key performance indicators which you decide for yourself key result areas that you decide for yourself in planning phase so for example if you are an, an employee of say um, a sales department of a company then you will decide that your key performance area is developing sales having more and more sales okay that is your key performance area and what is the key performance indicator how will we indicate that you have done well so if you have done sales worth rupees 5 lakh we'll give you c rating if you have done sales worth rupees 10 lakh we'll give you b rating and if you have done sales worth rupees 20 lakhs we'll give you a rating this is how your performance indicators will tell us how what was your performance in the key performance areas your key performance areas is sales similarly there can be various key performance areas like managing your juniors how good are you in managing your juniors that can be your key performance area what will be the key performance indicator in that case key performance indicator will be how satisfied are your juniors are they happy with you or are they sad with you that is the key performance indicator all right so the first one is performance planning the second one is performance appraisal and review now after your performance is planned then you appraise your performance and review your performance self appraisal is, is required first of all so i've told you in management in performance management first of all an opportunity is given to the employee to rate himself what does he think that he has performed good or what is what is the thing that he has performed not so good it is employee's prerogative that is required to be done so the first performance level indicator is self appraisal appraisal is to be done by the employee himself then he gets the final rating for his achievements by the employer that is the performance appraisal and review process feedback of performance followed by pers personal counseling now once the person gets the final rating for his achievements now he will talk with his senior <coughs> and he will get counseling on how to improve the performance <coughs> now suppose current year the uh, the sales were 20 lakhs how to increase those sales to 30 lakhs and 40 lakhs what are the areas of uh, improvement 
this will be discussed between the manager and the employee both manager and the employee will be kpis and kra yes kpis and kras are part of a performance appraisal as well as performance management both are um, a part of both of them performance appraisal as well as performance management but currently we are studying the components of performance management so component of performance management will contain kra and KRA, kpi this will also be there in components of performance appraisal but we are not dealing with performance appraisal right now we are dealing with performance management performance management is our area of area of focus in this particular chapter okay sir <clears throat> Next is rewarding good performance. Now, whosoever has done good performance, whosoever has um, uh, given good ratings, rewards should be given to them in form of high bonuses, in form of recognition, public recognition that yes, this is the employee of the month. You know, sometimes you see employee of the month recognition and uh, uh, bonuses should be given to employees for their self-esteem and motivation. Then performance improvement plans. We need to prepare the performance improvement plans. How can you improve the performance at a later point in time? Those plans are required to be uh, made for the next year. So fresh goals are set. Fresh goals are set for the next year. For the next appraisal cycle, fresh goals are set. Potential appraisal. Now, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, what is to be seen over here is promotion. Promotion forms an important part of appraisal, right? Now, what is the probability that we can give promotion to the employee latent or vertical movement to the employee? Can we promote him to the next level? Bonuses is okay. You're giving bonus for good performance. That's perfectly fine. But can we promote this particular employee to the next level? That is a question which we need to answer. And to answer that question, we need to discuss about potential appraisal. Potential appraisal means can we promote the employees? This is known as potential appraisal. Appraisal that you are going to do in future for increasing the level of the employee later, later, lateral and vertical movement of the employees. This is potential appraisal. Okay, sir. So uh, now let us come on to what are the measuring tools of performance? How will we know whether we are performing well or not? As an organization, how will we know whether we are performing well or not? As an individual, how will we know that uh, whether we are performing well or not? Okay. So next is uh, how to measure the performance how performance management is measured that is the next question so guys performance management is measured using two attributes productivity and efficiency a you have to be very productive which means you have to um, produce a lot of uh, output you have to give a lot of output second is you have to be very efficient also which means you have to produce that maximum output using minimum inputs using minimum inputs now suppose you are sitting for studies for 12 hours but the uh, but the final output that you are getting is only for four hours why because you are while you are studying for 12 hours your mind is somewhere else or you are scrolling your instagram or facebook or whatsapp during the time you are studying right then in that particular case the output will be hampered so yes you are giving a lot of productivity because you are sitting on the chair for 12 hours you giving you are giving a lot of productivity but are you efficient answer is no you are not efficient you are giving an uh, uh, studying actually effective studies are only for four hours so you're not efficient similarly if you know one employee is uh, 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 you know producing 10 kgs of output other employees producing 15 kgs of output who is more productive employee a is producing 10 kgs of output employee a is producing 10 kgs of output employee b is producing 15 kgs of output who is more productive of course employee b is more productive but let me give you another another fact the input which is employed by a mr a the input which is employed by mr a is 12 after inputting 12 raw material he is uh, deriving output of 10 finished goods right in case of b b is inputting 22 raw material to get 15 output b is inputting 22 raw material to get 15 output so tell me whether Mr. A is efficient or Mr. B is efficient? Of course, Mr. A is more efficient. So although Mr. B is more productive, but who is more efficient? Mr. A is more efficient. So we look at efficiency more than productivity. Productivity is a later thing. Productivity is not as relevant as efficiency. So what do you mean by productivity? Productivity uh, examines the output which is produced. The output which is produced, productivity examines, examines that quantity of work that has been done what is the quantity of work that has been done this is productivity what is efficiency 
uh, efficiency is how much resources are used to produce that particular work so minimum resources should have been uh, uh, used to produce that particular work minimum resources should have been used this is efficiency when you use minimum resources that is efficiency when you uh, uh, you know uh, when you see only the output that is productivity when output is higher that is productivity but when output is higher in minimum uh, input that is efficiency so we are focusing more towards efficiency guys look at this diagram please look at this diagram so this is time this is productivity productivity increases over the period of time right productivity increases but again we need to reduce time and increase productivity so over here productivity increases and time is also increasing but when we go up when we go up then uh, uh, you know time is increasing more than productivity time is increasing more and productivity is increasing less so productivity should definitely be uh, an important point but along with it we also should see what is the time taken to produce that particular good or what is the raw material taken to that produce that particular good that is also important so this is the difference between uh, efficiency and productivity then very very important topic guys financial performance analysis very very important from an exam standpoint how do you assess financial performance of a organization of a company of a partnership firm of an individual proprietorship firm any business any business okay how do you assess the financial performance guys the first thing that comes to your mind is return on income return on investment yes the ratio analysis which you have done in your 12th standard or 11th standard that ratio analysis is relevant for financial performance analysis what is the debt equity ratio of the organization what is the working capital ratio of the organization is it that the organization has taken a lot of debt lot of borrowings it has taken and it is burdened with a lot of debt interest expense is too much for an uh, for an organization is it that ways then we will say that performance um, uh, 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 appraisal is it will say that a performance is not good enough when your financial performance um, is determined by the ratio analysis okay students are saying uh, please share the notes with us just give me 2 minutes i'll share the notes with all of you yes i forgot to share the notes this time i'll share the notes with all of you just a second i'm sharing the notes guys of the three chapters we are going to take up today okay guys i have shared the notes on the chat box please see the chat box you can download the notes from here and you can even print them please see the chat box i have um, uh, given the notes over here and i am also uh, uh, giving uh, the the link in the description box of this video over there also i am putting the link of these notes okay Yes, guys. So in the description box, also I have pasted the link to these notes. Notes are there in the description box, also. Yes, on both the places I have saved the notes. Notes are there on your chat box. Notes are there in the description box, also. Both the places notes are there. all right did you get it did you get the notes yes sir all right so yes we are discussing about financial performance analysis yes we uh, do a lot of ratio analysis 
um, uh, we do a lot of um, uh, comparing the previous year's financials with this year financial to know what is the increase in expenses what is the increase in revenue what is the increase in assets all these things we do uh, in case of financial performance analysis so financial and performance analysis is one of the most important elements of performance management of any organization or the company so in this particular analysis we are going to focus on financial strengths and weaknesses short term and long term growth prospects short term growth prospects or long term growth prospects are hampered by financial performance analysis now three things which we look at while doing financial performance analysis balance sheet what do we see in balance sheet assets and liabilities secondly we see income statement what do we see in income statement profit and loss during the year income or expenses revenue and expenses over the year this is what we see in income statement <laughs> third thing we see is cash flow statement in which we see receipts and payment and we ignore the non cash assets or non cash liabilities we ignore them that is known as cash flow statements so these three statements are key to our financial analysis so what do we do in our financial analysis so, so we take up some ratios like working capital ratio financial structure ratio activity ratio profitability ratio and guys in this particular section i have given in a table all the ratios which are there guys please remember these ratios very very carefully from a cost audit perspective as well as spm perspective these ratios are very very important in cost audit also these ratios will be used a question will come in your examination uh, where ratio analysis is required to be done done over there also these ratios will be important and in spm also these ratios are very very important these are nothing new these ratios you have already studied in your 11th and 12th standard and in your uh, uh, and in your uh, uh, you know uh, intermediate also you have studied these ratio analysis it is nothing new it is the same ratio analysis so things like liquidity ratio what is the net working capital in an organization what is the current ratio what is the asset or liquid ratio and guys uh, we also see the uh, ideal ratio and we compare our ratio with the ideal ratio okay so you have to remember the ideal ratio so current ratio is current assets over current liabilities and the ideal ratio is 2 is to 1 2 is to 1 means two times should be the current assets and current liabilities should be one time that is the ideal ratio of current ratio then asset ratio or quick uh, uh, ratio it the ideal ratio is 1 is to 1 asset ratio or quick ratio inventory turnover ratio cogs divided by average inventory cost of goods sold divided by average inventory is the inventory turnover ratio debtor turnover ratio net credit sales over average debtors is the debt uh, turnover ratio so guys, similarly we have various ratios like debt equity ratio debt to total capital ratio there are ideal ratios which are uh, listed over here you have to uh, read all these formulas do all these um, uh, ratios well along with knowing their ideal ratio wherever it is given so yes ratio analysis please mark over here is the very very important analysis from spm standpoint as well as from cost audit standpoint ratio analysis is a very 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 important you have to really uh, uh you have to really uh, mug up these ratios very well and understand them all right the second way to have financial analysis okay second way to have financial analysis is comparative financial analysis what do you mean by comparative financial analysis let me give you an example of comparative financial analysis on a different screen okay i'm giving you this analysis on a different screen so okay so you can see the screen in front of me okay now if we talk about balance sheet if we talk about balance sheet <clears throat> If I want to, uh, you know, analyze my performance in terms of balance sheet, what do I need? What do I need? Guys, I would need current year's number. I would need previous year's number. Then I would, uh, would want to find the change in terms of previous and current year. And then I will find the percentage change in the current year and the previous year. So, for example, fixed assets fixed assets in the current year are 100 crores in the previous year they were 80 crores what is the change the change is 20 crores then what will i do i will divide 20 by 80 to find out the percentage change 
the percentage change is 25% 25% increase has happened in the uh, uh, you know value of uh, uh, fixed assets as compared to previous year as compared to previous year the change is 25% there's a 25% increase in fixed assets uh, value so as now i understand that fixed assets have increased by 25% the the result is that guys i would take care that my sales should have been also increased by 25% or more or around 25%. If your capitalization increases, then what would be the second impact that you should expect in your uh, profit and loss account or balance sheet? It is increase in sales. Now I will compare this increase with increase in sales. What is the increase in sales? And if there is no increase in sales, then I will question the management. Management, why did you increase these fixed assets when there is no corresponding uh, change in sales? Management might reply that, oh, sir, uh, the change you will feel in the next year because this is the new year when our fixed assets were introduced. Change you will see in next year. That is a valid explanation. So this is how the this is how the common size financial statements are made. So let me come back to the original notes. Let me come back to the notes. Comparative financial analysis. So comparative financial analysis is done when financial statements of two or more financial years are compared with each other. So assets, liabilities, as well as income and expenditure of current year is compared with previous year. So both the years and numbers are compared to compute the comparative financial analysis. This is how comparative financial analysis is done. And yes, I have uh, practical questions with respect to comparative financial analysis in my study mat. So you can um, do one or two practical questions also of this concept, although um, this coming in the examination practically is rare. But theoretically, you will understand it only when you do a practical question of this particular type, right? Theoretically, you will be able to understand it. Next is common size financial analysis. Now, this is, a, this is also an important analysis. This is common size financial analysis. What is common size financial analysis? So, guys, now this particular organization, suppose it has fixed assets worth rupees 100 crores. Okay. It also has current assets. Current assets are 20 crores in the current year. Previous year, they were 15 crores. Change is 5 crores and the percentage change is to be calculated. Then there will be miscellaneous, you know, miscellaneous assets, which are the uh, fictitious assets of the company. There will be a number attached to these also. Then we have certain liquid assets. We have certain liquid assets which are given over here. Now, what is the meaning of, what is the meaning of common size financial analysis now we need to understand the meaning of common size financial analysis what is the meaning of common size financial analysis let me tell you the meaning of common size financial analysis let me share the screen with you all right so guys in case of common size financial analysis previous year figures are not given change and change percentage is not given all these things are not given in case of common size financial analysis. So then what is given in common size financial analysis? Guys, we have another video. Uh, we have another, uh, 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 you know, line. We have another column. And in this particular column, in, uh, in case of common size financial analysis, we take fixed assets, suppose, as 100%. We take fixed assets as 100%. Okay percentage of total assets we take fixed assets at 100 percent and we see what is the current assets ratio to fixed assets so suppose current assets ratio in this particular to fixed asset is 20 percent similarly if miscellaneous assets are also there say miscellaneous assets are five um, uh, then the miscellaneous assets as a percentage of fixed asset is five percent so we do not compare two years in this particular statement we don't compare two years we compare the individual attributes with the major attribute of that particular balance sheet. So, for example, in case of profit and loss account, we will compare each of the expenses with sales. What is the percentage of that expense as compared to sales? Expense divided by sales, expense divided by sales. This is the percentage that we uh, try to find out. And then we see internally, not comparing it with previous years, we see internally what is the ratio of, say, personnel expenses to sales? And what has been the ratio in the last year? This is known as the common. Um, uh, uh, this is known as the common size financial analysis. This is the common size financial analysis. Let me um, take you back to the notes. Okay. So common size financial analysis is also known as component percentage statement or vertical statement. 
this technique net revenue total assets or total liabilities is taken as 100% so we will take total assets total liabilities on net revenue as 100% and all the other individual items are calculated on the basis of these total assets so for example current assets are calculated on the basis of total assets in terms of percentage okay so, um, uh, similarly all the expenses will be um, uh, computed as a percentage of net revenue right and then we will compare the performance with similar companies which are there in the industry so for example our our current uh, asset to fixed asset ratio was 20 percent we will compare what is our uh, uh, competitors current asset to fixed asset ratio was the uh, current asset to fixed asset ratio of our computer company less or more we'll be able to compare it okay this is known as common size financial analysis then guys last is trend analysis trend analysis is very very similar very very simple guys um in this particular method we compare various years the performance of various years with our current year so how is it done please show let me show it to you so in case of trend in case of trend guys we have the uh, figures of many years okay this is 2010 2011 2012 2013 and 2014 we have the data for many years okay now we will take one year as the base year like we'll take fixed asset of 2010 as the base year suppose fixed asset of 2010 are 80 crores that is the base year 2011 they grow to 89 crores 2012 they grow to 92 crores 2013 they grow to 113 crores 2014 it grows to 210 crores so this is the growth which happens uh, in the fixed asset over a period of time now what we will do we will analyze the fixed assets of each of the year as compared to the base year so 89 divided by 80 will compute the percentage 92 divided by 80 will compute the percentage 113 divided by 80 will compute the percentage then uh, 210 divided by 80 will keep 80 as constant and we will take numerator as different years sales and that numerator will be the the deciding factor of our trend so this is how we'll see the trend so in what percentage are our fixed assets increasing and then we will compare these uh, trend with the sales trend has the sales also increased in the same um, uh, ratio that's the question which we are going to ask ourselves okay so this is the method which is employed okay sir got it okay so trend analysis now we come on to the next topic next topic is supply chain management guys a very very simple concept um you know in a business organization uh, the goods flow in a particular direction like raw material gets converted into finished goods finished goods are then sold in market this is the flow of goods which happens um, uh, this starts from transfer transformation processes uh, that transform raw material into finished goods like sourcing procurement conversion logistic management etc it is an entire flow flow how would good goods flow how would raw material come in how would raw material be processed and how would raw material be converted into finished goods and then finished goods finally sold to market this is known as supply chain management this is an impo important element of performance uh, appraisal and performance management of the organization so this is how it happens okay raw material goes to the producer producer produces the finished goods sells it to the distributor distributor gives it to the retailer retailer gives it to the customer this is the physical distribution supply chain management objective of supply chain management smooth functioning of every element of production shipment and distribution that is the first aim first objective of supply chain management there should be smooth working of production shipment and distribution second is to minimize cost related to transportation and distribution of uh, uh, goods third is integration of suppliers manufacturers warehouse and stores so all the systems should be integrated the supplier should be well very well connected with manufacturers manufacturers should very well be connected with warehouses and stores so that the entire flow is not uh, damaged is not uh, halted components of supply chain management first of all we need to plan so uh, we need to plan all the resources uh, what we are going to um, uh, use in our supply chain management that is the first thing we need to plan what are the demand and supply of our product and services according to which we need to strategize what all resources are required so first is plan second is source to choose the suppliers who deliver the goods and services to us where are we going to procure the raw material from where are we going to procure the other facilities which are required for manufacturing from 
where are we going to procure it that is the source which we need to um, you know assert in and um, take the raw material in then make we need to produce that is the production then deliver we need to deliver it uh, to the customers then if there is any um, returns which are there from the customers in respect of defectives then customer should be able to return our products so what is the return mechanism so the components of supply chain management are plan source make develop return plan source p s m d r p s m d r so guys whenever you are learning some uh, you know some of the theoretical portions always make mnemonics this is a mnemonic so whenever you think about components of supply chain management you should think about p s m d r p s m d r okay sir guys then next is customer relationship management i've already told you that you know success of a business organization is not only monitored by its profit numbers by its um, uh, fixed assets numbers by its growth numbers but also monitored by how satisfied is the customer with the product or the business satisfaction level of the customer is very very important so customer relationship management is a business strategy comprised of process organizational and technical change whereby company seeks to better manage its enterprise around its customers behavior so the company has to arrange all its activities around customer behavior uh, however customer is uh, willing to react on a particular issue the company should resolve all its problem at the very first place okay so for example you know if if i am going to buy a, a fridge okay so company should take care that i need to deliver the fridge to the home of the customer as well company should take care of that fact so customer needs are the prime uh, uh, you know prime goal of any businessman any activity that is customer relationship management we need to maintain our relationship with the customer surrounded with customer behavior it entails acquiring developing knowledge about customers and using the information to increase revenue objectives of cmr are to understand the customer first of all we need to understand the actually the needs of the customer needs are required to be understood then retain customers through better customer experience customer experience should be a1 it should be the best we need to attract new customer win new customer increase profitability and decrease customer management cost so we need to increase profitability <clears throat> we need to acquire new clients and new customers and decrease the customer management cost whatever is the customer management cost that we need to decrease that is the objective of crm advantages and benefit of crm are satisfied customers the first benefit of crm is if crm is done properly customer is very much satisfied with the services which it receives so crm's first objective or the first target of crm is to satisfy its customers if the customers are satisfied then crm is um you know successful second advantage is product development according to customer needs so product can be developed according to customer needs if crm is in place guys uh, what necessarily is crm crm is to identify the customer needs what does customer actually want and if we know what does customer actually want we will knit our product we will craft our product at, uh, according to or around the needs of the customers so that is the advantage of uh, a crm a rapid increase in quality of products and services um, uh, so you know uh, the quality of product and services rapidly increases if crm is in place ability to sell more products more products are sold optimal optimization of communication cost communication cost is reduced if crm is done fine because you know um, uh, customer putting in grievances again and again will uh, put more load on the company rather than company beforehand should understand the grievances of the uh, customer and take necessary measures to amend it so proper selection of marketing tools travel free uh, run of business marketing tools are to be chosen properly in crm then a trouble free run of business process business process runs trouble free greater number of individual contracts with customers individual contracts are more more time for consumers differentiate from um uh, competition real time access to information everyone has the information access all the time because customer is giving feedback okay and that feedback is available with the management all the time communication between marketing and sales and services is there increase effect so guys any six you can remember any six not all okay sir times of types of crm what are the different types of crm first is analytical customer crm so guys uh, how do we appraise the customer how do we know what does customer want number one method is customer data is there and you can uh, you know uh, uh, you know you can analyze those data which is there uh, customer data is there you can analyze those data and you can uh, predict the behavior of the customer using the data which you have so for example you know if a cafe has data of how many customers visit under age of 21 in that cafe 
how what is the portion of people who are visiting from 17 years to 21 years what is the proportion of people who are visiting from 22 to um, uh, 30 years what is the pro promotion proportion of uh, people who are visiting from 31 to 44 years if we have this data then the management of that particular cafe will easily understand who is the target audience of this cafe or who are the most of the uh, audience of this cafe and accordingly the ambience of the cafe can be improved or the um, uh, you know the products can be improved if we have more participation of older generation then according to them we need to put the songs okay songs should be old bollywood songs or remix form of old bollywood songs this category of people will enjoy those um, uh, songs if we have younger generation more in that particular cafe then we need some hip hop we need some um, uh, you know uh, mika singh or we need some uh, uh, pop jazz the first crm is on the basis of prediction of customer behavior on the basis of customer data second is operative customer relationship so guys in this particular method customer is not involved in the uh, crm process customer not involved customer is not involved their data is taken and it is analyzed on an independent basis customer is not involved second is when operative customer relationship management happens when the uh, customer is uh, contacted when customer is actually contacted you contact the customer and ask for his feedback ask for his uh, experience in the cafe and what all changes can he expect in the cafe if you ask for feedback from the customers customer support actual contact with the customer conducted by the front office workers then that will help us benefit the crm process customer will himself tell us that oh we want say we want shikanji in your menu shikanji or we want badam milk in your menu your menu does not have badam milk we need badam milk so these uh, input we can be taken by the customer itself and the third one and the most popular one is collaborative relationship management collaborative relationship management it, it means that uh, you know the customer and the cafe will join hands together to develop the desired attributes of the cafe they will join hands together so in case of collaborative customer relationship management we not only ask the um, uh, you know the customers to suggest us what should be added but we also ask the customers to try the new things that we are going to add and we uh, incorporate the customers into our decision making process we incorporate the customers we ask the customers to taste new dishes to taste uh, new drinks and tell us whether this should be included in the menu or not this is the collaborative customer relationship management it enables all companies along distribution channel as well as departments in a company to work together and share information about the customers so everyone shares the information about the customers the goal of collaborative customer relationship management is to maximize the sharing of relevant information according by um, uh, acquired by all the departments with a focus on increasing quality of services so guys um, these are the three types of crm analytical crm where customer data is given and uh, it is analyzed or it is scrutinized second is operative crm where the uh, where the customer is uh, contacted by the front office and he is asked certain questions which he answers to third is collaborative where customer forms an integral part of the decision making process of the crm process of any organization okay sir got it a crm initiative generally has some of the following risks on an organization it increases the expectation of senior management so if crm is rolled out in an organization now management would feel that oh after crm after doing crm now we understand our customer very well now the profits will increase multifolds in no span of time this is the misconception which top management has management starts expecting a lot after crm however it takes time to adjust the crm it takes time to reap benefit of the crm so it will take time to reap the benefits of the crm it cannot happen in in um, a split of a second or in blink of eye it cannot happen second is increased complexity of management managing multiple channels technologies customer relationship and customer definitions so yes the proper uh, the the entire um, uh, project becomes a little cumbersome because we need to manage multiple channels technologies customer relationships etc vital and confidential customer information may be transmitted and shared across new networks and systems so uh, uh, you know some sensitive customer information like you know their age their uh, their uh, uh, preference of uh, height of their hair in case of a saloon so all these 
customer private information can be leaked in this process of customer relationship management significant changes to organization uh, attitudes beliefs needs to be done in case of crm so this change is very very difficult people's attitude should be uh, changed people's um, uh, way of looking at crm should change that is very very difficult and the next one is customer profitability so this is a kind of customer relationship management which happens um, uh, you know in a targeted way okay so there are many customers of an organization this bar denotes many customers of the organization but and this denotes the profits of uh, the profits earned by all those clients okay now we analyze that top 20% of the clients are contributing top 80% of profits of the company then our focus should be on these top clients naturally guys if top 20% clients are contributing to 80% of your profit then you will focus on what you will focus on those 20 uh, clients you will uh, take care of those clients needs you will take care of those clients wants so this is known as the customer profitability analysis we need to know who are our most profitable customers and those customers should be given utmost benefits most benefits should be given uh, to those customers who are our um, uh, loyal customers and they are holding 20% or 80% or more revenue of profits. So customer profitability is the profit firm making for serving customer, customer group over a specified period of time, specifically difference between revenue earned and cost associated with customer relationship in a specified period. The purpose of customer profit metric is to identify profitability of individual customers separately. We need to understand the profitability of each of the customers separately. Uh, what is the uh, profit which is um, being given by one of the customers? If the profit is given by one of the customers to the maximum of the profit of the company, then of course, our focus and attention should be on those customers. And yes, this marks the end of our first chapter, guys. Performance, management. So let me tell you, let me ask you, how's the Josh, guys? We are done with the first chapter. How's the Josh? How are you all feeling? Are you feeling bored? Are you feeling energetic to start the new chapter? Should we start the new chapter? How is the Josh in the house? I just want to know that. Yes, we have just completed one hour of marathon and in one hour we have completed the first chapter. How is the Josh? Please write in the chat box. In the chat box, I want to know how is the Josh? Sharan says Bacha. I don't know for what Sharan says Bacha. How is the Josh guys? Please write in the chat box. How is the Josh? How is the Josh? In all of you should we start the next chapter super hi awesome sir dheeraj kumar moshmi yes sir all right all right guys so let's start the next chapter and before we start the next chapter just a two minutes break two minutes break before we start the next chapter
All right, yes, guys, we are back with the second chapter of strategic performance management, and the second chapter is performance evaluation and improvement tools. How do you evaluate your performance, and how you improve your uh, performance uh, as an organization? That is the key important area of discussion in this particular uh, chapter. How do we evaluate our performance, and how do we <coughs> improve our uh, performance? So the first method of evaluating our performance is balance scorecard. Balance scorecard is the first way to um, uh, evaluate our performance. So, guys, you can see a girl over here, okay? A child over here, and guys, each mother wants to give a balanced diet to her child. The diet should be balanced. The, the diet should contain fruits. Banana is there. Apple is there. Grapes is there. Diet should also contain balanced form of vegetables like uh, cauliflower is there. Then uh, uh, tomatoes are there, carrots are there, radish is there. Balanced fruit is given to the children. Okay. Similarly, an organization's performance is to be balanced. Also, the organization performance is not only related to profit increment or growth. That is not the only focus of um, uh, the performance of an organization. The performance of the organization should also focus on uh, how satisfied are the customers, how satisfied are the uh, banks who have lent money to the organization, and that important element of uh, considering everything in your performance is known as balance scorecard. So, as a, a student, you should be good in English, you should be good in Hindi, you should be good in communication skills, you should be good in extracurricular activity, you should be good in sports, right? There should be a balanced uh, growth which is uh, required to, for you as a student, as a child. Similarly, for a company, for a management, <clears throat> the performance is not only with respect to financials, is not only with respect to profits. Only increment of profit is not the objective. That we have to increase the profit. That is not the only um, objective. The objective is also to have a balanced growth, and the balanced growth covers these four aspects. So, balanced scorecard means having a growth in these four aspects. What are the four aspects? First of all, customers should be happy. What is growth in your customers? Are your customers satisfied? Number one, internal. Number two, internal processes. Uh, should be absolutely perfect without any error. They should be smooth and functioning. So internal processes are the second area of um, uh, appraisal when you uh, perform when you appraise your company in a balanced scorecard. Third is the financial perspective. Of course, financial perspective is important. How how good is your profit? How good is your um, uh, current ratio or your debt equity ratio? How good is all those things? That is financial per perspective. Then ask the growth. How well are your employees learning new skills? How much are your employees growing? How as a company you are growing? You know, last year you had only four products. This year you have six products. Are you growing well? So this is the balance scorecard in which we need to understand that company need not perform well only in one of the uh, attributes. Company should perform well in all the four attributes. That is their customers. Internal processes should be good. Financial perspective should be good. Learning and growth should be good. What are the financial indicators? Profits, operating profit, ROI, economic value added, revenue growth. What are the customer um, uh, related uh, uh, objectives which we have? Customer should uh, give get product of good quality and service. Delivery should be good. Customer should be satisfied. That is the customer perspective. Internal businesses. How should the internal businesses or the key processes should function? Key processes are monitored to ensure outcomes will be satisfactory. The Process should be such that outcome is good. The outcome is satisfactory. Innovation uh, becomes one of the major elements of our processes. We should innovate to new processes. That is important. Operation processes, uh, they should be efficient, consistent, timely delivery should happen in case of processes. Last is learning and growth. Our ability of employee should be enhanced. Our employees, if they are working at X level tomorrow, yesterday, then they should work at X plus 2 level today. They should work at X plus 4 level tomorrow. There has to be escalation. There has to be increase in ability of the employees on a continuous basis. Quality of information systems. Organization alignment should be there. Uh, organization should also grow. Organization goals should also be achieved. And employee goals should also be achieved. So these are the four areas of balance scorecard. How do you develop balance scorecard? How do you, um, uh, you know, uh, use these four areas for your betterment? 
and how do you map your progress uh, in these four areas okay number one identify key outcomes or success objectives of the organization the first step is to know where do you want to reach first step is to know where do you want to reach what are the targets that you need to attain for example by the year end i want to attain gross profit ratio of 38 percent that is the target so first of all set your targets and targets should be set in terms of these four areas targets should be set in terms of these four areas so what are your targets for your customers so i want an increase in customer of 20 percent in the current year okay that can be your target okay so what are your targets with respect to customers what are the, your targets in respect of internal processes targets in respect of financial um, uh, uh, goals targets in respect of learning and growth what are your targets this is the um uh, uh, this is the uh, you know question to be asked in balance scorecard so targets are mapped with balance scorecards so first step is to identify your key outcomes or your targets what do you want to achieve second is to identify the process that leads to these outcomes how will i achieve 20% increase in customer um, uh, base this year maybe i have to venture into a new market i have to capture i was currently only in delhi i want to capture mumbai i want to capture kolkata customers also so you need to know what are the processes that lead to these outcomes how do you venture into new markets to increase your uh, market standing or if you want to achieve a gross profit ratio of say 38 percent how will you increase your revenue or how will you decrease your expenses that's the second process that what do you do to achieve the goals third is develop key performance indicators for the processes now you need to uh, develop key performance indicators key performance indicators means um, suppose you are wanting to increase your customer base okay so you have to now calculate the number of customers which you have today number of customers which you have after one month number of customers which you have after one year so number of customers will form your key performance indicator Similarly, in case of increasing your gross profit ratio, that is the ultimate target. The key performance indicator will be reduction in expenses. How much percentage expenses have been reduced during the current year? How much increase is there in the revenue? How much contribution has improved during the year? These are the key performance indicators to know whether your overall gross profit has increased or not. So key performance indicators are to be determined. Then develop reliable data capture and measurement system. You should have a management a data system where you are able to know what is your current standing in market and what is your future standing in market that you should know on the basis of that data. So data capture mechanism is very, very important. Develop a mechanism for reporting these data to relevant managers and staff. How to report this data to the relevant manager and staff that is also required to be seen and act improvement plans. Now you need to um, uh, see how do you improve your performance which you have attained. So these are the steps to develop a balanced scorecard. And remember, all these steps are to be applied on all of these four areas. Please don't forget any one area. Please don't forget. All the steps are to be applied on all these four areas. Type of information required for balanced scorecard. So, um, you know, what information do you require to develop a balanced scorecard? So the information which is required is the process of developing activity will make individuals and divisions more aware of their how their work fits with the strategy of the business so um, uh, uh, first of all when we are developing the activity when we are developing this balance scorecard we first need to um, uh, get the data from individuals and divisions we need to get the data from individuals and div divisions who are actually performing the work so the first step of getting information is contact the individual and divisions who are may more aware about um, uh, the business, the strategy of the business, and they can contribute to your data requirements. So the information is to be fetched from the um, individual and divisions who are actually um, in the core of the things like sales department is on, on the core of the things of financial perspective. Then the advertisement department is uh, on the core of the thing of the customer side. Right, so you develop uh, data from there. Then individual and division should receive regular reports of their performance against balance scorecard. So on the on a regular basis, the sales manager should get a detail of what are the sales which have been achieved on a per day basis or on a weekly basis. Senior management should receive regular information on the organization's overall accomplishment. So senior management should uh, get a broad level data. Okay, whether the four aspects of the balance scorecard are being achieved or not. So they should get the data. Outside stakeholders may have access to balance scorecard, help them 
to have a more imp good impression of organization's value. So even you can share the balance scorecard data with outside stakeholders. They will know where do you stand. They will know where do you want to reach in future. They will also help you in uh, attaining your goals, which are there for you in future. So what are the benefits and limitations of balance scorecard? The benefits of balance scorecard is that it avoids management reliance on short term financial measures. So sometimes management only focuses on financial activities. If you have a balance scorecard, then the attention is digressed from financial measures to non financial measures as well. The um, attention is digressed. Number two, it successfully communicate corporate strategy to functional heads and organization subunits, forcing them to develop their own goals to achieve the corporate mission. So balance scorecard is you know, um, communicated to the functional heads. So functional heads will make sure that they own not only run after money, they also run after certain other criteria, certain other things like, um, uh, uh, you know, customer perspective, customer should be at the core of the strategy. So they, uh, you know, develop customer perspective as well. It can assist stakeholders in evaluating the firm firm is a firm's outlook firms performance is measured in terms of balance scorecard. So an outsider like a shareholder will be able to assess where is the organization moving towards is organization able to achieve its uh, goals that is the benefit helps in focusing the whole organization on few key things needed to create breakthrough performance so um, the whole organization will focus on these four things and these four things can uh, you know um, increase the performance of the entire organization that is the benefit helps integrate various corporate programs. So corporate programs, uh, initiatives of corporate like re-engineering customer services will be integrated to these four goals. These four goals will be clearly demarcated. Break down strategic measures towards lower level and managers. So managers and um, you know strategic level people, execution level people are also aware about the goals of the organization. Clarifying and updating budgets. Budgets will be uh, clarified. Identifying aligning strategic in initiatives. The initiatives will be focused on these four areas if we communicate these four areas to our um, uh, strategic partners. Helps conduct periodic performance uh, uh, of reviews. Then, what are the limitations of a balance scorecard? There is no clear relationship between balance scorecard and shareholders' value. Uh, so, guys, shareholders' value is always increased by financial indicators. However, balance scorecard has three more indicators. So, it is not necessary that you know, balance scorecard success is always visible in terms of shareholders value. Sometimes customers are very, very satisfied, but profit levels are low. So, you know, shareholders value is low, but customer is very, very satisfied. So it's a positive thing. So it is not necessary that balance scorecard gets converted into shareholders value. Shareholders will get benefit out of it. Shareholders will get profit after out of it. It is not necessary because balance scorecard is not only about profits, not only about financial things then does not lead to single aggregate summary of control so you know um, uh, there are four factors in balance scorecard so four factors are required to be seen individually there's no single factor where we can see that okay this is the factor you need to control it there are four factors and that two very different four factors this is a limitation of balance scorecard they the measures give conflicting signals and confuse management so sometimes what happens is one two three four one uh, factor has worked very well Second one has not worked so well. Third one has uh, uh, has performed very well. Fourth has not performed very well. So on an overall basis, the balance scorecard looks a little confusing because there are four different things which we are seeing. And all those four different things might give you four different results. Therefore, balance scorecard is a little confusing sometimes. It involves substantial shift in corporate culture. Corporate culture is um, uh, shifting uh, in case of balance scorecard because earlier it was always felt that financials are the key profit is the aim of the organization but no now with advent of balance scorecard we have uh, seen that financial performance is just one of the four criteria of success so financial performance is not the end of the game okay okay sir next is benchmarking what do you mean by benchmarking guys benchmarking means setting targets we all benchmark in our daily lives benchmark in the sense you know um, uh, many of you might be doing that you know after examination you might do that how many footsteps do we uh, uh, walk in a particular day 10000 footsteps we need to complete daily on a particular day this is the monitoring which we do using those smart bands right and we set a target for ourselves that every day we will uh, 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 do 10000 footsteps this is known as benchmarking we should have targets before ourselves we should have targets. Your target is clearing CMA final with good marks. That is your benchmark. 
so benchmarking means setting targets for corporate in terms of uh, financials in terms of um, everything guys in terms of everything the benchmark is required to be done so uh, i've given you an example in the class we have discussed this example so you know um, uh, we always benchmark our mobile phones whenever we are selecting mobile phones we compare mobile phones with each other we benchmark mobile phones so display of samsung galaxy m31 is 6.4 iphone is 4.70 One plus seven pro, six point six seven inches. Google Pixel, six inches. So we benchmark our uh, requirement of the screen size. We see that screen size of Samsung Galaxy M thirty one is the um, uh, good one. One plus seven pro is very good screen size is there, right? So we benchmark in this particular way. Rear camera is benchmarked. Front camera is benchmarked. This is how benchmarking happens as compared to your competitors. so types of benchmarking uh, on what all areas do we do benchmarking that is what we are going to see now first is product benchmarking or reverse engineering every organization buy its rivals product to find out the features and performance etc as compared with its own products so first of all we need to see what are our rivals product and what are they uh, making better as compared to our product and we try to compare it and we try to compete with it So first is product benchmarking. Our product should be of equal quality and equal features as compared to our um, uh, as compared to our competitors. Then competitive benchmarking. This has moved beyond product orientation. This also includes the processes. Okay, includes marketing, finance, HR, R and D department. So competitive benchmarking means we don't only compare our product with our competitors product but we also compare our processes with our competitors processes so what is the advertising process of our competitor we try to match up with him what is the finance process of our competitor we try to match up with him so you know this is a very common practice that you know finance department head of one organization switches to another organization switches to the competitor organization this happens quite often because competitor wants to know what is that particular organization doing in terms of their finances what is the steps that they are doing in terms of their finances the other organization wants to know so competitive benchmarking is even more high in um, uh, scope than product benchmarking in product benchmarking we are only comparing products in competitive benchmarking we are comparing products as well as processes processes are also getting uh, uh, benchmarked then process benchmarking activity of measuring performance functionality of business processes of organization with excellent similar business processes so guys um, uh, uh, you know competitive benchmarking was uh, comparing the functions and process benchmarking is comparing the processes with the best in town so both of them are similar both of them are similar competitive benchmarking and process benchmarking in which we are comparing our processes with the competitors processes internal benchmarking now in this particular benchmarking we are not comparing performance of our business with some other business we are comparing performance of our uh, you know one of the businesses with other businesses we are comparing that so we are comparing our um, uh, you know maybe our refrigeration business hr department with our um, uh, 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 cooling division business uh, hr department refrigeration versus ac department we are comparing hr of both of them hr of refrigeration department is doing very well and uh, the hr of ac department is not doing that well so this is known as internal benchmarking strategic benchmarking strategic benchmarking is a uh, uh, benchmarking which is operational benchmarking a higher version of operational benchmarking and in this we are uh, actually benchmarking our core competencies our all strategies which the business is doing and we are comparing it with the competitors so the strategy which uh, the competitors are adopting like you know price skimming strategy our competitor has a competitor has applied price skimming uh, uh, strategy so we are going to also adopt price skimming strategy in that particular case so we are developing the benchmark global benchmarking when we are benchmarking not only within indian competitors but also from outside competitors we are benchmarking so you know, this very much happens in um, uh, uh, quick sr quick qsr qsr what is quick sr what is qsr qsr is quick um, uh, uh, restaurant services so where you know something is served very quickly like mcdonalds and the table turnout is very uh, fast so in case of qsrs global benchmarking is done for example mcdonalds which is present in india it will benchmark its uh, quality its uh, ambiance its products with the mcdonalds which is located in united states of america this is the global benchmarking so global benchmarking is also done process of benchmarking how do you benchmark um, your product with your competitors product 
first of all we plan that is we determine the benchmark which we have set for ourselves we plan we determine the benchmark what is our benchmark what is our standard whether it is indian standard or it is outside standard collection of data and information we then collect the information to know what are the um, uh, you know requirements to reach to that benchmark analysis of findings we find the gap between our current performance and how to better the performance we um, uh, you know analyze the difference between our current performance and the future performance which we want to attain so analysis of finding then we have the recommendations how to bridge gap between our current performance and our benchmarked performance our goal we need to compare and recommend the improvement strategies then we monitor our success and we review our success occasionally um, that you know are we able to um, uh, are we able to uh, uh, you know attain the global uh, standards that we have always tried to attain are we attaining the global standards that is what we are going to monitor and review prerequisites of ben benchmarking what are the requirements in benchmarking how do we ensure that benchmarking is a success commitment is required from senior management that they will support in continuous improvement of benchmarking because sometimes you know senior management um, uh, invest money in benchmarking and then they do not uh, invest money in further improvement of uh, the products so commitment of senior manager is required that till the last stage of benchmarking their uh, financial support will be there their um, uh, recommendation support will be there then clarity of objective we should be clear about our objective where do we want to go what do we want to achieve they should be very very clear in terms of benchmark we should have a clear picture of our firm's performance then appropriate scope what is the scope of work what are we going to do to achieve this uh, firm's performance that is very very um, critical what are the resources which are required what are the time which is available all these things needs to be seen while um, uh, computing our firm's performance then what are the resources which are required this to be seen skills which are required for benchmarking and then communication we need to communicate our benchmarks to the stakeholders to our staff to everyone who will support us in achieving the benchmarks which we have set for ourselves we need to communicate the um, uh, benchmarks to our team just like guys you communicate your benchmark of completing cma final in june 2022 attempt to your parents to your cousins to your colleagues to your brothers and sisters you tell them that i'm not attending your birthday party why because i have to complete my studies and i have to become a cma you tell your cousin that i'm not attending your marriage why because i have to complete my cma i'm studying i don't want to waste time you tell your uh, mossa ji mossi ji mama ji mama mami ji that you know i cannot meet you quite often because my exams are round the corner you tell that so benchmarking needs communication to the entire stakeholders community you tell everyone that you are following this particular goal and therefore please do not disturb difficulties in implementation of benchmarking it, it is definitely a time consuming process first we set the benchmark then we work towards the benchmark it's a time consuming process sometimes management do not support in terms of money okay they don't even get themselves directly involved in the benchmarking process so you know benchmarking becomes difficult employees are resisting change there's a um, you know inherent limitation in employees that all the employees resist change they don't like changes so there's a residence resistance in employees with respect to uh, benchmarking paper goals sometimes uh, you know the other things the other requirements take over the uh, goals of benchmarking and the goals of benchmarking are are at a back seat they are not done uh, effectively so paper goals are there then copy paste attitude um, uh, you know the benchmarking which is available in market you generally copy paste that benchmarking in your company as well without realizing that your company is different from other companies this affects the benchmarking a lot this approach condemns benchmarking to fail leading to failure of benchmarking goals please understand that company every company is individual you cannot adopt someone else's benchmark so if reliance industries limited is doing very well in uh, petroleum business tatas cannot say that oh i will attain the same benchmark as reliance industries limited because tatas are not that good in um, uh, oil business tatas are uh, more good in hospitality business they are more good in uh, you know uh, fine cloth business so that is how the benchmarking is not copy paste is it it is not copy paste then what do you mean by bench trending bench trending is continuous monitoring of performance with the selected group of benchmarks when you continuously benchmark your uh, activities over a period of time and then you compare your benchmark over a period of time and you develop a trend that is known as brand bench trending what has been your success of benchmarking in last several years that is your bench trending
So bench trending is continuous monitoring of performance. That is bench trending. Then comes a very, very important topic of our syllabus, guys, management information system. Guys, management information system is a way to provide relevant information at the right time in the right uh, uh, format to all the users of the organization for effective decision making. So to decide upon the business, to decide upon the future, um, uh, to, to decide upon the future, Achha, Sharan, can you leave people invite me to invite me because I'm studying the whole day. Very good, Sharan. कोई बात नहीं शरण जब तुम सीएम में शरण बन जाओगी ना तब वो लोग जो अभी जिन्होंने तुम्हें इनवाइट करना छोड़ दिया ना वो तुम्हारे घर आके तुम्हें स्पेशली लेके जाएंगे और तुम्हारी अवेलेबिलिटी पूछ कर तुम तुम्हारा आ, आ, अपना प्रोग्राम डिसाइड करेंगे सो so, घबराना मत अगर लोगों ने पूछना छोड़ दिया तो मैनेजमेंट इन्फॉर्मेशन सिस्टम वॉट इज मैनेजमेंट इन्फॉर्मेशन सिस्टम टू प्रोवाइड राइट इन्फॉर्मेशन एट द राइट टाइम एट द राइट फॉर्मैट टू द रेलिवेंट डिसीजन मेकर्स दैट इज द मैनेजमेंट इन्फॉर्मेशन सिस्टम और ये Management information system is um, uh, given in various ways, guys. There are there are various tools like you know barcoding and decoding is there for inventory management. Barcodes are there for uh, you know inventory. Uh, what inventory is getting diluted? What inventory new is coming? All this is given in barcodes. Then programmable logic controller. Um, now these are also techniques of um, uh, you know effective uh, MIS. You will maintain a database of what inventories are getting sold, what inventories are getting purchased. So all these things will help you in maintaining a database of the inventories or fixed assets or anything like guys SAP Oracle, the ERPs which are there. These are the databases. So management, if management wants to know what is the gross profit in the current year, they can quickly get this information from SAP or Oracle. Financial and non-financial data is there on SAP or Oracle. So these are the modes of uh, collecting data in case of MIS and data is required to make decisions. So what decisions would MIS make? So guys, top level management, uh, you will use MIS for generate accurate, liable, reliable, timely, comprehensive information to top management. So MIS will give reliable information to top management with respect to anything. Through simulation models, MIS will assist top management in planning their work activities like developing financial models. Financial models are developed on the basis of simulations on the basis of data. Top management will need data for simulations. Top management will need data for test impact of idea strategies formulated on future profitability. Whatever new has been introduced, whether that is successful or not, how would management know about it? By seeing the data of profits. If profits have increased, strategy has been successful. If profits are not increased, strategy has not been successful. Then potential imp impact of customers, computers uh, would be more in the area of planning and decision making. So computers will form an important area of MIS. Um, of course, without computers, MIS is not imaginable in today's world. Then how would middle level management be, uh, you know, getting information from MIS? At this level, decisions will be programmed and thus will be made by the computer like inventory control system. So uh, the middle level management will be more bothered about the functions of the organization. Okay, they will not be involved in strategic decision making like top level management. So what will middle level management do? They will look at purchases. They will look at issue. They will look at balances which are there. They will look at when to reorder the uh, inventory, etc., etc. And what will the supervisory level do? At the level of um, you know execution level, they will uh, be uh, concerned with the day-to-day -day decisions. Day-to-day -day routine decisions will be seen. Um, uh, they will control the time, comprehensive, suitable uh, reports are there at the managers to control the uh, functions and operations. Then, with the help of computers, the future. Um, uh, you know, um, all the controls will be employed by the supervisory level. So supervisory level will also benefit from MIS in terms of their workings. Okay. Then what are the objectives of M MIS? To provide timely and accurate information. To highlight critical factors in operations of business. To develop systematic and regular process for communication. How do, uh, you know, the organizations uh, within organization, how do you communicate? Communication will be seamless in case of MIS because, you know, um, what inventory has been purchased during the current day that will automatically reach the production manager um, uh, easily. Production man manager doesn't need to uh, call the purchase manager to know what is the inventory which has been purchased. It will be fed in the system and the uh, production manager will take out the details from the system. So communication will be very, very easy. Then decision making will become smooth. Services to the customers will be given in a more efficient manner. Competitive advantage will be there in case of MIS. Then provide information to support business planning of future. 
all right sir so these are the benefits of olap um uh, this is the this is the benefit of mis so guys after mis there are more advanced technologies for saving data there are databases which are created and there are more advanced technologies whereby data is not only created but it is also analyzed so mis is more concerned with storing the data and retrieving the data but these techniques like olap they not only store and retrieve the data but they also process the data they will give you the reports which you desire olap will do that so olap is a very good tool to um, uh, analyze the data through fast consistent interactive access to wide variety of possible views of information it's a multi uh, uh, multi dimensional data base which interact with multiple perspectives so olap tools are uh, the tools which are used for data processing along with data storage they also process the data along with data storage they also process the data okay sir so olap server is a high capacity multi user data manipulation engine specifically designed to support the multi dimensional data structure so this is the data structure olap supports this data structure it can store multi dimensional data easily now there are different types of uh, olap there are multi dimensional olap there is a relationship olap there is a hybrid olap there are other olaps so what are multi dimensional uh, olap multi dimensional olap means these olaps are online analytical processes full form is online analytical processes and they can have data from multiple sources multiple type of data can be stored in olaps multi dimensional data can be stored in olaps olaps can have data of uh, uh, various kinds their multi dimensional data can be stored relational olap it works directly with relational the olap the database and dimensions tables are stored in relation tables new tables are created to hold aggregate information so you know uh, relationship olap also connects data of two types it also connects data so for example you know details of employees are saved in um, uh, one of the sections and the details of sales is also saved, saved in another section so to connect these two databases we will see how many employees have sold how much uh, uh, quantity of product they can be connected together so relationship relational uh, olap connects two set of datas it connects two set of datas that is relation olap then hybrid olap hybrid olap can be uh, used as a relationship uh, olap it can be used as a, um, a, a multi dimensional olap it can be used as any kind of olaps um, it can be used so hybrid olap means where multiple olaps are combined the features of multiple olaps are combined together other olaps are volap molap desktop olap so these are all olaps these are all analytical procedures which help in data processing in various um, uh, uh, you know uh, areas like in mobile it's mobile olap desktop olap net net what is it net net it is guys that you know we need to analyze data we need to churn out the data that churning is very much important for example you know um, i have a app in my mobile which tells me how many hours have i spent in each of the apps how many hours have i spent on each of the apps so this is an example of molap this is an example of molap i have a, a, a mobile olap which is analyzing my use of my mobile phone in various apps so in whatsapp these many hours are used in facebook these many hours are used in instagram these many hours are used um now on text messages these many hours are used this is the uh, molap so there's a system in my phone which is not only saving data but also churning out data processing data saving data example is uh, the phone book that i have phone directory that is not churning data it is just saving data and retrieving data whenever i want to call someone i will tell the phone that please call this person it will uh, call that particular person so it's only storing data and retrieving data however in case of my app which is even processing data it is showing me how many hours have i uh, uh, you know uh, spend on each of the apps on a percentage basis it is showing me that is a olap which is also analyzing data for me it is not only showing the uh, hours which are spent by me but it is also showing the percentage of consumption of battery Uh, which is their consumption of uh, uh, time which is there all those things are uh, done by olap okay sir got it next or uh, next tool of productivity and profitability improvement is mrp1 mrp2 and erp now the only objective is to improve the productivity and profitability of an organization three tools are mrp1 mrp2 and erp mrp1 is the oldest tool the name is material require <coughs> requirement planning <coughs> mrp1 is 
material requirement planning it was introduced in 1970 then 1980 manufacturing resource planning 1980 manufacturing resource planning 1990 erp erp is the latest version this is the oldest version this is the second version so the aim of these tools are to give um, you know a, a consolidated database to the management to store all its uh, production related information like material requirement planning is the tool which gives um, uh, the businessman an idea about what inventory is lying in the warehouse how much is required how much should be bought how much is there on the uh, production line that is the material requirement planning so mrp1 <clears throat> is a technique which aims to ensure that material resources like raw material bought in components in house sub assembles are made available just before they are needed we should not have shortfall of any of the material that is the aim of mrp1 we should not have shortfall of any of the materials that is the aim of mrp1 so mrp1 it determines for final product what should be the produced what should be produced and at what time should it be produced mrp tells us uh, when should the final uh, uh, good be produced it also tells us the situation of sub assemblies which are there bill of material is updated or not what are the material requirements on bill of material it also calculates inventories work in progress batch size etc so yes these are the uh, uh, uses of mrp okay so guys features are also very simple of mrp yes data requirement of mrp is the next thing that we need to discuss an important aspect what are the data requirements for mrp we need to plan our um, uh, material requirement in such a way that material is never in a shortfall so the data requirement is what is the production schedule of our uh, uh, production how many fixed as fixed uh, how many finished goods are produced um, on day 1 how many fish, finished goods are produced on day 2 so the book pdf is shared on the description of the link which is given below the book in the description section a link is given there the book is there so we need the production schedule we need the bill of material so while making one finished goods what quantity of raw material one is required what quantity of raw material two is required what quantity of raw material three is required that is the bill of material which is uh, required by us then inventory file is required so how much inventory is there for each of these raw material for which the finished goods is produced routing file is required what is the sequence of operations required to manufacture components that is required then master parts file <clears throat> contains information about production time of sub assemblies and component produced internally lead time of externally procured items so um, the master part files will tell us that what components are produced and how much time will it require for the raw material to purchase and to get to the warehouse these are the uh, things which are uh, to be um, ascertained in master parts file method of operation of mrp this is very very simple guys okay this is uh, not very very difficult benefits of mrp is a repeat now we directly come on to mrp2 mrp2 is the abridged version or a better version of uh, material resource planning so in mrp1 the only focus was on material in mrp1 the only focus was on material raw material inventory finished goods bomb the focus was on material however in case of mrp2 the focus was on the entire manufacturing resource planning so apart from the material what are the resources that are required in manufacturing of course we require, require people we require tools and equipments we require machinery apart from raw material we require several other things so mrp2 was a broader concept a wider concept whereby not only the material requirement was ascertained but the entire infrastructure or entire um, uh, uh, you know requirements which are there for manufacturing process as a whole was to be ascertained so this is the second part which is manufacturing resource planning it utilizes software application for coordinating manufacturing processes from product planning part purchasing inventory control to product distribution everything is there in um, manufacturing uh, uh, planning so mrp2 will include a production interface which will include raw material okay equipments which are required to produce machinery which is required to produce human resource which is required to produce this is all included in production interface then marketing interface which means whatever has been produced how will it be sold and the third one is accounting inter interface how will the produce whatever is being produced and uh, sold 
how will it be recorded in the books of accounts how will it be recorded in the books of accounts in the accounts so mrp2 contained three uh, uh, elements mrp1 contained only one element material they only focus on material mrp2 contained focus on production marketing and accounting mrp2 is wider in scope as compared to mrp1 because the function uh, functions which are there are much more higher so mrp2 systems will first demand uh, forecast will be there then production planning will be done resource planning will be done how much resource is required for producing a particular good uh, rough cut capacity planning will be done what is the capacity what is the master production schedule we'll ascertain it bill of material material requirement so all those things are there in uh, mrp2 it is much wider in scope apart from material we are also seeing other things which are required in manufacturing process that is mrp2 and yes guys mrp1 mrp2 are things of past now now we have the much coveted and the much amazing erps guys forget about only manufacturing process erps integrate hr department production department manufacturing department marketing department finance department sales department um planning department all the departments are integrated by mrp so mrp1 focused only on material mrp2 focused only on finance uh, marketing and production ERP focuses on the entire organization. It knits the entire organization in one thread. This is the um, best part of ERP. And ERP is the most successful thing in today's world. SAP, Oracle, are, these are the most successful thing in today's world. They provide integrated business software modules to support functional units of enterprise like order fulfillment, material procurement, balance sheet preparation, etc. And attempts to integrate various functions of an enterprise involved in execution of these processes. So various um, elements of the uh, enterprise are being integrated for uh, execution of the processes in case of ERP. ERP has the ability of fulfillment of needs of specific departments, functions. So whatever needs are there for a specific department, they are fulfilled by ERP. ERP will take care of all the requirements of a particular department. So for example, you know, um, if HR department is hiring some people, ERP would have information on who are being hired, who are being, um, uh, you know, uh, inducted in the organization, ERP will have that information also. So ERP is very, very flexible. It, uh, uh, you know, integrates all the functions of the management, all the functions of the organization is integrated in ERP. So ERP is very, very flexible. It's modular and open which means its interface can be attached or detached without affecting rest of the modules. It has various modules like finance module, like production module, like marketing module, it has various modules. So uh, you can use any of the modules which you require and uh, exclude any of the module which you don't require. It's comprehensive, which means it uh, supports all the organization functions. It supports all the organization functions. So it is comprehensive. It supports all the organization functions and is suitable for wide range of business organizations. Then it is beyond the company. It is not only confined to the company, but it can also integrate the debtors of the company, the creators of the company. It can create online, uh, you know, a connect between the company and the debtors of the company. So debtors can see their outstanding balance in the ERP of the company. That is the beauty of the ERP. It's beyond the company. Even the debtors can enter into your uh, financial uh, financial uh, module only in the debtors section to see their dues in the company. That is the benefit of uh, ERP. It goes beyond the company. Best business practice. It is the best business practice in town and it is the most effective business practice in town. Integration. It, in it, in it integrates functions like manufacturing, procurement, sales, distribution, everything is in integrated in ERP. Everything is put together in ERP. Then it has add-ons also, many uh, separate things are also there. What are the benefits of ERP? It lowers the cost. It reduces paper and postage consumption. It improves productivity of process. It uh, uh, leads to inventory reduction. Why? Because now no huge amount of inventory should be stored. ERP will tell you whenever the inventory is below the EOQ, you can order the ER inventory then. So inventory cost is reduced. Lead time is reduced. So the time of retrieving data is very much reduced. The time of connecting between two departments is reduced. Stock obsolescence is reduced. So there are many benefits, tangible and tangible benefits of the ERP. Now, this is very, very important, guys. Sometimes ERP fails. What are the reasons of failure of ERP? What, what are the reasons uh, why ERP fails? Lack of effective project management. 
ERP is such a huge project that if each and every department of the organization doesn't work relentlessly for this execution, this will not be successful. So ERP is to be implemented widely across the organization. Lack of effective project management is the first reason of failure of ERP. Inability to resolve issues, making decision on a timely manner. So ERP requires decision to be made on a timely manner, in a quick manner. Resources not available when needed. Perceived or real lack of executive support. Sometimes, you know, top management support is not there in implementing ERP. They find it as a burden. They find it as a challenge. So that is why it fails. Software fail to means business needs. Sometimes the software is not uh, customized to meet the business. Then underestimate level of change of management. So the change which is uh, required by the management that we are not able to comprehend because there's a lot of change which is required in, while implementing SAP. Improper communication, insufficient end user training. Training is not given to the user. Communication is not done about the ERP to the junior levels or senior levels. Future gap analysis, etc., etc. So these are the certain um, uh, you know disadvantages of using ERP. Now we move on to the next topic, which is total productivity management. Now we have seen how to manage our data through MIS, through ERP, through MRP. We manage our data. Now let's see how do you manage your productivity. How do you manage that your productivity is up to the mark? Now productivity and quality. Productivity and quality are two things that we need to manage well. Our productivity should be good and our quality of goods should also be good. So TPM is the management process developed for improvement in productivity by making processes more reliable and less wasteful. So it is the management process for developing the productivity. Productivity is improved in TPM. Productivity is improved and the processes are less wasteful. Objective of TPM is to maintain the plant and equipment in good condition without interfering with daily processes. That is the fundamental of TPM. So guys, uh, this is just for your information. Okay. There are eight things which TPM requires. So if you want to control your productivity, you have to control your maintenance. First of all, there are three kinds of maintenance that you need to control in your machine. Okay. okay. Because productivity is directly related to your machine. If your machine is in a good condition, your productivity will, will be well. So your maintenance should be of three types. Autonomous maintenance, which, which uh, you know, uh, arises when it needs. Planned maintenance, we anyways maintain our, um, uh, maintain our uh, machinery even when it is working in the perfect condition. Then quality maintenance. Sometimes to improve the quality, we maintain um, the machine even when maintenance is not required. But we maintain it. We do some repair maintenance in it so that the quality is increased. So these are the first three legs of productivity management. Then focus improvement is required. We need to focus on which area do we need to improve. Early equipment maintenance, you can maintain the equipment early even when the due date has not come. Training education is a important part of productivity improvement. Productivity will increase, increase only if the employees are trained on how to use the machinery. Safety, health and uh, issues are there. And office TPM is very, very important. Office TPM means how to maintain productivity in office. How to uh, not waste the resources in office. That is very, very important in case of total productivity management. Total productivity is to be managed by the company. The entire office should be. Example of ERP. Example of ERP is uh, SAP, SAP or Oracle. So what is there in Oracle? It's a software which not only has your financial information, but also has your HR related information. How many employees are there in the company as a whole? What is their salary? It also has information on inventory. What inventory has been purchased during the uh, month? So earlier there were separate softwares to control all these things. ERP will ensure that in one software, we control all the things like finance module is there, like production module is there, like HR module is there. All the things are controlled by one software, which is ERP. And the example of ERP is SAP or um, uh, Oracle. These are two famous ERPs of the world. All right, sir. So what are the benefits of productivity management? So the benefits of productivity management is a set of new management goals will be developed by the management. Management will uh, look at productivity in a very new way. So new goals will be developed. Team bonding and better accountability will be there. Improved quality, total cost competitiveness will be there. Productivity is there. So these are the various benefits of total productivity management. Okay, sir. Yes, now we move on to a very, very important aspect, guys. Total quality management. And please note that a practical question from this particular aspect came in December 2021. In December 2021, a practical aspect 
a practical question from this particular topic came total quality management how to manage quality of a particular um uh, uh, you know organization a practical question came so i have done practical questions in my class for this particular topic you also must do it this practical question in your book study mat of the institute as well please do that practical question because this topic is not only relevant from a theory standpoint but also from a practical standpoint now what do you mean by quality guys quality means to eliminate the loss which results from defective units defective units should not give us loss defective units should be minimized because defective units are the reasons for loss so defective units should be minimized so total quality management is uh, directly related to defective units the units which are defective uh, those defective units should be reduced to increase the quality not only designed to build quality in the product but also restrict the defectives and inspect and rectify them principle of tqmr first of all customer focus we need to focus on what do customer require what level of quality is required by the customer sometime customer doesn't require high quality but it requires a medium level quality at a reasonable price so the focus will be on customers what quality of goods do they require managerial leadership is definitely required in case of uh, tqm because management will only formulate the strategic plan which will ensure that quality is a key ingredient of our plan so the strategic plan should contain quality as a core component in it belief in continuous improvement so you know total quality management will only happen when continuously you thrive to have higher quality continuously so continual improvement drives an organization to be both analytic and creative in a constant way so continuous improvement is required so what are the steps in tqm what are the things that we do in tqm first of all we identify the customers or customer gr groups we should identify a major customers and we need to also uh, uh, analyze their um, identification so uh, we need to identify uh, the customers the main customers and we need to take decision on which customer issues are more critical we need to analyze the critical customer issues with respect to quality then we need to identify the customer expectation what is the expectation of our customer with respect to quality then uh, the identification of customer decision making requirement and product utility we identify the need of the customer and follow their suggestions whatever suggestions they make we need to follow those suggestions so customer decision making is required identification of perceived problems in decision making process so what are the problems which a customer feels that are there so shortcomings are identified problem areas are identified in providing the quality uh, product which customer requires comparing the organizations and benchmarks so we will compare our performance our quality with other firms uh, quality and other firms benchmark we'll take some feedback from the customer whatever pro problems are there were they resolved now identification of improvement and opportunity we will identify what is the improvement opportunity um, which is there what uh, improvement um, uh, is required in our product whatever is the improvement which is required we will um, uh, give that particular improvement to the customer and the improvement will be given using this praise praise okay this is a six step process problem identification ranking analysis innovation solution evaluation so first we'll identify the problem then we will rank the problem based on which problem is high which problem is low then we'll analyze the problem we'll innovate some ways to reduce the problem finally we'll provide the solution to the customer and we'll evaluate whether the solution worked well or not this is the praise level so these are the processes which are steps which are there in tqm so there are certain other quality tools certain other ways to improve the quality of um, our products or our processes number one is strategic statistical quality control so guys statistics is one tool which is used a lot for quality control okay statistics you have already studied in your um, uh, you know junior classes statistical tools are used to monitor and maintain the quality of the product please underline whatever i am underlining in my notes so to monitor and maintain quality of the product statistical statistical tools may be used so statistical techniques may be employed uh, to determine whether the process is functioning as desired or not so guys you know uh, statistical tools like decision making we had done in our om in our intermediate okay decision tree decision making or uh, some sort of uh, uh, flow charts which are used for decision problem solving they are the statistical tool then acceptance sampling we uh, always uh, you know uh, take some samples out of the total items and we uh, test them 
whether they are quality uh, approved or not and the uh, uh, you know rejection should be at the least the rejections which are there should be at the least so acceptance sampling is done while analyzing the quality of a particular product then statistical process control example of olap uh, so you know um, uh, just like erp is there erp uh, uh, you know integrates all the functions of the organization like hr like finance like um, a production like marketing like distribution erp is a co conglomeration of all the functions right olap is not a, a, a function of all the um, uh, functions it is not a, a, a accumulation of all the functions it just focuses on a software which is used to process data i gave you two examples okay in my mobile phone there are two things number one my phone book my phone book just allows me to save data and retrieve data whenever i require it okay so that is not olap because it is not analytically processing the data it is just a method of feeding the data and retrieving the data it is not olap what is olap olap is that in my mobile phone i've got a tool which will tell me what percentage of time first of all how much time has i have i spent in the phone and what percentage of time has been spent on which tool which app was it a social media app what is a health app was it a communication app so this is the analysis which is done by olap so there are two kind of things one is mis mis will only save data and retrieve data that is the only purpose of mis just like our mobile phone books phone books will save data will save names of my contacts and will retrieve name whenever i require okay that is mis olap is they will not only uh, save data and retrieve data but also process data for me they will churn out data for me that is known as olap analytical process it's a analytical process i hope you understood lavanya paruchuri all right so yes uh, statistical measure statistical process control statistical process control um, a very important statistical process control is six sigma technique okay sigma technique there are control limits in sigma technique okay there are control limits in sigma sigma technique standard deviation is there so guys um, you know in uh, 2019 a practical question from this particular aspect came in the examination this is a practical formula which is applied in your um, uh, uh, practical questions so in 2019 there was a practical 2019 or 2018 there was a practical question which came from this particular formula but nothing to worry guys um, i have done that question in my class you should also do that one question with you but i don't think that is going to repeat i don't think a practical question from this particular aspect can come again because um, that was once that it came but you need not remember this entire formula because it is not that important but yes one question if you can it's a very very easy question just apply this formula and uh, compute the standard deviation it's a very very easy formula which you can easily um, uh, you know um, uh, learn then is the six sigma methodology guys six sigma methodology ensures that uh, your uh, your uh, output is perfect there is no defect zero defect six sigma technology aims at zero defect there should not be any defect in any of the product although it is very very difficult to achieve zero defect it is not possible that you are doing some production and there is no defect but six sigma technology has proved that it can be uh, uh, reduced to a very very bare minimum level like one percent or 0.1 percent or 0.6 percent the defectives can be reduced to very very zero or negligible levels this has been proved by six sigma technology like 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 do you see this runway this is the width of the landing strip okay if the pilot always lands within half the landing strip width we can say that pilot has six sigma capability so the aim is that on this half of the strip the pilot should land pilot should not use the uh, broader width pilot should always land on this particular area if the pilot always lands on this area then we will say that he has six sigma capabilities that he is not showing any defect he is not showing any perfect uh, he is not showing any defect any problem so six sigma means you do whatever you do you do it with perfection you do it with absolute accuracy this is the concept of six sigma technology okay sir got it yes six sigma methodology has got certain methods within it with it within it dm aic dm adv both were uh, inspired by w edwards demings okay so dm ac and dm a d v so dm ac means define measure analyze improve control this is the five step process which has been prescribed by six sigma to control your defects to a very minimal level 
Number one is define the process. Whatever process improvement you want to do, define that process improvement. You measure the current process and collect the relevant data for future co co uh, comparison. So you collect whatever uh, you know output you are generating today. So you measure the current process. You analyze the relationship and casualty of fa factors. You analyze the difference between the current performance and the future performance. You improve and optimize the process. Whatever process you are improving and optimizing. Control the variances which are there in future. So whatever you had um, decided as a goal for you and versus whatever is the actual uh, which has been earned, you compare both of them and whatever is the difference, you control the variances. Please see this diagram. So you identify opportunity. You identify uh, the measure, the output that you want to obtain. You analyze the current situation and future situation. You improve uh, the current situation and you finally control the uh, development which you have made. So DMAIC is converted into an equation. Output is a function of input. Output is a function of input. The next Six Sigma technology is a little detailed. Define, measure, identify, analyze, design, verify. This is a detailed method of uh, Six Sigma technology. So define the goal, measure and identify the critical two qualities uh, areas, analyze to develop and design the alternatives. Final phase, the team validates and verify the design acceptable to all stakeholders. Again, guys, same same principle, guys, that we need to uh, have a have a, a streamlined way of reducing our defects. Quality should be improved. And how will quality be improved? Quality be quality will be improved when the defects are reduced. So the, our attempt should be to reduce the defects as much as possible. The reduction in defects is the core um, uh, analysis behind Six Sigma. The defects should be reduced to the minimum level. So these are the people who are involved in Six Sigma technology. What role is to be given to what people in Six Sigma technology? I'm not going through this role as of now because this is a very straightforward role. So for example, executive leadership should be um, uh, given, uh, CEO should be given the role of the top leader in case of Six Sigma uh, hierarchy. Then champions, champions are, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, given the responsibility of implementing Six Sigma in the organization. And these champions are generally executive leaders. The upper management are the champions. Executive leaders, what do executive leaders do? They set up the vision for Six Sigma. So who is the uh, person who is responsible for doing thing and what is the thing to be done, done in Six Sigma? Uh, that is uh, defined by this particular hierarchy. Okay. So there are masters, there are experts, there are black belts. These are all different people having different responsibilities in Six Sigma implementation. Green belts, yellow belts, etc. Then Stewart's cycle of plan, do, check, act. So this is a technique which has been uh, adopted by Stewart. Plan, do, check, act. P D C A. Plan, establish the objectives and processes that are necessary to deliver the results. Do implement these processes, processes of quality control. Check whether these processes and results are according to what objectives you want. Check the results which are attained. Act. Apply the outcome for necessary improvement. Whatever necessary improvement you want, you apply your um, uh, you apply your um, uh, brain on it and act accordingly. Then five. If concepts of quality management, is important, guys, for managing the quality, there are five Japanese concepts which are very very important. So first is Siri. Siri. Siri means sort and organize. In English, it is known as sort and organize. So uh, distinguish between necessary and unnecessary things and getting rid of what you don't need. So see this before Siri, see this after Siri. Before Siri, you had a lot of wastage in your room. After Siri, you had only the important things in your room. So Siri is organize and sort. That is one of the important ways of managing your quality. Quality will improve under this circumstance. The quality will improve under this uh, kind of uh, environment. Then Satan. Satan means neatness and orderly storage. So everything should be at the right place. Okay. Everything has a right place and there should be no wastage. So orderly storage is the key of Saturn. So if you see this, uh, uh, see this box, all the equipments are there in the proper storage areas so that whenever they are required, they can be retrieved easily. This is the second uh, 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 technology, which is Satan. Then it's say so. Say so means everything should be clean. Garbage, dirt, dust, uh, dirt, leakages should not be there. So you see these two uh, things you observe. Please observe. 
in this pick there is a uh, there is a rusting which has happened rusting has happened and it is all dirty in this pick no rusting is there everything is um, you know maintained well cleanliness is there neatness is there so neatness is the key of seso then seketsu seketsu is standardization everything is to be done in a standardized manner every process should be done in a normal uh, standardized manner so all the departments should uh, have neat and clean work place and there should be standard which is developed standard means you know um, the cleanliness will happen uh, twice every week twice every week the uh, floor should be wiped off the table should be wiped off twice every week it should happen so cleanliness standards are developed based on seketsu then shitsuke shitsuke means discipline you should have disciplined uh, approach towards processes implementing behavior and habits to maintain established standards over the longer term managing process of success this is known as shitsuke and guys very very important and someone was asking in the notes also uh, in the chat box also very very important topic please mark this topic as very very important because this topic will definitely be um, there in your examination either in theoretical uh, part or in practical part relevant for theoretical part as well as practical part both the parts are relevant in this particular analysis do pont analysis do pont analysis is a very very important analysis from an exam standpoint now guys let me directly take you to the main equation of do pont analysis okay so ultimately what do organizations work for they work for return on equity what do ultimately uh, the organization want they want return on equity on the equity they should earn high returns that is the ultimate objective of any and every organization return on equity now return on equity can be measured by using a simple formula which is net profit divided by total equity net profit divided by total equity infusion this is return on equity formula now dupont has bifurcated this formula into three parts net profit margin multiplied by sales divided by total uh, assets turnover multiplied by financial leverage so net profit margin means net income divided by sales asset turnover ratio means sales divided by total assets and financial leverage means total assets divided by total equity if i multiply all three okay sales get cancelled by sales total assets gets cancelled by total assets and what are we left with we are left with net income divided by total equity and this is the formula of return on equity so according to dupont return on equity is a summation of three factors net profit margin should be appropriate then return of equity will be good asset turnover ratio should be appropriate which means sales quantity as compared to total assets should be high to improve your return on equity and last financial leverage should be appropriate financial leverage should be um, uh, high to um, you know improve your return on equity so return on equity is a accumulation of three factors a net profit margin b asset turnover ratio and three financial leverage this is the formulatic formal formal uh, formulation of roe now what says is the company can increase its roe if it generates high net profit margin it effectively uses its assets to generate more sales which means asset turnover ratio should be more sales divided by total assets should be more third it has high financial leverage it is it should use uh, uh, debt a lot of debt in its um, uh, um, uh, capital structure so financial leverage should be high if all these things three things are high then return of equity will automatically be high so in your examination guys you will be asked to analyze a particular performance of a particular organization's roe in terms of dupont analysis it means you have to bifurcate the roe into three ratios and you have to analyze the performance of each of the ratio to comment on whether roe is performing well or not this is the uh do pont analysis a practical question come can come from this particular concept a theoretical portion can come from this particular concept both of the questions are possible that you know ro is to be bifurcated into three parts net profit margin asset turnover ratio financial leverage if you multiply all three it will yield the same result it will yield um roe as the um, uh, answer okay so what i do is i cut sales from sales sales and sales will cancel out with each other total assets and total assets will cancel out with each other what we are left with left with is net income divided by total equity net income divided by total equity which is roi so roi increase or decrease can be analyzed using three components and these are those three components and this is the dupont analysis 
which can be asked by you in the examination and yes we are done with our chapter number 2 as well and a lengthy one guys a lengthy one so let me ask all of you after chapter number 2 how's the josh in the house how are you feeling now how's the josh now we are left with only one chapter which is risk management which is a small one okay how's the josh yes we still have a lot of people who are uh, online and are willing to really clear their examination to the fullest extent they are willing to um, you know work hard towards their desired goals of successfully completing the examination thank you for dupont sir ji yes welcome dheeraj so how's the josh how's josh with everyone how are you um uh, are you are you excited for starting the new chapter or should we leave the new chapter for next uh, class should we do the next chapter tomorrow should we defer the new next chapter should we leave it to the next class or should we do it right now should we do the third chapter right now which is risk management one of the most important chapters of your syllabus guys risk management should we do it right now or should we defer it to a future period like tomorrow or day after tomorrow should we defer it let's see how many students are saying let's do it right now how many students are saying let's defer it please complete today krishna is saying shruti is saying right now brilliant krishna is saying right now today only right now right away dheeraj is saying right now right away <laughs> good sharan singh kal kare so aaj kar <laughs> let's do it today all right guys let's start our next chapter risk management after taking a 5 minutes break just a 5 minutes break we'll come back and start our chapter on risk management which is most important chapter for theory point of view as well as practical point of view i will not touch base the practical uh, uh, chapter i will touch base the theoretical chapter so let's start chapter number 3 in uh, chapter number 4 in just 5 minutes 5 minutes break
All right, guys. Let's gather back and let's start our next chapter, which is risk management. Yes, let's start the next chapter. Let's gather back. We have taken a break, and now let's start the next chapter. And the next chapter is enterprise risk management. A very very important chapter. and surprisingly this chapter is important not only from a theoretical perspective but also from a uh, practical perspective so from both the perspectives this chapter is very very important enterprise risk management all right this is enterprise risk management all right yes so let's start enterprise risk management before i start enterprise risk management i need to uh, tell you what do you mean by risk what do you mean by risk now for this i need some volunteers yes i have siddharth pokhrel okay siddharth pokhrel is with us so guys siddharth pokhrel is one of the students of my class and assumingly assumingly he likes one girl of the class okay he is very fond of one of the girls of the class and one fine day he decided to propose that girl okay he wanted a yes from that girl he proposed that girl with a flower in his hand with a red rose in his hand he went to the girl and he proposed that girl that uh, you know uh, can you be my girlfriend i really like you siddharth pokhrel is uh, one of the guys who proposed a girl of my class now what was siddharth expecting what was siddharth expecting siddharth was expecting that um, uh, you know that girl will say a yes to him okay his proposal will be accepted this was the expectation of siddharth but guys what can go wrong what can be the probable uh, you know uh, option what can go wrong please write in the chat box what can happen what can happen apart from what is expected what is expected the expectation is that siddharth will receive a yes the his proposal will be accepted okay but what can go wrong what can happen otherwise what is the probability that you know something else can happen what is that something else what else can happen to siddharth apart from getting a acceptance in his proposal what else can happen to siddharth being rejected yes rejection at worst absolutely arun is right shruti is right being rejected so now what is risk risk is not attaining what you have desired for that is known as risk कुट गया होगा अ ब्यूटिफुल स्लैप विल रिसीव नाउ नाउ स्टूडेंट्स आर बिकमिंग वॉयेंट एंड दे आर गोइंग टू एक्सट्रीम्स सुयोग मालपुरे सिंह अ ब्यूटिफुल स्लैप ही विल रिसीव कुटा गया होगा धीरज कुमार से कुटा गया होगा कुटा मीन्स टू गेट यू नो रेप्रिमांडेड टू गेट बीटन अप धीरज कुमार सिंह मार 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 पिटाई हो गई होगी उसके साथ ओके दीज आर द एक्सट्रीम uh negatives but what is the point the point is that risk refers to the probabilities of adverse impact of an action whatever action you take what if the action does not yield the desired result what if the action yields an opposite result that is risk that is known as risk so risk is that probability of not obtaining the desired results whatever results we want we do not obtain that result what is the probability of that that is known as risk now similarly what do you mean by enterprise risk guys enterprise risk means or an enterprise is working towards profit towards attaining profit what is the probability that it incurs losses rather they are working towards certain objectives like customer satisfaction what if the customer is not satisfied at all the the organization is working towards shareholder satisfaction what if shareholders are not satisfied at all there is a risk attached to everything there is a risk attached to everything this is known as enterprise risk so the risk that enterprise does not um uh, uh, receive what it desires of is known as risk enterprise risk in broad term risk involves exposure to some time of danger and possibility of loss or injury in general risk can apply to your physical health job security in finance investing risk often um uh, you know has a chance that outcome of investment actual gain will differ from the expected outcome actual gain is different expected outcome is different that is known as risk so risk is not attaining what you have desired for that is known as risk 
Now, how can you manage risk? <clears throat> how can you manage risk? Number one, you can accept risk. Just accept risk. That is, this risk is obviously there. So when uh, 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 Siddharth goes to that girl, he knows that he has a risk of being slapped or being hit by a sandal and having a black mark over here on his right cheek. So this risk is always always there. So first, uh, uh, you know, a way of dealing with risk is you bear the risk. To an extent, you bear the risk. You know that business is risky. So you bear the risk to a certain extent. Then next way is you avoid risk. You avoid risk. You know, um, uh, you know, you avoid taking risky stance. You avoid taking risky decisions. Like, you know, a sailor do not go to uh, high waters because of high tides. There's a risk over there. So a sailor does not go uh, over there. So risk avoidance. You avoid risk. You do not do those activities which are risky. Next is risk minimization. You arrange some uh, ways in which risk can be minimized. So you have fire uh, extinguishers in your office. You have fire extinguishers all around. Fire extinguishers will make sure that fire, if, even if fire breaks up, then the risk, uh, the loss will be minimal. So risk minimization can happen or you can share risk. So insurance companies uh, does this these things uh, very efficiently. They share risk. So risk sharing is the fourth way of managing risk so risk management has four elements to it risk bearing risk avoidance risk minimization and risk sharing what is the difference between risk avoidance and risk diversification what is the difference between these two risk risk avoidance and risk diversification risk avoidance is elimination of threat that can negatively affect the desired outcome so you totally do not enter into those activities where there is any kind of threat <clears throat> this is risk avoidance risk diversification means you um, uh, mitigate risk by um, uh, you know diversifying so for example if i am willing to invest my money somewhere i know that shares investment is risky so a i will avoid investing in shares or b i will only employ a pro proportion of my investment in shares balance i will employ in mutual funds and rest i will employ in fixed deposits okay so this is the strategy of risk diversification in risk avoidance i will not invest in shares at all i will not invest in risky propositions at all i will only invest in the safe investments like fixed deposits however in case of risk diversification i will employ in various um, investments um, in a different proportion so that my risk is diversified risk avoidance strategy is designed to deflect as many risks as possible we are avoiding the risk risk diversification we are not putting all eggs in one basket. Then it is not possible to 100% eliminate the risk. It is possible to diversify the risk to a great extent. Its aim is to avoid costly disruptive consequences of damaging events. And it, its aim is to take exposure only in one area. Exposures are taken in different areas so that one is not hurt if something goes wrong. So in this, the damaging event is avoided altogether. Damaging event is avoided altogether. In this particular scenario, damaging event is minimized. Damaging event is minimized and the event is uh, equally distributed in various other, uh, uh, you know, risk uh, also. So now what are the risks which are faced by an enterprise or even an individual? These are the risks which are faced by enterprise or individual. Political risk. The risk of political events, political parties coming in um, play. So, you know, uh, a, a war between India and Pakistan will lead to some business risk. Some business might be adversely affected. Korea, US uh, uh, dispute, which is there, it may severely affect the uh, export trades. So political risk is the first kind of risk. Then country risk, risk which are related to a particular country, event which happens in a particular country. Like, uh, you know, uh, the government of North Korea has refined or confined the, uh, uh, the country into very, um, uh, you know, restrictive norms. North Korea government has confined its country into very restrictive norms. So these are the country specific risks which arise. So because of restrictions, uh, other businesses cannot uh, enter into North Korea. Economic risk, risks which are related to economic uh, climate of a particular country, the eco economy of a particular country, that is known as economic risk, like growth or rate of income in a particular economy, nations, uh, uh, you know, uh, inflation rate in a particular nation, or stability of prices in a particular nation. So economic risk relates to economic activities. If economic activities do not go well, then economic risk arises. Social risk, so you know, um, uh, the societal uh, things like religion, like beliefs, like custom, affect businessmen a lot. So those are known as social risk. 
which emanate from societies um, beliefs the religious beliefs which are there they are known as social risk which are there in uh, any um, uh, country external risk external risk means situation which are outside the country so a uh, enemy uh, you know uh, uh, attacks us or we borrow a lot of money from foreign nation then that is a risk which is there external risk exchange risk the currency deflation and inflation happens very rapidly dollar is very expensive euro is very expensive so exchange risk is one of the major risk which is faced by businessmen then business risk the business uh, in itself is a um, uh, risky proposition sometimes you know during corona times many businesses um, uh, had ended right they had to close they had to shut down so business risk is very much there financial risk is there uh, you know you invest your uh, funds in a particular way and what if those funds do not reap the benefits that you always wanted your funds is uh, uh, you know invested in a particular company in a particular way and the uh, benefit is not there why does war between two companies affect us if we have no trade with them yes yes if we have no trade with them then it will not affect us but if we have trade with them then it will affect us because you know if us and korea are at war then naturally us will employ all its money to uh, buy the ammunitions and it will reduce its imports from india say of you know anything else which is unnecessary which is luxury it will reduce import from india because it won't have money to pay it will divert its money to the ammunitions so uh, uh, so the war between us and korea will directly affect uh, the trade between india and us that is the reason so how company invests its funds that is also an uh, risky proposition so if you invest too much of debt then you are at a very high financial risk so financial risk is a important risk then systematic risk systematic risk means uh, you know uh, if the the stock market is moving upward and downwards on a regular basis this is flow of stock market which happens this is known as stock market cycle okay if during this stock market cycle uh, your business prices deflate and increase then this is a normal systematic risk which will happen systematic risk will happen uh, your company shares will uh, undergo uh, upward and downward movement in your, their shares this is systematic risk which will happen it is unavoidable it is due to uncontrollable factors market is moving up and down naturally your shares without even your um, no, interference or without even your and uh, making any adverse decision may go down terribly go down demand supply unsystematic risk are the risk which are there because of controllable factors they are there for known factors like you know if gst rates go up or income tax rates go up that definitely it will be a dent in your pocket so it will be a dent in your pocket your profits will reduce unsystematic risk is that then market risk the changes in demand and supply of market um, uh, goods your goods which you are uh, uh, selling changes in their demand and supply will definitely affect the market then interest rate risk interest rates may vary uh, from from um, uh, you know market to market so interest rate increases sometimes sometimes they are decreasing and you know they are floating interest rates which are there so any kind of interest rate uh, variability will affect the businessman because um, you know the expenses will rise purchasing power risk which is inflation risk if inflation goes beyond a particular limit then purchasing power will be at a dent right so petrol and uh, diesel rates in india are very very high they have reduced the purchasing power of people because um, oil is an, is an essential element people will buy oil they will cut down on other expenses so inflation has affected the the purchasing power of the people default risk uh, that is non payment of interest and the main loan repayments okay you have given loan to someone and he does not repay the loan to you or bank has given loan to someone and he does not repay loan to bank it will be a loss for bank so that is the default risk liquidity risk liquidity risk is that you know you want to sell your assets and you want urgent money you won't find good buyers who will uh, buy your assets quickly or buy your inventory quickly that is uh, the risk which is there liquidity risk in an emergency situation you will not be able to uh, raise money <clears throat> that is the liquidity risk callability risk this is a very important risk guys uh, so you know uh, investments uh, come up with call option call option means before maturity of the investment the investor can choose to withdraw money in that case business has invested that money in some uh, you know project how can they withdraw money from that project and give it to the investor that is a problem callability risk if your investments are callable or are dilutable at a uh, you know before the maturity period the business cannot invest those funds in some long term projects business has to keep some liquidity intact with it to uh, make sure that if someone uh, calls for money 
it is payable to that particular person so callability risk convertibility risk this uh, risk arises in case of convertible bonds and convertible preference shares so you know convertible preference shares are converted into equity shares after a point in time convertible bonds are converted into shares after a point in time what is the possibility that uh, this conversion uh, is a problem so the investment may be converted into common stock at a time under terms and condition which is harmful to the investors best interest so you know this convertibility is a risk industry risk whatever risk is faced by the entire industry like raw material is scarce in a particular industry it is faced by all the companies which are um, doing work in that particular industry that is an industry risk that will impact your business also so there are certain industry risks operational risk the systems the processes the technology might you know op become obsolete there are some errors which might creep in this is known as operational risk so these are various types of risk which are faced by any businessman now how do you manage risk so guys risk management includes these four processes you identify what risks are there in your business you assess what is the likelihood of occurrence of this risk uh, what is the probability that this risk will occur to me so for example you know i am um, uh, uh, developing steel products and i use high uh, voltage of electricity to burn that steel so there's a possibility that fire may break out in my plant so what is the probability that fire may break break out in my plant then uh, what can you do to control the impact of that risk then we need to monitor the situation um, uh, we need to monitor that risk is being controlled so identification of risk assessment of risk control of risk and monitoring that risk is um, uh, done so objective of risk management is to anticipate the uncertainty and degree of uncertainty of events we need to anticipate what risks are there we need to anticipate that we need to channelize events to happen the way they are planned we will try to minimize the risk by uh, not taking any neg negative um, uh, step rectifying deviations from plan if any risk burns out if any risk uh, appears then we will make sure that we rectify that risk which has occurred we ensure that objective of planned event is achieved by alternate means we'll search for alternative when our um uh, risk has arisen and the first alternative is not working fine we try to find alternative like if a fire breaks out we try to not to stop our production we start production in some other uh, premises okay in case expected event is frustrated make the damage minimal now what if uh, the risk is there and the risk has outburst then damage should be minimal we should quickly try to curb that fire and we will try to stop damage as far as possible so we'll uh, curb the damage ways to manage risk how do you manage risk what are the ways to manage risk number one risk pooling pooling means accumulating together okay so what is role of an insurance company i'll tell you the role of the insurance company so there are many people who take insurance premium is 100 dollar per person okay premium is 100 dollars per person which is collected from 1 lakh people Hundred dollar per person, which is collected from one lakh people, we have a risk pool of ten million dollars. Suppose out of these one lakh people, hundred people's houses are destroyed, then from this fund, we extract money for hundred people whose household are destroyed. Okay. So people are paying hundred rupees as premium. Now suppose out of these ah uh, one lakh people, hundred fires are destroyed. Hundred uh you know uh, houses are destroyed we have taken 100 dollars per person okay 100 houses are destroyed and uh, the price to build one house back is suppose suppose 1000 dollars okay suppose the price to uh, bring back one of the house is suppose 1000 dollars okay so what is the total cost of this insurance company the total cost is 1 lakh dollars One lakh dollars is the cost, and what is the cost pool? What is the premium pool? The premium pool is ten million dollars. Ten million dollars, and the cost is one lakh dollars. So difference between the income and the expenses will be profit. This is how the risk is pooled together. The profit which is there will again be distributed to all the. remaining people in different different ratios this is how insurance works so this is a very good example guys which is given in my book um, now you can refer to my book as well this is risk pooling which happens uh, 1 lakh people have given 1 uh, 100 dollars each for protecting their house 
10 million is the risk pool which has been accumulated. The funds which have been accumulated is 10 million. Suppose 100 fires are 100 houses are destroyed. One destroyed uh, one destroyed house. Uh, the compensation which is to be paid is thousand dollars to pay each other person. One lakh dollars are paid as compensation. The difference between 10 million dollars and one lakh dollars will be the income which is there in case of this insurance. This is known as risk pool. This is what insurance company does. So the first way of managing risk is pool all of your risks, contribute something to the common pool, and then <clears throat> you give risk satisfaction to a particular person. No, no, definitely they, uh, they would invest this money, definitely. So the 10 million pool, which has been, um, uh, which is there, this will be invested. And some more money will be earned from this particular $10 million. But I'm assuming that they are not investing. I'm assuming that they are not investing. Even when they are not investing, even then it is a profitable uh, proposition. Even when they are not investing, even then it is a profitable proposition. That is what I'm trying to um, uh, make a point. Risk is being pooled. I'm not talking about investment income being earned. That's, that's okay. Investment income will definitely be, uh, will be earned. Even if it is not earned, then also your risk is absolutely managed by pooling the risk of 1 lakh people together and giving compensation to the people who face the risk. Okay, so this is risk pooling. Then risk diversification. You do not invest in one area. You invest in many areas. That is risk diversification. You do not invest only in shares. You invest in shares. You invest in mutual funds. You invest in debentures. You invest in government bonds. So diversification happens. So you invest in stocks. You invest in commodities, bonds, cash also you keep. FD also you keep. This is diversification. Risk is reduced. So even if entire amount which is invested in shares and commodities is wasted, even if this entire amount is lost, then also your this amount is safe with you. Even if this amount is lost, this amount is lost, even then this amount is safe with you. That is known as diversification. Ruin theory. Now ruin theory is very, very important theory, guys. Ruin theory is... Uh, you know, suppose, suppose in the insurance um, uh, business, in the insurance business, over here we had taken that only 100 houses are burned. Over here we had, we had taken that only 100 houses are, have been burned. What if there is a major, uh, you know, uh, problem with the city? And what if 90,000 houses are burned? What if 90,000 houses are burned? Then guys, we have to give $1,000 to 90,000 houses. And then this insurance company will be bankrupt. Insurance company will not have money to pay. Over here, we had assumed that 100 houses are burned. What if 90,000 houses are burned? So this probability, what is the probability that entire money which was collected with the insurance company is to be given as uh, the claim of the investors of the uh, premium holders? What is the probability? What is the... Uh, what is the stage at which the insurance company will get ruined? This is known as ruin theory. So ruin theory will tell you till what extent can an insurance company bear the risk. Beyond that point, insurance company will not be able to bear the risk. So that is the ruin theory. Ruin theory is the collective risk theory. When claims are more than the premium, when claims are more than the premium for an insurance company, capital becomes negative and we say ruin occurs for the insurer. So it is an indication of soundness of insurance solvency. So probability of ruin uh, should be ascertained. If the probability of ruin is high, then the risk is high. So your probability of ruin should be minimum. For an insurance company, probability of ruin should be minimum. That is the uh, concept. Okay. Risk mapping or risk analysis. So guys, an effective way to manage risk is please uh, uh, jot down your risk. Please map your risk. So over here, I've given two uh, axes, Y axis and uh, X axis. Probability of risk and impact of risk. If the risk is less on probability and less on impact, this is the green area. High on probability but less on impact, green area. High on impact but less on probability, green area. So these are the green areas which are safe areas. Risks which are there in these areas, those risks might be ignored. Those risks might be not be um, uh, you know uh, taken care of in a very strong manner. But the risks which are denoted by yellow zone and red zone, they are to be taken care of very, very minutely. Because the risk which probability is high and impact is also high. Probability is also high. Impact is also high. 
that risk is very very difficult to manage once it occurs so the high attention of management is required in these risks red risk and yellow risk so risk mapping and risk analysis is very very important to manage your risk your risk will be managed benefit of risk mapping mapping it tells you about the significant risks which are there it enables delivery of solution and services to manage that risk it serves as a uh, strategic business planning your plan you can plan your risk uh, according to this particular uh, risk mapping then um, you assign clear responsibility to individual for their particular risk areas opportunity to leverage risk on a competitive advantage you can um, you know uh, take steps to minimize that risk, that risk as compared to your competitors development of strategic approach you develop the strategic approach to uh, mitigate the risk support design of clients finance insurance program through development or effective retention level scope of coverage etc then next is risk retention so guys um, you know sometimes some company choose to retain some risk and not do anything about it so for example you know green risk we had chose to retain this risk and not do anything about it so risk retention is another way of um, uh, risk management then risk reduction risk reduction can be uh, termed as mitigation of all condition that are leading to hazards this is uh, synonymous to risk avoidance we don't do those activities which lead to a particular risk we don't do that activity at all so mitigation of all condition that lead to risk is known as risk reduction then guys what do you mean by corporate risk management corporate risk management means a risk uh, management technique which is designed to identify potential events that may affect the entity and manage that risk so what risk are there for a particular entity we need to identify that and we need to manage the risk of those particular entities that is known as enterprise risk management a sense of enterprise risk management is to build an effective risk management tool and to be significant driver of value so we need to develop a mechanism or a method to minimize the risk to minimize the risk we need to uh, develop an effective risk management mechanism to minimize the risk. We need to ensure that risks and opportunities are systematically identified. We need to design and implement the ERM infrastructure. What is the management uh, risk management infrastructure? We need to design and implement it. Okay, so these are the benefits, needs. Okay. So COSO and GIS. These are the two important elements of your enterprise risk management, guys. So guys, what is COSO? COSO is Commission of Sponsoring Organization of Tradeway Commission. This is COSO and COSO has developed a framework whereby a management of a particular company can manage its own risk. Okay. It's a comprehensive framework and a guidance on enterprise risk management. How to manage your risk? It's a guidance. COSO is a guidance. What does this framework consist of? Framework says that you first set your objective of uh, risk identification. Be aware of the risk that is arising in your organization. Then event identification, what event leads to that risk? What will happen um, uh, which will uh, create that particular risk? Organization must identify internal and external events that affect achievement of its objectives. Risk assessment, uh, what is the impact of risk? If the risk happens, then what is the impact, monetary impact? Risk response, uh, uh, what is the action to be taken if that risk happens? Control activity, what are the policies, procedures to ensure that risk um, uh, is mitigated, risk is reduced? information and communication the information should be uh, clearly um, uh, floated in the lower level management data should be given to the management communicated in a format and time frame to enable the managers to carry out their responsibilities then we need to monitor and modify the uh, system which we have for risk management then what is gis geographical information system uh, so geographical information system is a risk management technique which is used to avoid natural hazards like where will the earthquake happen or where will the probability of flood happen okay so th that predicting the risk of natural hazards and possible impact is known as the geographical um, uh, information system so we need to predict the risk of natural hazards and possible impact this is geographical information system okay very important concept guys from an exam standpoint also a very important concept uh, value at risk okay so suppose i have invested 2 lakh rupees in the shares of Reliance Industries Limited. I had invested 2 lakh rupees in the shares of Reliance Industries Limited. 2 lakh rupees, the share price is 2000 rupees. So I have got 
100 shares of reliance industries limited 100 shares of reliance industries limited is there now the the um, uh, past trend has shown that reliance industries limited shares have at most gone down to the extent of 800 rupees never ever has the reliance industries limited share go has went beyond 800 rupees never ever so what is value at risk what is my value at risk at most i can lose 1 lakh 20000 rupees out of this 2 lakh rupees so value at risk is 1 lakh 20000 rupees what is the maximum loss that i can can um, uh, incur because of this this risk this is known as value at risk what is the maximum loss 1200 rupees can be the maximum loss because never ever has the reliance industries shares moved down to beyond, below 800 rupees this is the concept of value at risk a very important concept from an exam standpoint it is one of the popular methods of measuring financial risk of investment it estimates how much a set of investment might lose given normal market conditions in a set time period such as a day var is typically used by firms and regulators in financial industry to gauge the amount of assets needed to cover possible losses there are different types of var long term var marginal var factor var etc so this is the var now comes a very important sector risk guys uh, banking industry risk banking industry risk means the risk which is pre prevalent in a banking industry what risk are prevalent in the banking industry the risk are very um, uh, guys uh, known to everyone first is the non performing assets risk which means that the loans which are given by bank to the third parties third parties are unable to repay that loan this is known as the risk of risk of um, uh, non payment and this particular risk can be curbed by uh, assessing the credit worthiness of each and every loan um, person who is uh, taking the loan. We need to assess the credit worthiness of that person. And to take something as mortgage, some asset of that particular person should be taken as mortgage. So this is the first risk, which is the risk which is related to um, uh, you know, uh, repayment of loans. Second risk which uh, the banking industry um, uh, faces is that you know the deposits which it has deposit means fixed deposits or current deposits the deposits should not be less than the loans that they give there should be an adequate ratio which should be maintained by the company um, for their deposits versus their loans which they give so deposits should always be higher than the loans which are granted to the third party they should also always be a ratio which is maintained between the deposits which are taken and the loans which are given so this ratio has to be very strictly maintained and has to be maintained in a very safe manner deposit should always be higher than the loans which a company is giving to its uh, lenders to its loan uh, holders so these are the risks which are faced by a banking industry so to curb these loans there are capital adequacy uh, norms which means uh, how much percentage of capital can a company um, uh, give as loan capital adequacy norms and this was proposed by basel committee basel committee has issued directives to the uh, banking sector to ascertain what are the uh, norms which are to be followed by banks so this was basel one basel one, one was introduced in 1998 1988 and was amended in 1996 basel two was introduced in 2006 and basel two was little more strict basel three was introduced in 2012 banks were primarily uh, exposed to credit risk they often held illiquid portfolio of loans supported by deposits so the loans were illiquid which means loans were there was no expectation of loans coming back okay and uh, uh, the deposits were equal to the loans so suppose a bank has deposit of 10000 rupees okay if it gives the entire say out of 10000 if it gives 9000 as loan and we know that loan is not going to be repaid then whenever the person who has deposited in bank whenever he will ask for his money back would i have money to repay that amount answer is no so banks were primarily exposed to credit risk they often had illiquid loans illiquid loans means loans which are not repayable supported by deposits deposits were um, uh, uh, there and loans were given against that deposits so this was the problem with the banks such loans could be liquidated rapidly at the time of emergency this placed bank at a risk of decline so banks were facing this problem then there was introduction of liquidity coverage ratio and net stable fund ratio 
liquidity coverage ratio means the um, the bank has to maintain certain amount of liquidity certain amount of cash with itself it cannot give entire amount which is received as deposit as loan it cannot give it has to maintain certain amount of liquidity bank has to maintain certain amount of liquidity that is the requirement of liquidity coverage ratio and stable funding ratio so lcr is the ratio of liquid assets to net net cash flow net cash outflow versus liquid asset there has to be a ratio for short term liquid management and nsfr is the ratio for long term liquidity mismatches rb has prescribed these ratios for every commercial bank operating in india then basel committee reforms guys we have studied that there are basel committee which um, had strict ways of dealing with credit issues which are there with bank let us talk about basel uh, norms uh, basel 1 1990 1988 it was introduced 1996 it was amended okay what did it say what did basel committee say it dealt with basic deposit taking and lending function so whatever deposit bank is taking and as compared to it whatever it is lending there has to be a congruence between these two activities so basel committee um, uh, you know uh, gathered the congruence between these two activities bank assets like deposits loans are given risk weight so whatever a uh, deposit bank will take it will invest either in uh, some securities or give loan to people okay so the risk which is attached to uh, the securities which the amount which is invested in securities will naturally be low and the risk which is attached to loans giving loans is naturally high so i'll give you an example bank received 10000 as fixed deposit from a customer it invested out of 10000 rupees it invested uh, 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 8000 rupees in some bonds government bonds which are absolutely safe and 2000 rupees it gave to some it gave as a loan okay this is the transaction which happened with them now guys this is a non risky investment this is not a risky investment but this investment is a risky investment bonds is a non risky investment but giving loan is a risky investment so the risk weight is given to government bonds the risk weight was given as zero there is no risk in government bonds there is no risk in government bonds no problem if you have given 8000 rupees out of the deposit to government bond even if you give 10000 rupees to bond we don't have any problem but we have a problem where you give loan um, to g10 bank debt was weighted at 1020% so if you give loan to g10 government debt was weighted at uh, uh, zero Uh, G10 bank debt. If you give loan to G10, G10 are the ten uh, countries which are um, uh, forming part of the uh, conglomerate, which is there for South Asian countries. Okay, so if you give a loan to a government of G10 countries, no risk. <clears throat> if you give, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, the the if you purchase bonds of G10 banks, then there's a risk of twenty percent. and if you give it as any other thing then the uh, risk is 100% so on this 2000 the risk is 100% on this 2000 the risk is 100% because you have given loan to a third party what if you had given some amount to um, uh, the g10 ba bank then that risk would have been 20% 20% is the risk so bank were required to hold 8% of risk weighted value of assets so bank has to hold 8% of risk weighted value of assets guys let us take a simple example to demonstrate it okay so an indian bank is there it has got a deposit of 10000 rupees okay it invested in three sources number 1 6000 rupees g10 government bonds 3000 rupees g10 bank bonds 1000 rupees other debts okay now the question is that um, you know how much percentage should the bank maintain as liquid assets as the assets which it should not give to anyone else okay so uh, government debt is 0% risky bank debt g10 bank debt is 20% risky and other debt is 100% risky so what is the weighted uh, uh, risk which is associated with this investment which bank has done the rated risk is 3000 multiplied by 20% 3000 multiplied by 20% is 600 600 plus 1000 1600 is the weighted risk which this bank is taking is the weighted risk which this bank is taking now guys 
what is the norm of basel committee basel committee is saying okay out of 10000 you have to maintain 1600 as cash sorry not 1600 but 8% of 1600 what is it given 8% of 1600 okay let me change the slide also i i think you cannot see this slide let me share okay now can you see the slide now can you see the slide okay so bank has deposit of 10000 rupees bank has received deposit of 10000 rupees out of the 10000 rupees it has invested 6000 in government 10 bonds it has deposited in g10 banks it has deposited 1000 rupees in other debts okay so g10 government uh, is risk free 0% risk g10 bank is 20% risky so i multiplied it by 20% other debts is 100% risky so what is the risk weight risk weight is 1600 how 20% of 3600 100% of 1000 1000 so 1600 is the risk weight so uh, you know 8% of risk weighted value of assets so 1600 multiplied by multiplied by 8% is the liquidity which this bank needs to maintain 8% of 1600 bank cannot give to anyone cannot invest it has to keep it itself 8% is the um, uh, risk weighted factor that is the ask okay harmeet singh definitely i will talk to you today i was engaged in these marathon videos now that is why i am not able to uh, talk to you but i will talk to you today all right so banks were required to hold 8% of risk weighted value of assets risk weighted value of assets multiplied by 8% is the hold in 1990 basel norms were amended to include bank capital requirement of market risk portfolios this implied that basel norms were made applicable to non banking companies also so the basel norms in 1990 were applicable earlier to 1990 the basel norms were only applicable to banks after 1990 the basel norms basel 1 norms were applicable to nbfc also nbfc is non banking financial corporation which are not doing the activities of deposits and loans in a proper manner but which are providing some funds some um, uh, other activities which are financial activities so basel norms were introduced for nbfc also in 1990 in 1993 banks were required to have independent risk management function in 1993 basel committee required a independent committee independent committee within each bank who will manage the risk independent risk management function should be there a department should be there who will look after the risk management of that particular bank in 1993 this happened further the amendments also propose minimum capital requirement of 10 days 95% of value at risk assets so whatever is the value at risk um, which is there on the assets which are invested by the bank so in our example um, you know the investment was made in g10 banks then g10 government then other assets whatever is the value at risk we had already discussed value at risk whatever is the value at risk 90% 95% should be maintained as capital in the banks <clears throat> guys then they were introduced basel 2 they were introduced introduced in 2006 now basel 2 were much more strict than basel 1 basel 1 well relaxed basel 2 were more strict so basel 2 uh, had three pillars okay basel 2 had three pillars pillar number 1 minimum capital requirement so minimum capital the banks needs to introduce in their business their business cannot be funded by debt so minimum capital is to be introduced so for market risk banks have to report capital requirement for interest rate risk equity position risk foreign exchange risk to the regulator so in basel 2 first requirement was that you should have adequate capital to take necessary risk capital requirement should be there so what should be the capital requirement we'll be studying in our further bullets for credit risk banks in india currently follow standardized approach and they report risk weighted asset for various credit exposures so whatever credit exposure a business is having they have to disclose it to rbi they have to disclose it to regulator amount of loan multiplied by risk weight multiplied by 9% is the capital required to be held against any given loan so whatever loan you are giving to anyone against that you have to keep this much amount of capital with you so capital um, uh, you know capital means equity capital the capital of the owners owner should have a say in the banking business the risk weights assigned by the regulator depends on the credit rating of the borrower 
So risk weights are assigned just like risk weights were assigned in Basel one. Risk weights were assigned in this particular asset category also. Banks also use various credit conversion factors convert their off balance sheet exposures. So guys, certain exposures are off balance sheet. For example, guarantees. So banks sometimes give guarantees on behalf of their clients. Now just giving guarantee does not um, uh, is not treated as liability in the books of accounts. Just giving guarantee is not a liability in the books of accounts. But while assessing risk. these guarantees will also be taken into account the guarantees which bank gives on behalf of their clients these guarantees will definitely come as a risky uh, matter in the risk management uh, schedule okay so banks have to use various credit conversion factors for managing their off balance sheet risk off balance sheet risk means the risk which are there not in balance sheet but they are there with the bank like giving guarantees then the second procedure is supervisory review procedure um, uh, so under internal capital adequacy assessment procedure there was icap credit institutions must have effective system and process to determine the internal capital on an ongoing basis so there has to be a review mechanism within the bank to ensure that their capital is adequate at all times there should be a review mechanism a robust review mechanism should be there under the supervisory review evaluation process it is proposed to evaluate bank's risk profile to assess the qualitative aspect of each of the bank so again guys um, along with uh, 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 defining the monetary criteria of fixing a percentage of capital which is required against each asset along with doing that the bank has also uh, the basel norms have also determined that there has to be supervisory um a review process in each of the bank to ascertain the riskiness that should be there then market discipline market discipline means that you know on uh, uh, the um uh, disclosure requirements should be done by bank each bank of what is the value at risk what is the capital uh, that they are placing in the bank what is the assets riskiness which is uh, there in the bank so all these things should be disclosed so market discipline means disclosure requirements by the bank to complement the minimum um, uh, capital requirements and supervisory review process so whatever is the result of minimum capital requirement and supervisory review that is to be disclosed in the balance sheet of the bank purpose is to ensure greater transparency of bank's activity pillar 3 do not entail additional capital requirement but maintains publication of key data pillar 3 is that you have to publish your key data in form of your uh, notes to accounts etc in the financial accounts now guys last is basel 3 norms they were introduced in may 2012 and they are the current norms which are in prevalence they are the current norms which uh, the banks have to follow uh, regarding their liquidity requirements so what are the amendments which were there in basel 3 norms the rbi uh, new basel 3 norms regulations are as under common equity ratio the equity capital uh, and disclose and disclose reserves to risk weighted average ratio should be at least 5.5% again guys common equity has to be maintained by the businesses business have to have common equity uh, you know the say of the shareholder should be more in banking business it is not that you know bank will take loans and funds from other organizations start a bank and then they turn bankrupt this should not be the case so common equity should be at a certain level as compared to risk weighted assets so there has to be say of the shareholders in the banking business so that they don't run away in case um anything wrong happens and they take liability and onus of it then minimum tier 1 capital should be 7% of total risk weighted assets so the total capital of the uh, bank should be at least be 7% of the total risk weighted assets capital to capital means equity as well as debt there should be predominance of common equity common equity should be at a very large level common equity 78.5% of tier 1 capital and total tier 1 capital should be at least 77.58% so guys uh, uh, capital means equity and debt okay now the debt equity ratio that should be there in tier 1 banks it should be common equity should be 78.57% and the debt should be the remainder so common equity 78.57% of tier 1 capital and total tier 1 capital should at least be 77.58% of the total capital so you know the banks are divided into uh, various tiers so you know tier 1 states delhi delhi mumbai kolkata tier 2 states which are little less uh, uh, you know progressive little less um, uh, developed states then tier 3 states which are very very backward states okay so the bank has to maintain its capital according to the uh, tiers where it has its branches so these are the rates which are there in tier 
uh, uh, one category states. So they have to maintain capital, guys. The, at the end of the day, they have to maintain equity capital at a very reasonable level. The bank cannot operate from the loans that they receive or the grants which they receive. Bank cannot operate in that way. They need to maintain capital. A good capital base has to be maintained by bank. So these are the LCR and NSFRs which are um, proposed by Basel III. So what do we uh, remember in all these Basel norms? Guys, the Basel norms, uh, one, two, three, you first of all should remember the year in which they were introduced. Then the basic, basic concepts, guys. Now, the basic concepts means, you know, in Basel one norms, you can uh, learn these risk weights. These risk weights are very, very important. You learn these risk weights. Risk weights are important. Then you learn the that uh, in 1990, the Basel norms were also applied to NBFCs. You remember these facts. Then VAR, 95% of VAR should be the minimum capital. You should remember that. So these important points you should remember for every Basel um, uh, committee amendment because in examination, this can come as a, um, uh, say, four marks or a three marks or a fill in the blanks. Fill in the blanks can also come from this particular um, uh, uh, category. Applicable for small fund banks as well because so many cases of bank band hona. Yes, yes, it is applicable for small funds bank as well. Small firm uh, fund banks are, uh, you know, they may be categorized as NBFC. Even if they are categorized as NBFC, then also it is applicable on small fund banks as well. Now, the last topic of our syllabus, guys, of SPM theory, corporate failure. Now, despite of working hard, despite of promoters, um, now giving their heart and soul to the businesses, it is not necessary that all the businesses, uh, you know, work well. All the businesses work well. They turn into losses. They turn sick. So now to assess corporate failure is a very, very important aspect. And when an organization is moving towards a failure, assessing that aspect is very, very important. How do we know that our business is moving towards failure? Future of this business is fail. How do we know that? That is the point of contention in this particular uh, topic. So refers to companies seizing or shutting down operations following its liabilities. So when the companies seize its operations because its liabilities are much more than its assets, when the company seizes its operation, when the liabilities are much more than assets, it is known as corporate failure. So what are the indicators of corporate failures? Low profitability, high gearing ratio. Gearing ratio means um, debts are much, much, much more than equity. It is a cause of concern. If debts are much, much, much more than equity is a cause of concern. Low liquidity. Low liquidity means current assets are very less than current liabilities. <clears throat> These are indicators of corporate failures. Now, there may be technological causes. You know, uh, what can... Uh, you know, probably go wrong. Technology may probably go wrong. So if the organization has a failure to upgrade, it does not upgrade itself, then it will, um, you know, uh, lose out on business. So technological causes are there. Working capital problems are there. Liquidity problems are there that, you know, uh, the working capital uh, that is funds which are required to manage short term daily uh, operations. They are very, very low. Economic di distress. Economy is, uh, you know, a failed economy. Uh, like during Corona time, the economy failed miserably. At that point in time, you know, the um, uh, due to economic failure, the businesses have shut down. So economic distress, mismanagement. This is one of the most important reasons. The internal mismanagement of the organization, internal dispute between board of directors can be cause of corporate distress. Over expansion or diversification. You have, you know, forgot about your core speciality and you have diversified a lot. You produce a lot of products. That is a problem for corporate distress. Fraud by management. Management itself has done some fraud due to which corporate has collapsed like a classic case of Satyam. In case of Satyam, uh, the, the management Raju Mahalingam uh, had himself created situation where he has some he has done fraud and the corporate led to a <coughs> failure. Then poorly structured board. There is a um, board. Board of directors are not structured properly. They lack necessary competence and then financial distress that the company is running into losses. The incomes are less, expenses are more. That is the reason of corporate failure. So because of any of the reasons, the failure can happen. Okay. Project formulation. Project is uh, not a very difficult aspect. Yes, this is very, very important. The models to product cor predict corporate failure. Important from a practical standpoint, not from a theory standpoint. A practical question from Z score NCAER can come in your examination for sure. 
So this is important from a practical standpoint. Okay. NCAER model number one, it focuses on three aspects. If these three aspects are working fine, then the company is a non-distressed company. Then the company is a non-distressed company. If these aspects are working fine, <coughs> if these aspects are not working fine, that that company is a distressed company or a failed company. Corporate failure is there in that particular company. So these elements are cash profit, that is profitability, net working capital, net worth position. Okay. Please do practical question of this NCAER. I've done it in my class. Altman Z score. Now, please understand Altman Z score has two variations, variation of 1968 and variation of 1988. Okay. These are the two primary variations, 1983. These are the two primary variations which are there in Altman Z score. You have to see both the variations. Okay. So Altman Z score 1968 is driven by this formula. Now, the difference is that in 68 model market value of equity is there. However, in 1983 model, the book value of the equity is there. That is the only difference between 83 and 68 model. And in the examination, you will be given um, uh, how to uh, you know solve the question, whether from an old method 1968 model or 1983 model. And these are the analysis that you need to do after uh, computing your Z score. After computing your Z score, you need to see whether Z score is uh, below 2.99, above 2.99. Uh, uh, between 2.99 and 1.81 and below 1.81. These three uh, uh, values of Z score will determine whether your firm is a non-failed firm, your firm is a failed firm or your firm is a mix of both. This will be determined by this <coughs> equation. Similarly, 1983, there's a different formula to it. Of course, you have to learn this formula. <coughs> of course, you have to learn both the formulas. Again, the limit is 2.9, 1.23. These are the limits which are there. Then guys, there is another um, Z score which is um, used for privately held companies. This is seldom asked in the examination. So less important, less important. But yes, um, the scorecard is uh, very small in this particular aspect. Only four aspects are there and the score is dependent on 2.60 variability. 2.60 is the variability of Z score in the third model. Third model is um, uh, you know, rarely it will come in the examination. Mostly first and second model will come in the examination. So yes, you have to learn the uh, formula very, very carefully and perform questions also because it will definitely come in your examination. The questions will definitely come in your examination. Where are your latest marathons <coughs> for cash audit? They're the, there on the, um, uh, on the YouTube channel. Uh, go on the playlist of uh, cost audit, cost and management audit. I've taken the marathon of practical topics also so you can take over there all right guys so that's all for this particular session and yes we have been able to complete the entire theoretical portion of spm and it was really important portion because it will command a weightage of above 20 marks in your examination today's lecture will definitely fetch you above 20 marks in your examination so you will definitely be able to fetch above 20 marks in your examination if you uh, complete the today's uh, session thoroughly and yes, those students who have given test series regularly. So for past three months, we were having test series for CMA final students. Those students who have given the test series regularly, you need not worry. You are already in a very, very amazing condition and you will be definitely be able to score 80 plus in cost audit as well as BVM SPM. So yes, guys, before we um, uh, move to the end of, end of this session, please uh, uh, like this particular video. Please, please hit the like button and do subscribe to the channel if you are new to the channel. Uh, and yes, be connected with me. Even when your result comes, you know, um, uh, just tell me, I'm eagerly waiting for that message from you. Sir, I became a CMA. I'm eagerly waiting for that message from you as soon as the result is out. Do not forget to message me. Uh, sir, where should we message you? You can message me on my number and my number is nine six okay my number is written over here on the screen you can see my number this is my number you can message me on this number after qualifying uh, my number is there on the screen nine six four three nine two nine nine one three please message me on my number sir we became cmas or sir we got 80 plus in cost audit or we got 80 plus in spmb i'll be the happiest person on this earth to know about this information of yours so yes Signing off, it was really a wonderful session with all of you of SPM theoretical portion. I hope you got benefited out of it. I've marked certain important elements also of the book um, out of all the theoretical uh, chapters, guys. So yes, 
we'll meet in our subsequent sessions till that time all the very best and happy studying and happy exams giving and guys one very important information please check your examination centers so for certain south indian uh, territories certain south indian states the institute of cost accountants of india have changed the exam center from one place to another place so do again check your examination center whether your examination center is same as the old center or has it be changed has it been changed so do check it and um, you know if your examination center center has changed then go to the revised examination center you might um, otherwise be harassed okay please check your examination center once again all the very best and happy studying bye bye see you